hear me okay? Awesome. Well, it's, uh, it's really an honor to be here with you. And I want to thank you um, for inviting me. And um, I'm really looking forward to kicking off this meeting. Um, it's such a great meeting, a lot of really wonderful speakers, and it's really an honor to be part of them. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about all sorts of things. But I want to start it off with something very relevant. Um, and that's basically what's new, what's going on in the specialty lens realm. And what's new? What's what what is the latest? So these are the latest number from the IMI about myopia. And uh, one thing I noticed is that this session is really predominating about myopia. So I decided to start with this. We all know that you know myopia is a global epidemic. It's increasing, and we really have to do everything we can as practitioners, not only to correct myopia, but also to prevent its progression. We know that myopia progression um, is related to, associated to issues uh, of ocular health issues. And the more myopia grows, the more at risk people are of developing these conditions. So. We have the numbers in the UK, about 23% of people have myopia, Iran, 8%, China, 47%, 53% in Singapore, Australia, 31%, 17% um, in Chile, 62% uh, in Hong Kong, and the USA, we're at 42%. And we're approaching that 50% mark. And one thing that's interesting actually is that we know that uh, because of the pandemic, there has been an increase in myopia. And this has been shown um, in several studies, but this one is one of the uh, better conducted studies. Progression of myopia in school-aged children after COVID-19 home confinement. Um, so the conclusion of this uh, paper where that home confinement during the COVID-19 pandemic appeared to be associated with a significant myopic shift for children aged six to eight years, according to 2020 school-based photo screenings. However, you know, there were obviously limit limitations in the studies, but younger children's refractive status may be more sensitive to environmental change than older ages, and given the younger children are in critical period for, for the development of their myopia. So it really does show that near work, reading, being on screens, home confinement, um, doing classes from home actually contributed to an increase of myopia. And so we know that spending more time outside is important and these studies highlight those, those things. So what about orthokeratology? I wanna talk about orthokeratology a little bit. Um, orthokeratology has existed for a long time. It's one of the oldest treatments that we have for myopia management. Um, and basically, what's the, something new that, that we have now in orthokeratology are the toric curves. And toric curves allow better alignment of um, the orthokeratology lenses. So we can see here before and after orthokeratology treatment. So the basic, you know, basic obviously is not too basic, but basic orthokeratology lens will have the back optic zone radius, the reverse curve, some alignment curves and peripheral curves. But, you know, and that needs each curve and you can see here which each curve does. You have central flattening of the central part and then you have the reverse zone where you have that epithelial cell migration, and then you have the alignment curves and the peripheral curves. But when you have limbus to limbus astigmatism um, and it extends that way, it's important to look at rotationally asymmetric lenses. And when you have rotationally asymmetric lenses, the lens parameters um, are identical to that of a, uh, of a spherical design with some key differences. While the base curve and peripheral curve remain symmetrical, the reverse curves um, will be different. And that provides a, a closer fit um, and provide a better alignment of the lenses. So another thing that I wanna to touch on and something that is obviously up and coming is scleral lenses 
um, for the use of severe ocular surface disease. So we have well-established indications of scleral lenses for um, irregular corneas, for regular astigmatism, um, post-surgical uh, conditions. And now we also are using scleral lenses a lot for ocular surface disease. So if we look at this cornea, this is, you know, both of the eyes were like this, severe SPK. So when you talk about aqueous deficient dry eye, most commonly it's caused by inflammatory infiltration of the lacrimal gland. And in severe cases, it's gonna be from Sjogren syndrome. And in less severe cases, it's non-Sjogren syndrome. So basically inflammation causes both acinar and ductor epithelial cell dysfunction and destruction. An epithelial injury and defective glycocalyx, loss of tear volume and goblet cell mucin, leading to increased frictional damage and friction related symptoms. This causes tear hyperosmolarity, epithelial injury caused by dry eye disease, which stimulates corneal nerve endings, ultimately leading to a lot of pain, discomfort, um, increased blink rate, uh, and, and obviously reflex tearing. So these patients are usually in a lot of pain. And one way of diagnosing this condition is by using um, lysamine green. So lysamine green is a tool, a vital dye that we can all use in our clinics, in our practice, in order to help diagnose aqueous deficient dry eye and other types of dry eye as well. So you look at it under white light and diffuse illumination, and it's really good at highlighting dead and devitalized cells on the conjunctiva. Okay, so you can see a very diffuse four plus staining of the conjunctiva here. And it's actually very, very painful. And if you flip the lid over, you can sometimes see this. This is called lid wiper epitheliopathy. And lid wiper epitheliopathy is really important to look for. It's actually a sign that there's a lot of friction between the eyelid and the ocular surface. And it's, it's actually a huge indicator of dryness and pain and severe dry eye. So a lot of people who have severe dry eye, if you look for this, you'll find it and you really have to flip the lid. And sometimes you can get this from contact lens wear as well. So it's actually the friction of the eyelid either on the contact lens surface or on the surface of the eye, okay, in severe dry eye. So definitely look for this as an indicator for dry eye. And Fluorescein staining. So fluorescein, what you have is staining of the cornea. It will also stain the conjunctiva, but it's really, really good at highlighting dead and devitalized cells on the cornea. And obviously with this, you use blue filter, you use your rattan filter to increase the contrast. And you can see here that, you know, this cornea, for example, is, is extremely irritated and you've got a lot of dead and devitalized cells here. So other ways to diagnose aqueous deficient dry eye, and these are all things that we can do in the office. So on the top um, left, you have the test called the phenol red thread test. So that is to measure the volume of the tears, it's basal tears. And um, what you do is you put the string um, inside, it's obviously a pH sensitive string, and you allow the tears after about 15 minutes um, to, uh, and you measure it to see how much tear production there is. On the bottom left, that's the show test. So the show test is going to be a finger prick test, which basically use the blood of the patient um, and then you put it on the paper and send the paper over to the lab and that will help diagnose Sjogren's syndrome. Um, on the top right, you have a test called inflammadry, which is going to measure the tear osmolarity and help diagnose, you know, dry eye, help diagnose inflammation on the surface of the eye. So very useful. And what's good about inflammadry is you can actually, you know, start a treatment and then measure the osmolarity after your treatment and then monitor how it's going. And on the bottom right, you have the Shermer test. And the Shermer test is a kind of a standard test that everybody knows about for uh, testing dry eye. And again, the basal tears will, after 10 minutes, you'll, you'll be able to measure it and see. 
So the mainstay of treatment for aqueous deficient dry eye is um, punctal occlusion and also artificial tears. Obviously, when we talk about artificial tears, we are encouraging preservative free artificial tears and then punctal occlusion. So this is the basic and everybody should be doing this for you know, aqueous deficient dry eye. But let's talk about scleral lenses. So scleral lenses, um, so this, the scleral lens is designed in a way to vault over the cornea and land gently on the conjunctiva or the conjunctiva overlying the sclera, okay? And so what we're doing is we're filling this lens with saline solution. And when fit properly, as you can see on the top left, that OCT image, you can see that the lens is not touching the surface of the eye at any point. And there's a tear film reservoir there between the lens and the surface of the eye. That tear film reservoir actually provides hydration and lubrication to the ocular surface, to the cornea, the entire time it's being worn. So it is an oasis. It's like providing an oasis for the eye for and and as long as the scleral lens is being worn it's giving that oasis and so the goal of this type of treatment is to restore the ocular surface is to help it heal to protect it from the outside environment to protect it from microorganisms to protect it from the friction of the blink so the scleral lens serves a lot of purposes in protecting the ocular surface and helping it restore itself. So we can see here that original photo that I showed after wearing a scleral lens for a couple of weeks, a significantly improved ocular surface. So this is an amazing treatment that we can use now in severe ocular surface disease. And obviously there are many different ones, Stevens-Johnson syndrome, Sjogren's syndrome, graft versus host disease, dry, just regular, dry eye, aqueous deficient, evaporative dry eye, um, exposure keratopathy, neurotrophic keratitis. These are just a few examples. So let's go through some cases that are interesting. Um, this is a case of iatrogenic dry eye syndrome. So a 52 year old white male presented to the office um, and he had a bone marrow transplant and he developed ocular graft versus host disease. So off the bat, you can see at his initial examination, he's got a lot of staining. And this is lysamine green staining once again. So you can see a lot of staining of the ocular surface. Um, you can see staining of the conjunctiva um, in all quadrants. So let's talk about ocular graft versus host disease. So to understand this, we really have to understand inflammation. So we're not really sure what the pathogenesis is. It's poorly understood, but we know that donor-derived alloreactive T lymphocytes play a pivotal role in the development of graft versus host disease. So what you have is aberrant proliferation of autoreactive T predominantly CD4 plus and Th2, and also B cells and autoantibody formation. So basically this involves both cell mediated and humoral immuni immunity, and you have infiltration and inflammation of the lacrimal gland, conjunctiva and ocular surface. So basically we're having an activation of the T cells, um, which causes severe amount of inflammation. Inflammation can eventually cause a decrease in the density of conjunctival goblet cells, as well as scarring of the lacrimal gland and the conjunctiva. So actually, if you look at a patient with ocular graft versus host disease, you won't really find a drier eye. This is the driest eye you can really, really come up with. So you can see here, we put this patient in a scleral lens. Obviously the eye still looks a little bit red, but what we're hoping is that the patient feels better and also that we protect and restore the ocular surface. So the patient's vision wasn't too bad. It was really just extremely dry. And in these cases, you really want to go for a larger diameter type of scleral lens. So the larger the diameter is, the more of the surface we can cover and the more of the greater your oasis is. And so a lot of these patients will opt for the 18, 19 millimeter, 20 millimeter, 21 millimeter lenses. And again, the bigger it is, the more surface we can cover. So um, that's just an example. 
Another case of iatrogenic dry eye syndrome, this is a 19 year old female who developed Steven Johnson syndrome at a very young age as a result of or reaction to children's Motrin. And she's failed with every kind of scleral lens. I mean, you can see how scarred her um, eye is. She had a lot of symblepharon. So symblepharon again is, is the basically scarring between the conjunctival and bulbar conjunctiva. Um, which makes it very hard to fit any type of contact lens on this. So she really doesn't have a lot of vision. You can see with the scleral lenses that we fit her with, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, she's hand motion um, in the right eye, light perception in the left. But it's important to put patients like this in a scleral lens, even though the vision is not that great. And the reason you want to is actually to prevent further symblepharon prevent, uh, formation. So remember that patients with Steven Johnson syndrome do not have a, any limbal stem cells, okay? They're not having a re-epithelialization uh, of the ocular surface and they're scarring and the scarring is constant. It's not, it's a progressive scarring of the ocular surface. So what you're doing with the scleral lens, in addition to slightly improving the vision in this case, is you're really preventing symblepharon formation. So we did fit this patient with an iPrint Pro, which is an impression-based scleral lens. Um, you can see how hard it was for us to put that impression material in the eye. And when looking at the impression, you can see all those bumps. So the impression is supposed to look very smooth and you can see how irregular it looks. And that's because of all the scarring that you have on the ocular surface. But this is really what the patient needed. So let's talk about exposure keratopathy. Um, this is a four year old Hispanic female um, from Puerto Rico. She was born with a condition called Manitoba oculotracheoanal mota bifid nose. So she was diagnosed with bilateral acquired infantile corneal opacities of mild density, which were occluding the visual axis. Um, they were caused by exposure. So the, the scarring that she had was caused by just the, the eyelid constantly being open. And she's got congenital upper eyelid uh, colobomas in both eyes. So she does not, she obviously has an incomplete blink and she cannot close her eye completely, okay? Because of the, the coloboma, the eyelid coloboma. She's had several reconstructive surgeries and she's followed closely by oculoplastic surgeons here in, uh, in Baskin Palmer Eye Institute. And she's got really high refractive errors as well. She's got irregular astigmatism, obviously because of the scarring that she has in the corneal opacities. And you know she definitely has amblyopia. So you can see her visual acuity there, 2150 in the right eye. And so the reason why we would fit, want to fit a, a scleral lens in this case is our multiple, right? So you really want to provide the oasis for the ocular surface. Um, by you know protecting it because the 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 eyes so exposed right she can't close her eyes she's got this exposure she's got colobomas so we're trying to protect the ocular surface from the environment from infection from drying and we can do that with the scleral lens okay but also she's got amblyopia she's got irregular astigmatism. So we're actually neutralizing that irregular astigmatism with the scleral lens. So we've got protection and we've also got improvement of vision and, and correction of amblyopia. And that's the goal. So you can see um, the lens on her eye. Uh, so this is a, we had to make the diameter a little bit smaller than an adult lens. We use a 14. Um, in this case. And, you know, obviously the parents were very involved in application and removal training. And also, you know, but now she does it every day. She's super happy. And you can see a photo of her and I there on the right side. And this is, you know, photos of her in uh, Miami visiting us. And that, those are photos of her mom and I, and, and her, her and her mom. So, um, that pretty much concludes um, my part on kicking off this specialty lens. There's a lot of interesting cases. There's a lot of interesting 
things that we can do. Um, some hot topics I'm excited to learn about are myopia management, um, scleral lenses, at front, uh, you know, front surface correction of aberration, higher order aberrations. And again, thank you for allowing me to kick off this session and I would like to open it for questions. started in the US. I, I don't think we have EpiFlow and other stuff in India. Dr. Maskari. Because I guess uh, the uh, the uh, drier treatment has become very key uh, uh, thing for the American optometrist uh, because it's uh, most of it is not covered by uh, insurance, so it's a self pay, and it's a very lucrative business I can say. Uh, but in India, I think it's only uh, if it is really severe. Yeah, but even ophthalmologists uh, don't push it. So we have a question uh, online as uh, Akshay Saluja from Delhi is asking uh, Dr. Ellis, have you ever had problems with short shadowing or double vision with scleral lenses and how do you take care of it? Ellis? Uh, double vision? Yes, shadowing and double vision, that's ghosting. Okay, um, so... Uh, it depends. So you really have to determine whether the double vision is coming from one eye or if it's binocular double vision, because obviously the treatment is very different. But the idea is to neutralize the irregularity in the cornea with the scleral lens and therefore improving, you know, ghosting, shadowing, d d double vision, um, monocular diplopia, of course. Um, so ideally what you're doing is you're neutralizing 90% of the astigmatism from the front surface of the cornea, and that should resolve most of the issues. Of course, some patients still might have some aberrations and there are some scleral lenses that, as I mentioned, we're continuing to develop that with time. So I'm looking forward to seeing the developments and higher order aberrations. Right, so uh, high order aberration uh, scleral lenses uh, are almost a key to you know solving all that issues. But even uh, just by simple scleral lenses, ninety percent of the vision issues are taken care of. So that's the main thing uh, that you can use. Anybody else wants to have any questions? Okay, thank you, Alice. It was really wonderful. I really loved this presentation. 
and you really started uh, the whole uh, session of today's. Thank you very much, Alice. Thank you so much. Yes, our next speaker is Dr. Kuresh Maskati. Uh, of course, uh, all the speakers' detailed biodata is available online, so we are not going to waste much time introducing and reading all this. But of course, everybody knows Dr. Kuresh Maskati, uh, well-known ophthalmologist, cornea specialist, dry eye specialist, and he's known all over the world for his uh, Pintuchi keratoprosthesis. He has performed surgeries in Malaysia, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, all over. And uh, he's, uh, of course, my godfather and uh, uh, main supporter. As you know, we are the co-host of this uh, meeting. So I invite Dr. Kuresh Maskati to give his presentation. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chavan. And it's indeed a uh, pleasure to wear a suit after two years and uh, speak in a physical uh, conference. Um, so uh, Elise has kick-started the uh, meeting by a broad overview of the specialty uh, contact lenses, the scleral lenses, and uh, uh, it's the multiple roles. Uh, we are trying to focus today on myopia control and uh, uh, what is the current status We are doing this for the first time. Okay. So now hopefully I'm screen sharing with the rest of you across the world as well. So uh, I'm going to uh, restrict my talk to the current status and what are the concerns of parents that we have and why we need to control this epidemic of myopia. So traditionally, we were taught when we were students that there are two types of myopia. One is school myopia, which commenced around 5 to 15 years of age. And as the child continued going to higher classes, by 0 0.5, 0 0.75, the myopia would go up. And it was idiopathic because we didn't really know what was happening. So when parents asked us, we would say idi idiopathic is a word that ophthalmologists uh, use very frequently when they themselves don't understand what is happening. So it's idiopathic, hota hai, SI, it increases, kuch nahi kar sakte hai, type of thing. And then there were children who were born with high myopia. They came to us at the age of five with minus 10 or minus 15. And they already had some of the changes that Dr. Karobi Lairi will uh, stress upon later. Myopic macular degeneration, cataract, glaucoma, or peripheral retinal changes, or they would develop them soon. And for them, we keep a very close watch and try and treat these um, the problems as and when they did occur. And we tell them that this is something that is genetic. It, really, you can't help it. Parents must have been myopic and things like that. So um, uh, the prevalence of myopia has increased by leaps and bounds over the last two or three decades. And it's approximately 90% in some parts of Asia with Taiwan reporting a myopic prevalence of 84% among 16 to 18 year olds, that is high school students. The earliest surveys that I could lay my hands on in India was in the 70s by Jain et al, which showed a prevalence at that time in the 70s, about 50 years ago, of about 5% among school children in Chandigarh. It was higher in the urban population, about 7%, compared to the rural population, about 3%. So if we always thought that myopia is an urban disease and rural population when they were going out to um, uh, seeing distant objects, farming and things like that, and no concentration on near, the prevalence was less. That time we didn't understand this concept of near work versus outdoor activities. So I tried to lay my hands on global data. Elise has quoted from perhaps the same um, uh, sources. 
you see this data which is there of prevalence of myopia I, at each country it is either 2009 11 or 14 i don't have data i couldn't find data beyond 2014 where the prevalence must have gone up and the post covid data which would be really interesting where it must have gone up further and you can see that uh, the, the pardon the inaccuracies of geography especially where india is concerned but uh, we, you can see that approximately one third is the 35% is the uh, incidence in India. And as you go further east towards South Korea, almost every patient, youngster has got uh, myopia. So the, uh, the, that's why knowing ethnicity of the, of the population you're talking about is important because the highest prevalence of myopia tends to occur in East, and, uh, 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 east Asia with much lower prevalences uh, elsewhere about 80 to 90% in the children and young adults in Taiwan, Singapore, um, uh, and as high as 97% of South Korea's 19-year-old military male conscripts. So when they checked soldiers who are being conscripted and there the vision check was, norm was required, they found almost every soldier, every young man going into the South Korean army uh, had myopia, which is very, very alarming. So why does myopia progress? From the idiopathic words that we use now, we know more. But then, of course, we don't have the chair time to tell the patient. So we still say that there are multiple causes instead of saying we don't know the cause. But we know that there is environment or lifestyle which contributes a lot besides genetics. The study hours, the school timings, um, whether you're studying on books or you're studying. Again, we always uh, blame the PC or the laptop, but please understand that even near work on books causes myopia may not be to that extent as it as a PC does, but uh, 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 book reading itself is, is not harmless. So we sometimes encourage children that you can read books and children who are uh, prone to myopia increase will increase even with just books, even if they're not on PCs. So number of hours of close work, Number of hours of outdoor activity, these have been documented. The type of lighting which is there in, indoors, the type of lighting outdoors, the posture, these are things which we need to tell parents, but because of lack of chair time, we say, you have minus 3.5, get these glasses made, go. See me after six months, or depending on the how busy your practice is, see me after one year or whatever it is. But how is your child sitting at home? Is the child lying down in, in bed and reading or, or uh, using the PC or whatever? Uh, what is the distance between the eyes and the reading material, whether it's a PC, mobile phone or the book? Uh, what are the food habits? Very few of us as eye care professionals uh, bother to go into the food habits because we feel, well, children will be children. They will eat burgers, they will eat pizzas and, and so on. So what's the point in talking about it? But making the parents aware that these things do contribute. See, that myopia is a multifactorial disease. So if you just concentrate on your work as an eye care professional, giving the right glasses or contact lenses, it's not the end of the story. So we need to have a gestalt approach. That means an all-around approach to the problem of myopia. And therefore, we need to stress simple things like food habits as well. We are aware as eye care professionals that it is uh, the, the hyperopic defocus, which is the root cause of the, uh, the problem. And if we can aim for myopic defocus, then we, we would uh, really solve this um, issue. In the old days, our eye care professionals, not really understanding why they were doing it, would often undercorrect myops. So the, the, the concept was very built in. So th then around 25, 30 years ago, we were told, no, no, you must not undercorrect, you must fully correct the myops. But the concept of undercorrecting a myope was at that time because the, when you undercorrect, there is less of a hyperopic defocus than when you overcorrect or you fully correct. So maybe there was something in it over there. Of course, now we, there is no question of undercorrecting. We need to see to it that there is no hyperopic uh, defocus. And if we can correct them, like in the bottom slide, where, uh, where all images fall on the retina, both central and peripheral, we will have won the uh, battle. It's the peripheral defocus, which is the culprit. When we give a child single vision glasses, where they're looking through that glass over there, it beautifully focuses on the macula uh, and the child sees very clearly. But the peripheral rays have to go out and that's how the glasses are built. So they will go behind the eye and focus behind the eye, giving you that um, the, the hyperopic defocus in the periphery, which is a great stimulus for myopic progression. 
So the increase in prevalence has also led to myopia related complications, which we will see from uh, Dr. Karobi. And up to now, there was no well established or universally accepted treatment for the prevention or uh, uh, prevention of onset or the prevention of progression till recently. So myopia is a problem, a condition with social, educational and economic consequences. It's not a medical problem alone. It's a problem with huge social consequences, huge economic consequences. If somebody can not see clearly, they can not study clearly, they can not study well. If they can not study well, um, the, the, they uh, uh, go ahead and become manual laborers and things like that. There is a, a psychological effect on the myope. The myope becomes more uh, inward looking, doesn't mix with people because he can't play outdoor sports as well as others because he can't sight the ball or the racket or the, uh, the, the shuttle uh, as well. So he goes more into uh, indoor work, becomes a bookworm, his myopia increases. So there is social implications. There is uh, the mental health in, uh, implications. So what is the government doing in India? The government started the school vision screening program when I was a student and it's fully sponsored by the government of India and free spectacles are supposed to be provided to poor children across India. So at, at that time, they had said that by the year 2020, this is what the government had promised, we will eliminate blindness due to refractive error by giving uh, refractive services at primary level across India. Of course, we know that unfortunately due to COVID and other reasons, this infrastructure is far from being in place. There is a school health program, but as of now, last two years, there is no schools. So in reality, uncorrected refractive error leads to learning difficulties, reduced performance, as I said, ultimately affects the psychosocial development of the child. So we do need, again and again, I stress this, that we do need to go beyond the science of, of, uh, of um, uh, medicine and go to the art of medicine and treat the child and the parents as a whole unit and take them into confidence and become partners with them um, uh, in detection, evaluating these children and bringing them out of their shell and getting them to where the correct detection. How do we reduce the prevalence of uh, myopia? Perhaps in India also, we tend to overemphasize academic performance uh, aside from an aberration like the Olympics where the whole country focused on the javelin throw. We, we tend to uh, uh, overemphasize academics. My son came third in school. My daughter came second in the class. And that is given huge amount of, the, the, of priority. And so we neglect the structured outdoor activity, which many other countries uh, stress. Maybe we need to move away from total uh, devotion to academics and stress on the all-round development of these children. Because we know these are facts which are now well known. I'm just quoting Rose's study in 2008, where it said that it defined low amount of near work is if it's less than 1.5 hours, it's ideal. And high is anything above 2.5 hours a day, uh, which is high. And the more the near work, the more the myopia. Conversely, the great amount of outdoor activities, greater the amount of outdoor activities, which halts myopia onset. Again, Rose et al. classified, what do we mean by low? So low outdoor time is less than one and a half hours. Very few Indian children spend more than one and a half hours outdoors. Just now, of course, COVID is there. So when I tell parents, they said, because of COVID, we're not allowing our children to mix with others. So they're not going outdoors. So that is the unfortunate uh, truth. There have been a lot of studies on this from Australia, from China, showing us that the more the time they spend outdoors due to various causes, I won't, since this is an overview, I won't go into details of how, how much outdoor activity because of outdoor lighting, which you can't mimic. In China, they tried, just like they tried to, uh, 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 to copy everything. Let's see if we can copy the sun. So they took um, the, the huge amount of extra, extra light into classrooms indoors and try to see whether that halts the progression of myopia. It doesn't. So you need that outdoor sunlight, which uh, is got multiple factors. The spectral distribution is something that uh, of the sun, which we can't copy inside the classrooms with artificial light, whether it is LED or CFL. So what are our concerns of parents? My, the parent, the mother comes to me and says, will my child's myopia progress? I'm not interested in mumbo jumbo. Tell me, will my child's myopia progress? And can you do something to stop this? Will my child go blind? So these are things which we should be able to 
progress you know proactively address don't wait for the mother or the child of, of the child to ask you these questions you should be able to reassure them that yes the myopia myopia is something with i tell them that myopia is because your child's refractive power is too strong your child is too strong they are not weak they feel that the, my child's eyes are weak so i tell them myopic eyes are not weak they are strong they are much stronger than those who have plus numbers they are able to bend the rays of light more than what is required it's like an iron bar which somebody superman can bend fully and others can't bend at all so they are bending the rays much more so your child's eyes are strong i am going to make them weaker by giving glasses so first of all get that into their head that the child's eyes are not so it's it's psychology is how you play how you talk to the uh, parents can will my child go blind no you keep coming to me that's again a big plug keep coming to me you we will see to it that your child will not go blind because we look at everything we look at the retina we look at the cataracts we look at everything and we look not only at the number can we avoid spectacles yes and no there are alternates to spectacles there is ortho k there is uh, the contact lenses not every child will will tolerate them not every, every child will wear them but there are alternates when can my child wear contact lenses again this is the, uh, the, the uh, something which you need to assess the um, um, uh, maturity of the child you need to you can give it to younger children provided the parents are mature if the parents are immature then you need to give it to older children so somebody has to be mature enough to look after the contact lenses you can't leave it with an immature child and an immature or a non understanding parent about who has no concepts of hygiene when you're talking to them they're not following they only want to hear what they want to hear not a good idea to give them contact lenses when can we do laser now this is uh, easily answered because the us fda has said 18 years so you can safely say that of course in india we are more democratic than the us so we have no such uh, criteria like the fda so you could do it earlier but we tend to go by the us fda and what are the chances that my second child will so these are some of the questions that that they ask and we need to uh, them so these are some of the predisposing factors now chavan and myself had come out with a, a, a classification the uh, chavan kuresh the chandrashekar kuresh uh, um, sort of predictor of uh, myopia but we know this from other studies that the younger the uh, detection of myopia younger the age at which myopia is detected the chances of them progressing are higher so if a patient comes to you at age of say 7 years as in the first bar the chances of uh, the progress of the uh, amount of annual progression is 0.89 which is shown in the first bar you can read that so a, 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 a child of 7 the chances that he will grow by about 0.75 to 1 every year as as opposed to a child of say 15 or 16 at first detection the chances of progression are much uh, less or 0.19 every year and this is i won't go into the details but we are given points uh, uh, to the progression of uh, uh, the morbidity risk of this uh, myopia and we'll try and popularize uh, this um, uh, more we not really published as we should so we gave points to this and based on this uh, points john if you finish taking a picture i'll move the slide so it, um, uh, we said that three points or less is low risk six points is medium risk and anybody having nine points or more is higher risk and if somebody has 10 points in that it almost guarantees irreversible visual loss by the age of 55 or 60 unless myopia control measures are adopted So, uh, uh, i am not going into the modalities to control myopia we know that the modalities which we currently have are uh, uh, executive bifocals multifocal contact lenses ortho k the uh, peripheral defocal spectacles progressive lenses and topical atropin and we have speakers who will go into depth on all these uh, modalities there is a myopia progression calculator the red line which is there shows shows the curve if the myopia is not controlled by the means in the previous slide and the green is the plateauing which will be reached if it is uh, controlled so as i uh, uh, summarize we need to again talk about lifestyle changes minimum 2 and 1/2 hours or so of outdoor time post covid era of course some amount of lifestyle modification some healthy eating habits uh, can be uh, stress And the options that we have to put a break on my progression again to summarize ortho k low dose atropin multifocal soft contact lenses my eye control spectacles spending time outdoors avoiding continuous close work indoors 
and healthy food with green vegetables. I thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. This was really fantastic. Uh, see, as I said, you know, the thing which you will never get to learn in college, in these two days, you will learn so much, right? Two years of education. Thank you very much, sir. It was really wonderful. So I invite uh, Dr. Karobi Lahiri, a famous uh, retinal surgeon, and today's uh, Dr. B.T. Maskati Memorial Award winner uh, to present us with the uh, complications that are going to happen or can happen with uh, high myopia. Hey, hey, madam, so much share the sound of Zoom. I'm a half minute. Go down and go down it. मतलब पहले दवा देने का दवा देने का अच्छा पड़ेगा लेकिन यहाँ पे मुझे नहीं
इसको नीचे ले लेना ना क्योंकि इसका है ऊपर इसका जो कलर है वो नहीं नहीं बट वो मेरे रास्ते में आएगा ना नहीं तो उसको ऊपर कोने में कर दूँगा फुल स्क्रीन पे कभी कभी वो माउस ले ज़ूम सब क्या है क्या I'm sorry for that little delay. Good morning, everybody. It's nice to be in a physical conference almost after two years, and great to have this feel of people sitting in front and listening to you. Otherwise, it used to be so boring just looking at your computer screen and wondering and going over and seeing how many participants are there. So, thank you, Chandrasekhar and Kuresh for this opportunity to come and present so early in the uh, uh, once we are resuming our normal activities for conferences. I'm going to speak to you today about myopia complications. Uh, this uh, is just a diagram to show you the focus which is not on the retina. And uh, let's go over a few details. Now when we talk about myopia, we talk about three basic varieties, which is the congenital myopia, which is a different ball game altogether, the simple or the developmental myopia, and the pathological or the degenerative myopia. My emphasis today would be on the third variant, which is uh, the pathological or degenerative myopia, with a few feelers about uh, the remaining. Now, uh, the classification, uh, etiological classification, it is. Uh, sort of cited axial myopia which is almost three diopters which is equal to one millimeter 
if it is a curvature myopia because of the corneal lens where it is tantamount to six diopters it is positional myopia whether it is because of dislocation of the lens or eye well uh, myopia can be because of excessive accommodation which is because of spasm of accommodation or suspensory ligament rupture and it could be an index myopia where you get a change in the refractive index because of nucleus sclerosis, incipient cataract or diabetes. Congenital myopia we find in conditions like premature babies, Marfan's homocystinuria. Now the thing is that children when we are following them up for prematurity we always advise them that they have to come by the sixth month for a refractive evaluation because of prematurity is something very new and almost 95 to 98 percent of these children tend to have myopia and if it is diagnosed and given there are some children who also come with different kind of defects that is uh, neurodevelopmental defects along with prematurity because of many causes like HIE etc and these are children who are helped very very much by the presence of a glass given as early as six months of age. Uh, so if you look for it, you can diagnose it, but generally it gets diagnosed by two to three years when the child, uh, when the parents notice that there is something. There is an increase in axial length and the overall, overall uh, globe size. And uh, if it's unilateral, it can produce amblyopia and strabismus. And if it is bilateral, the child has in distance vision and holds things rather close so you have to pick them up but rather than that we if we make it a dictum that every child has to have a refractive evaluation at six months of age following macular development it would go a long way in preventing amblyopia in preventing strabismus and also in helping the normal global development of a child uh, what he is supposed to have. Now congenital myopia is associated if it is syndromic with a lot of other issues like cataracts, microphthalmus, aniridia, megalocornia, congenital separation of the retina and these have to be identified, the syndrome identified, you look for things which is there and you anticipate what is not there and be prepared for it and prepare the parent also for it. Now the degree of myopia could be low, medium or high and low means less than three, medium means three to six, and high myopia is more than six diopters. And what is pathological myopia? It's a degenerative or progressive myopia, and it starts in childhood between five to 10 years of age. And there is a rapid progressive myopia associated with degenerative changes, which continue even further on. So now just to go over some interesting facts, the lengthening of the posterior part of the Globe occurs uh, in the active in the uh, period of active growth. The eye and the brain show precocious growth at the age of, till the age of four years. That is, the brain is 84 percent, the eye is 78 percent, and the rest of the body is 21 percent. But there is a shift after four years of age where both the eye and the brain they increase slowly, and then the body grows rapidly. However, when axial myopia continues to progress, it is interpreted as precocious growth, which has failed to get arrested. So that is how you get a progressive myopia. Now, there are different terminologies for pathological myopia. It can be called as degenerative myopia, malignant myopia, high degree myopia, progressive myopia, or magna myopia. But with any of these terminologies, it's the same thing that we are talking about. So, to recapitulate, high myopia, greater than 6 diopters, axial length, the length is around 26 to 27, greater than 8, it is about 32.5. It is the seventh leading cause of blindness and myopia, 6 to 18 percent of them progress to high myopia over a course of time. So the degenerative changes also which accompany myopia when it is a progressive myopia are more so in the posterior segment and there is a degeneration of the coriretinal tissue associated with a parallel elongation of the eyeball. Now what is the etiopathogenesis? It is most commonly a genetic uh, factor and general growth process is a small variant. 
Now there is more growth of the retina, there is obvious stretching of the sclera, there's increase in the axial length, there's degeneration of the choroid, there's degeneration of the retina, and there is degeneration of the vitreous. Sorry, it's called hidden in that, uh, uh, under that bar. Now, the etiology is also multifactorial. It could be mechanical or environmental causes, or it could be biological causes. Now, what is the pathogenesis? In the mechanical theories, there is a distension of the normal sclera and the increase in the intraocular pressure is caused by the extraocular muscle or the internal insidious chronic glaucoma. The other theories are due to venous congestion, inflammation or dietary deficiency. It's a multifactorial uh, causative uh, uh, condition. And the complications are numerous. The most important complications that we focus on basically is the myopic macular degenerations, retinal detachments, cataracts, and glaucoma. But apart from that, there is a host of other conditions like vitreous hemorrhage, choroidal hemorrhage, strabismus, which I will outline shortly. Now, the manifestations of pathological myopia could be anatomical, it could be functional, or it could be ocular manifestations. Now, when we are talking about anatomical manifestations, they could be in the anterior segment or in the posterior segment. So, in the anterior segment, it, there could be corneal astigmatism, deep AC, iris angle processes, zonular dehiscences, and in the posterior part, it could be a tilted disc, peripapillary detachment in the uh, in, in pathological myopia, temporal crescent or halo atrophy, vitreous synergesis, pigment epithelial thinning lattice retinal degenerations, choroidal tessellations, scleral expansion and thickening, formation of foveal retinoschisis and decreased ocular rigidity. Now, as we are going further into the latter part of this uh, anatomical manifestations, the more severe vision threatening conditions arise. So, what is degeneration? There is a liquefaction of the vitreous opacity, there is fibrillar aggregation and there's breakdown and this leads to a posterior vitreous separation. Now, because there is a posterior vitreous separation, you can get a traction induced and this traction can cause a retinal tear and if there is a liquefied vitreous within the eye, you can, that can gain entry through the hole and cause a retinal detachment. So, if a person who is myopic comes to you with any symptoms of flashes, floaters or black spots or in the other variants, he comes with decrease of vision, sudden, then these are alarming signals and you have to see that person almost immediately because if there is a retinal tear, you could treat it and avert a retinal detachment where the condition may be more severe requiring surgery and you uh, sometimes are even not able to retrieve it. I mean, it, it sometimes goes into recurrences and uh, it's a lost case. So you treat it beforehand. Now the other conditions are the posterior staphylomas. It is because of the ectasia of the sclera at the posterior pole. And it is evident because you see a, a kind of excavation and the vessels dip into that excavation and come out from the end. And the staphylomas then cause a foveoschisis and it can give rise to a full thickness macular hole. And both this foveoschisis and the uh, full thickness macular holes can terminate in a macular detachment. So what is the categorization of a myopic maculopathy? There are four categories to it. One, where there is no macular degenerative lesion. Second, where there's only a tessellated fundus appearance with no other abnormalities. Third, where there is a diffuse chorioretinal atrophy. Fourth, where there is a patchy chorioretinal atrophy. And fifth, where the macular atrophy occurs, which is a very severe form, where the BCVA is reduced markedly. And more currently is the ATN classification. You get tractional detachments, tractions on the macula, or you have got neovascular tendencies in the form of uh, choroidal neovascular uh, membranes. So this is how it is. A tessellated fundus can give rise to a diffuse uh, atrophy or a staphyloma, or it can give rise to lacquer cracks. 
Now, LACA cracks are small uh, sort of breaks in the Brooks membrane, and these can facilitate the growth of new vessels from the undersurface, uh, from the choroid, into the layers of the retina. It can also cause patchy atrophy. It can cause patchy atrophy coalescence, and both the myopic CNVM and the patchy atrophic uh, coalescence can cause macular entropy, which is the endpoint. These are other uh, listed to show macular holes and dome-shaped maculas. Now coming to the functional manifestations, what does it give rise to? Image minification, which we all know of, an isometropic amblyopia, which has to be uh, corrected, subnormal visual acuity, again, which has to be corrected, visual field defects, which again have to be addressed, impaired dark adaptation, abnormal color description, and suboptimal binocularity. Now, the ocular manifestations, again, can be divided in those occurring in the anterior segment and those occurring in the posterior segment. In the anterior segment, we can get strabismus, we can get cataracts, we can get glaucoma. The strabismus obviously comes on because there is a different number in uh, two different eyes, and probably the glasses have not been given on time, and the more amblyopic eye goes into a state of squint. And the cataracts and glaucomas, which are there, and in the posterior segment, we have these occurrences of retinal detachments, especially the regmatogenous variety, lacquer cracks, lattice degenerations, cobblestone degenerations, which I will show you pictures of shortly, Fuchs spot, which is an RPE hyperplasia in response to a CNVM which is coming from underneath, scleral thinning, peripheral retinal holes, macular holes causing retinal detachment or myopic foveous cases, which are uh, tense conditions. CNVM formation or posterior staphylomas. So this is a folk spot where you get a hemorrhagic area and sometimes if it is fibrovascular you get it as an elevated area at the macula. This clears off on its own, doesn't require anything but you know that there is an active elongation pathology going on behind. RPE is getting hyperplastic over there. progress in horror. Okay. Huh. So then uh, the thing is that if you have a symptomatic PVD, what does it entail? 10 to 15 percent breaks are detected at the first assessment. 1.5 to 3.5 retinal breaks then occur at four to six weeks. So if you have got a PVD and the patient is having symptoms, you see him initially, but also call him about one, one and a half months later for a further peripheral check. Vitreous degeneration, if with vitreous hemorrhage, it is got a propensity of developing retinal breaks in almost 20%. And if there is no vitreous hemorrhage, it drops down to only 4%. And PVD without the gel collapse, is associated with future hole or retinal hemorrhage because there is a scaffold for proliferative new vessels to grow. Lattice degenerations is a common retinal degeneration seen in myopia, almost 8 to 10 percent have it, but 20 to 40 percent of the RD patients have lattice degenerations, and this is a common feature in moderate myopes. So these are all the kind of degenerations that you see a pigmented lattice degeneration, a simple lattice degeneration, there is a cobblestone degeneration, there are uh, uh, horseshoe tears seen in the lower right, and uh, this is a tear uh, horseshoe uh, lattice degeneration is also seen. Retinal detachments, if this is not catered to, is a culmination of uh, the fluid getting under the retina and detaching it. The upper is a fresh detachment, whereas what you see in the lower left is a place where it has been there for some time because it gets crinkled and goes into a stage of PVR. Myopic RDs, the refractive error of this is about one to three diopters, and it is a four-fold greater risk of RD than a non-individual. But if the refractive errors go to beyond three diopters, the risk is almost tenfold. So you have to see these patients very carefully. The periphery has to be examined. These are other cases of detachments. Now myopic foveoscesis. This is the prevalence of this is about nine to thirty-four percent, 
And what is a pathogenesis? Pathogenesis. It can occur because of a contracted vitreous cortex, which is touching the retina, contracting. It could occur because of epiretinal membranes, which contract. It could be because of a retinal vascular traction or because of a rigidity of the internal limiting membrane. And these are the pictures of myopic foveoschisis where you find that there is a separation and uh, you get another layer beneath it. And this is myopic macular traction where the, myop the, where the PVD, uh, like the, uh, uh, the posterior hyaloid, it tautens and it pulls up the retina and generally requires surgery. And this is pre and post surgery. And a macular hole formation is if the traction continues and it pulls up a certain portion of the macula, you can get either a full thickness or a partial thickness hole. Lacquer cracks, again, as I said, were uh, ruptures in the Brooks membrane, and uh, these develop small hemorrhages. And uh, this also has to be seen. And these are CNVMs in pathological myopia. Now, if you see this, there are areas of patchy atrophy all around, and there is almost a scarification of the macula. And this person, came with complaints of diminished vision. Now, when you look at a fundus like this, you feel that there is nothing over there. But when you do tests like the OCTA, you find that there is a prevalence of a CNVM underlying the macula. And then you can pinpoint it and then treat it. If it's under the macula, you treat it with injections, anti or otherwise you can do a laser if it's extrafoveal. This is another example of a CNVM without uh, you know, fluid. And uh, the reasons why CNVs form in this is because of induced hypoxia to the outer retina, which is a large source of VEGF secretion. So when choriretinal stretching, lacquer crack formation, choroidal thinning, choroidal flow disturbances with reduced flow, choroidal filling delays, RP and overlying retinal atrophies, loss of photoreceptors, all of them can be contributory to growth factor release and myopic CNV formation. The role of each these, uh, of these and the interconnections between them is well known. Now, the CNVMs occur like this and then they scar like this. Now, when they scar, again, they cause a very kind of discrepant kind of vision. And there is the Fuchs spot, the posterior staphylomas. And this is how it lands up ultimately because many patients land up with a geographic atrophy where the uh, entire macula is scarred. So the vision drops down markedly. These are other features. And just a small look at the myopic cataract, which can be any kind of cataracts in myopia, but there is a prevalence of the same. And this has to be treated depending on where the position is and uh, how much of visual di disturbance it gives rise to. And myopic glaucoma is another feature which has to be addressed because you have to be sure to fit, take the pressures every time the patient comes. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Uh, we'll see about uh, say many hundred patients, then you would say about 50 to 60 percent of them are myopic. The rest of it because of other causes, maybe traumatic or uh, uh, hereditary or you know associated with syndromes, etc. But uh, uh, a larger percentage is myopic. So that is good. Yeah. Because we are just treating some of the other uh, particles and they are taking all but. Is and when you check a myop, this is what you have to look for. The periphery has to be scanned for uh, changes in the peripheral retina. And if there are breaks there, which are symptomatic, they have to be treated. Or if there is a strong family history of a detachment, etc., be treated before so that you can avoid the occurrence of detachments. And then when you the retinal issues happen a little bit earlier in the age, 
No, it can, yes, it can occur at all ages. I mean, the thing is that it all depends on how uh, sort of uh, heavy is the myopia. What is the kind of features which go on? And you can get it in the younger age groups also. We get a lot of children who de de tend to develop this. And it is very difficult in those patients because many a times, sometimes there is not much sinuriasis in the younger patients. In the older patients, there is sinuriasis of the vitreous, so it's easier. But in the younger age groups, uh, the peeling, etc., everything becomes very difficult. <laughs> No, we have to watch. See, because the thing is that somebody with a single tear, localized detachment, you treat those patients, you expect a good reaction. Means suppose you're doing a buckle for them, you expect a good reaction from this. Though we have to give them the chance that 10 to 15 percent can land up with a PVR, which would necessitate one surgery, maybe multiple surgeries. And we have to also tell them that even after multiple surgeries, sometimes if it recurs, the eyes sometimes become lifeless, so uh, it can be a lost cause. So all these prognoses and all have to be given to every patient who has a retinal detachment. So the thing is that rather than go into that, it is better to be prophylactic. See them every six months. If it is a high myopic, you tell them that, you know, you have to see that your visit is there. Do a careful ret uh, retinal examination with a depression. If there is anything which is suspect, in a symptomatic patient treat, or if there is a family history you treat. So that way you are preventing a major chunk of uh, detachments from happening. See what happens is that if there is a lot of RP atrophy underlying and you have a detachment, you have settled the retina, the retina has settled, but the functional part doesn't come on. So the thing is that it's because the RP layer, which is the powerhouse for all the vision improvements which occur, if that is not functional, obviously it is not going to give rise to anything. But we are not going to know what is the functional, uh, this until you do it and then you experience it. And sometimes what happens is that even after you get a successful uh, reattachment, the vision doesn't improve. So there nowadays what we do is that we do the OCT because sometimes a minor amount of fluid remaining in that macular area can cause it. So then it requires like treatment where you put in gas, give him position so that, you know, that also gets absorbed. And if the RP thinning is there or an atrophy is there, then obviously you have to counsel because atrophy you can see. So when you see that, you have to counsel the patients that they are not going to have perfect vision or, you know, people generally think that when you do surgeries, you have to get good vision because you have got a surgery done. But that's not the case. So you have to prognosticate. In fact, when we counsel these patients for a surgery, our counseling for retina almost takes 20, 25 minutes because you have to tell them all about all the nuances, you know. So that is the thing. And that is 20 minutes if you talk to them about once. If the relatives and all come and ask <laughs> questions, yeah. you can go up to one hour also, you know. <laughs> so it's a repeat. Of of 10 to 15 percent of any retinal detachment. And the thing is that uh, in uh, ROP patients and all, where we get detachments and all that, those are a different ballgame altogether. So there in closed funnel detachments, you get just about an 8 percent success rate of anatomical reattachment not functional, functional, we don't know. And if it's an open funnel, then it's about 25 to 30%. Yes, yes, it is a serious issue. So don't let it happen. And if myopia is there, try to curb it, you know, and so that you prevent the complications. And if some complication starts, you treat it early so that you can prevent a major mishap from happening. Thank you. Yes. Oh my God. Okay. No, the counselor is very important because the thing is that there are many times when you see some breaks in patients, you know, there might be a horseshoe tear in the upper part. And you tell them that, you know, you get a prophylactic laser done because the patient had some symptoms and all that. But uh, some people say that, no, 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 it's nothing, no problems and all. I've had one or two patients who have not this, and within a month, they have come back with attachment.
ओके and uh, was the kid symptomatic that's the reason why they taken the child or just for a routine evaluation sometimes okay okay the probability that the break was there is definitely there and sometimes what happens it's a small thing in c2 you know it just starts and then you know if it's a superior tear it cascades down to the macula that yeah see many people don't do a depression so what happens is that if uh, you land up with a person who's not done any depression he could miss these findings so depression is very very important for all myops because you have to know at least you have a diagram which shows you you know what are the degenerative lesions if they have got any lattice degenerations if there are small hair holes stairs any other stem cobblestone degeneration there are some which are safe there are some which are uh, which have a propensity to like sort of go bad so you have to counsel them accordingly whatever they have very true because the depression has to be done thank you I really thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak on this. This was something we started in 2013, and there will be a lot of. Uh, where will be the presentation? Share screen. Hello, Khulil. So there will be a lot of overlap from where uh, uh, Dr. Muscati has left, and uh, I will be picking up almost a lot of uh, similar, uh, lot of similar things. Except that, uh, so this was uh, normally I would like to start with this slide mainly because this was uh, in 2010 when Dr. Bram Holden uh, a, a small slide was in uh, Dr. Muscati's uh, presentation on the myopia calculator, and so this was uh, this was the guy who published in 2010 what is going to be uh, so what they did was they tried to see the previous uh, database on what is the prevalence of myopia and they tried to extrapolate as to what would be the future and that they published that uh, at the end of uh, 2050 almost 52 percent of the population world population would be myopic and 10 percent would be high myope and this is uh, again uh, taken from their article which was published as to how much and where would be uh, the myopes, what would be the prevalence across the globe. And uh, so basically the big debate, which already uh, Sir has pointed on between nature and nurture as to what are the genetic factors which are responsible for uh, myopia and the environmental aspect of progression of myopia. So yes, there is definitely a, a, a prevalence because of genetics and we will see to more and more articles these are all the articles which already have been shown by sir and more articles on uh, you know the association between near work and myopia and progression of myopia this is uh, these are some of the articles between correlations between growth spurts and myopic progression so i'll just come down to the key messages from all this literature search which is the fact that if parents have myopia kids are more likely to have it the risk the odds ratio is twice if one of the parents is having myopia and five times if both the parents have myopia. Outdoor activity does make a difference. We already had a, a big good uh, talk on that. Near work, amount of light, all this makes a huge difference. The only point I would to highlight is that uh, be, be, before the height starts increasing, it is two years before that 
that the myopia would uh, set in or the myopia would start progressing. This is another wonderful article. I think this is a very good meta-analysis or rather of all the activities. So I, I keep a print of uh, this small uh, table, which is on the right. Basically, it documents wonderfully all the risk factors which can lead to progression of myopia, low outdoor activities, near work, dim light exposure, low sleeping hours, reduced uh, uh, you know, reading distance. Living in an urban environment is uh, from one of the Indian articles published by Dr. Rohit Saxena when they did a, a, did a study at Delhi, North India uh, myopia study. And uh, so this was where it all started, not really the ATOM-1 study, even before ATOM-1, we knew that atropin does help in reducing the progression of myopia. This is there since almost uh, 25 to 30 years. Like before I was doing my fellowship, we were reading about it. But why atom one is such an important, uh, you know, important landmark for all of us who are using atropin is because of this particular study, which was published in 2006 in ophthalmology. Look at the sample size. They, have, they had 400 Singapore children. Now they have done a very strong good sample size, double mass, placebo controlled study between two eyes. And this was a RCT, but this was between two eyes. You know, getting an ethical uh, committee approval for this, using atropin 1% in one eye and placebo for other eye for two years. And this conclusively proved that atropin works because previously there were a lot of studies. They, they were all longitudinal studies where they were using atropin for some kids and not using atropin for others. And there were genetic uh, things, ethnic uh, activity, near work activities. So different kids were having uh, were in different zones. But this was straightforward between right eye, left eye. The, the eyes were randomized. And they proved that when you use atropin, the progression of uh, myopia goes down by 77%. They did multifocal ERGs. They did maculopathy, OCTs. Everything they did to prove that, you know, the, the, the kids did not go for amblyopia even when, you know, they were using atropin 1%. This is atropin 1%. This is not 0.01%. And then, you know, when, when they proved that atropin 1% works, the problem, obviously, we all know that what atropin does is atropin will reduce your accommodation, you can't see for near, you have to give bifocals. And photophobia is a big problem. So they, what they did was they tried to see what is the optimum concentration. And the best way to do it was to use atropin 1%, to use 0.1%, and instead of placebo, they used 0.01%. So their ATOM2 study was, this is the five-year uh, data. And we all know that what is the advantage of using a low concentration atropin. Obviously, the advantage is based on the fact that there is almost minimal to no effect on accommodation. The chances of systemic side effects obviously go down because you are using a hundred times diluted concentration. The fact that they did not have a placebo was because of the fact that when you dilute an allopathic drug to hundred times, you feel that uh, the concentration is no more viable. The concentration is no more effective. That is the reason they did not have a placebo arm, which LAMP1 and LAMP2 study did have. They had 0.01%, they had diluted 1% to 0.01%, thinking that this would serve as a placebo arm. And to their surprise, it, it worked very well. So this is from the, their, this is the five-year data, ATOM2 study, and their five-year data where they suggested that atropin 0.01% was quite effective. Of course, it was a dose-dependent response, but it was quite effective. And the only reason I am not harping on atom 2 is because now we have got, there are more than 65 to 70 studies on atropine eye drops. The only reasons why I have selected these four to five studies and then I would jump onto our data is because these studies are making, uh, you know, they, they were slightly different from what was being already known or what was being done. So LAMP 1, what they did was they went further. They now knew with the, armed with the data in 2018, they, they knew that 0.01% is working. And between 0.1 and 0.01%, there was a huge 10 times uh, dilution. So what they did was they took small steps. They took 0 0.5, 0 0.05, and half of it, 0 0.025 and 0 0.01, and started comparing this. So they published their LAMP-1 phase 1 study, and they found that it was dose-dependent, but this was only one-year data. They found that it was dose-dependent. They found that it was... 0 0.025 was better than 0 0.01, which was 0 0.05 was better than 0 0.025. And then this is head-to-head -head data between LAMP-1, that is phase 1 study, and ATOM-2. This is the lower one is ATOM-2. 
why is this a study important because it increase when you increase the dose the response is increased most important is the side effects are not increased this is very important for us to understand that you know when we have only atom uh, when we have only atropine 0.01% we don't have an alternative what to do when 0.01% patients do not respond to 0.01% so this study proved that you know uh, the the response to atropine is dose dependent that was a very important thing which came out of lamp 1 and which was followed by lamp 2 study they found that 0.05% was more effective than 0.01%. And they found that it was optimal because the side effects were still low. The near point of accommodation, the photophobia, pupil size, all were not being significantly uh, affected by 0.05%. And this is again head to head comparison between two year study of LAMP and two year study of ATOM. Few other things which normally I'm asked during my talk on atropine is that whether you know, whether it can be used in astigmatism or whether it affects lens or whether it affects cornea. This this has been, okay, no, not this one. Uh, this has been already published from uh, from an offshoot of LAMP2 study. There's the same authors, same group, which published that it does not affect any other ocular biometry parameter except axial length. And one more uh, part of the study, which was also published by ATOM2 study was that Younger the age, as uh, Muskati sir showed in his talk, that younger the age, more are the chances that myopia will progress faster, and it will be the child will be a non-responder to low concentration atropine. So we come back to where does it lead us to? I mean, all this data search, what does it tell finally? It finally says that atropine does reduce the progression of myopia. This is now established beyond doubt with you know multitude of uh, publications that atropine does work it may work in 60 to 70 percent of children but it does work concentration dependent so if you increase the concentration the response will be better 0.01 percent of course 0.01 percent does hold value because there have been publications that 0.01 percent is working but since it is dose dependent we are in search of a stronger concentration if 0.01 percent is not responding so the questions which it leads to is that can we increase the concentration in non-responders? That needs to be answered because it has not been used in non-responders. Just that head-to-head 0.05% is better than 0.01%. So this was uh, where we started in 2013. Uh, this was uh, the baseline. And we had almost, th this was, this is basically the data when we, when we presented it in 2019. So this is the longitudinal study of 2019. We have not looked into this data because we, we did started doing some other uh, smaller studies. And uh, similar to our studies, there have been other Indian studies which, which have been published on 0.01%. Recently, uh, Dr. Rohit Saxena and uh, Lipika and multiple other authors, Jyoti, presented their findings. Uh, this, is the, this is the article which was published in uh, 2021. Uh, this was one-year data. And uh, we presented our RCT in 2018 AIUS. And I will just show a graph and move further. So this was uh, the difference between atropine and control group. This was uh, presented in 2018. So this is the same data. And uh, yeah, so we also did, we also tried to do, see when, when we are using the drops for a very long time, we should also start looking at the compliance, like you look at the compliance in glaucoma patients, because you have to, because most of the patients like in patching, and most of the diseases in pediatric ophthalm have a long uh, follow-up. So we tried to look into the compliance in a very short term, and we found that almost 14 to 15% of patients do not use these drops, despite you know telling them. And the propensity of them not using in the first month is higher. Parents who are using in the first month will continue to use it, and parents who stop using in the first month even after explaining it to them that this would be the consequences, they would still not agree to it or will not use it. Uh, we also tried to see, uh, so this is this is something which which has not been studied a lot, uh, the concept of pre-myops, because the whole concept of pre-myopia is when the myopia is yet to start or it has just started. The question always is, and I think the, the risk probability ratio which, or the risk ratio which uh, Sir has devised, I would go back and try to try to see whether these pre-myops were fitting into it or not, because 
Prebiotics is something which most of us, uh, you know, do, do not uh, or do, we do not take them seriously. But prebiotics is the age at which we should be trying to stop the progression of myopia because that would be really helpful. And that is where, uh, you know, uh, as uh, Madam said that, you know, if we try to examine these babies as early as possible and stop having that phobia that, you know, kids are too small and they cannot be examined. Like, as she said, that if you examine them at six months of age, you will have a baseline. That is the most important thing in myopia. Having a baseline is most important. We don't have a baseline. Patient is switching to the doctors. Patient is changing doctors or optometrists. And we don't know what the other person has done, whether that person has used cycloplegic uh, uh, homotropin or cyclopentolate, and whether they have used tropical cell plus. Their number is coming minus 5. Yours is coming minus 4.5. So pre myops are the group of patients which we were following up over a long period. And they were already either very small hyperopes and uh, they were going towards uh, emetropia or they were very early myopes. And we were following them up since the beginning with, uh, you know, my plus 0.5 and they had switched over to minus 0.5. We found that using low concentration atropine does work in pre myops. And all these pre myops, we did have uh, their axial length data also. I think I would again re stress that axial length is also equally important because atropine will be working only in axial myopia, not in congenital myopia, as Madam already described that there can be multiple reasons for myopia. There can be other problems like prematurity, like Marfan syndrome. Atropin may not really work in those patients and not even in curvature myopia or other cases of myopia. And this was another work which we did try to compare since we do not have a higher concentration of uh, low concentration atropin. Funny that, you know, we have a paradox of higher concentration and low concentration. But uh, so we tried to use low concentration atropin twice a day versus once a day and in a small subset of patients we did find that uh, twice a day usage had more tighter control of course it was already known that you know it is a concentration dependent response but uh, even using it twice a day also helps and we also try to use it in non-responders because you know once you start using low concentration atropine in most of your myopic progressors you will have uh, uh, almost 10 to 25 percent of patients who will not be responding to low concentration atropine. And so we, we started using twice a day approach to these and almost 30% of the patients, 30% of the non-responders were still responding to uh, twice a day. And I hope they will be responding to higher concentration atropine whenever it is available. Another uh, point which was raised was about uh, the, 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 that data would be interesting to see what happened in COVID and the number of patients and number of myopes would be more once we come out uh, of the data and there have been a couple of uh, articles already from China where they have uh, discussed about the data from quarantine. Uh, I recently had uh, was reviewing a paper on quarantine myopia. We uh, have uh, we have already submitted our work uh, on quarantine myopia and we found that you know the between these were the patients whom we had told to use atropine and they were not using atropine and were still on our follow-up and these patients almost doubled with their progression of myopia during quarantine. The average growth almost, almost doubled uh, during, the, during this particular area. Now, one more interesting question which is asked in myopia progression or use of atropine is whether it is related with, uh, any way related with accommodation or not. We tried to do a small subset of patients uh, where we had patients whom we had operated for pediatric cataract and they were above four years of age. So they were well beyond their physiological growth and were still progressing beyond a rate which we expected was not normal to their physiological growth. And we tried to use, uh, this is the data of those uh, seven children and uh, we tried to use low concentration atropine and it does work in those patients also. And uh, so the point being that when the lens is out, there is no role of accommodation in, uh, at least in these patients, uh, atropine was working without any presence of uh, reducing the accommodation or affecting the accommodation in any way. So uh, adverse effects, yes, despite the fact that it is 0.01%, uh, there, there can be patients who would be uh, coming to you uh, as allergy to atropine sulfate. It is a sulfur drug. 
So there can be patients where it is allergic to atropine sulfate. It is possible that there is absolutely no response to this particular concentration. It is very much possible. And younger the child, more are the possibilities that child would not respond to low concentration atropine. Blurring and near vision problems, some patients do complain of this. And uh, we just have to go to another option or another modality to stop the progression of myopia in those patients. And there is uh, there has been a small case series of three patients which has been reported saying that because of low concentration atropine, there was a hypoaccommodative uh, effect and that started causing esophoria. Two of those patients, I think, were uh, operated patients. So I would say that whenever we are using low concentration atropine in patients, who are having strabismus or who are having binocular problems, we should be cautious. As such also, we do say that whenever you are using a low concentration atropine eye drops, you should check their near point of accommodation, pupil size and binocular vision and their cover test. So all this is a must because, you know, when you are giving low concentration atropine, not every eye behaves as a standard response because we are dealing with human physiology. Some patients, the absorption may be higher. Some patients, the receptor may respond more than what we expect. And they may end up into having a poor accommodative response and patient may end up into having a hypoaccommodative esotropia. So all these things are possible. We have to keep an eye open. Despite the fact that the concentration is 0.01%, there are always chances that there could be a side effect or adverse effect. This was this uh, this was pattern yearly which we did. These are my own eyes. The upper one is pre-atropin and the lower one is post-atropin. It is safe. We did pattern ERGs just to prove that low concentration atropin did not have a problem with pattern ERG because there were some reports uh, from me that it causes a profound reversible change in pattern ERG. And this was another uh, another work we uh, did to prove that low concentration atropine is not affecting higher order abrasions. This was also very important because there were concerns that you know it, it may affect because of the accommodation, it may affect higher orders and may lead to amniopia or problems because we are we are treating patients here at five years of age or six years of age. So I conclude by saying that low concentration atropine is a wonderful option. It is safe and effective option. At least at this point of time, it is one of the most precious options for controlling uh, the progression of myopia. A lot of work still needs to be done. This is just the beginning. And I know I have been saying this for almost last four years that this is just the beginning. The beginning is taking too long. But yes, uh, there would be higher concentrations. We need to compare higher concentrations. We need to get an optimum concentration. We need to devise biomarkers so that we can find out quickly as to whether atropine is effective or not. We need more classifications and uh, uh, scoring systems to find out which patient would be progressing and which will not be progressing. So thank you everybody. And uh, thank you so much for the attention. Yes. I mean, see, myopia is purely a multifactorial disease. Uh, spending time outdoors and more importantly uh, so so the studies do suggest that you know during the winter months in uh, northern countries scandinavian countries during the winter month myopia progresses faster because the daylight hours are less so yes that definitely it is uh, you know not possible uh, to really spend time in daylight but I, I personally think that you know if they are outdoors at least they would be looking at a distance and they won't be looking close up so th probably that may work but it is difficult. It is not really practical to, you know. I think uh, the, uh, this uh, topic, Horatio, is a very important thing.
short one study where uh, several years back, you know, and one study which showed that the risk is four percent or five percent of therapy, and now it is more. Is it would you say that it is contributory because of uh, all the vaccines that have been given in our life, as well as you know, sort of staying at home because of non existing things are really good Genetics, yeah, I mean, very correct. There are more than 200 locusts. And uh, evolution is very important because more and more myops, myops perform well. Myops have better chances of survival because they are at a higher post. They, I mean, more and more myops, uh, they study well. They are at a better place. So I think uh, myopia also is a result of evolution, result of urbanization. It is not just screens, but, you know, I mean, this is all my personal views. There's no research done on this by myself also. But if you look at uh, the number of hours we spend in classroom or office and trying to look outdoors is always very low. The number of buildings which come up, if you want to look at a distance, you can't look at a distance right next to your house is another person's house. So maybe, I'm not sure, but there are multiple factors. See, uh, Kurishan, we're talking about the We're talking about the there is to be one TV in the entire building that is to see favorite programs, which would be for half an hour. Very true. And yet, also, also, it's very true. So, and back then, there was no mobile phones. It was only landline. That landline also used to be only certain houses, not every house had a home. So, I think, you know, the modernization has really nice. Just, I was talking with him on uh, WhatsApp, and uh, his study says that you know when they try to do it in the in the room. I mean, this is not uh, not done uh, over a period of time. This was like they told the person to read on smartphone, uh, read text on smartphone, see a video on smartphone, and read text from a book. And they tried to do a biometry and tried to do an accommodative lag uh, measurement, and they found that you know uh, the reading from a book was uh, leading to a higher uh, myopic progression and vitreous uh, elongation. My take, I mean, I, I have to go through the entire study, but my take on this is that when you are giving it in a lab setting or in a room setting, things are different because when you tell them to read it in front of you, they would be putting a lot of effort into it. Of course, they would be. In real life, to be honest with the books and to give credit to books, but they are, uh, you know, very bland and nobody from a book it is very difficult to read it for an hour nobody can read a book for an hour constantly but watching television is much easier watching a video nobody will look at the video and try to see each and everything but if you want to read text on a screen you will be holding it more uh, you know you will be have be more attentive more accommodative effort will be used compared to seeing a video because video will give you audio feedback also sometimes you will be listening it to it sometimes you will be looking at the screen so his findings are quite consistent that uh, about the accommodative effort you will be putting in. No, he can't, he can't. Uh, 
So, so Pawan has also done a study which was published last year on uh, the difference in quality of light when you're sitting in shade and when you're sitting outdoors. So, so I mean, there's my, my point being that I think the take home message should be book or screen or everything. Near work is yeah. as bad. Whether it is book or screen, it is not. Uh, I mean, book. Uh, I think the, the point which he wanted to make from the article was, as Sir said, that you know we should tell the parents that the books would also increase myopia. It is not just the, the, the phone or the gadget. So, you know, sometimes what happens is that everybody wants to uh, blame the gadgets and not the traditional books. So I think that that is where Pawan's article is very relevant, that books will be equally bad if you know you are reading, if you are a voracious reader and you are going to read for a couple of hours straight, then books would be as bad, at least in terms of myopic progression. Do you have any study how many So that proves that there are multiple factors. I mean, so I, I was a myop of 2.5 when I was an MBBS. And by the time I came out in ophthalmology, I was minus 4.5. So my myopia progressed after uh, after uh, 18 years of age. And my corneal uh, curvatures are 13 and 40. And I, I, uh, what, what? I didn't, I didn't get it. I, I got married very late. I mean, I got married at 31. I mean, after I finished my fellowship and everything, I was a, I mean, I joined a job and then got married. So, yeah, yeah. Wife is, wife is spared of my, a lot of other things she's not spared of. <laughs> so, my thing on the part is, uh, and I insist on uh, the things about polarity, you know. And it has to be, because there is no thing, right? 
I mean, Honestly speaking, uh, why two years? The, 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 I will add one more question to this that is also routinely asked is uh, the, the um, number of years and the age at which it can be started. These are normally the two questions. The, the age and time is only because of the fact that it has been a recent development and we have mainly the landmark trial of atom one, atom two, lamp one, lamp two, which have used four to 12 years and five to 15 years. So that is the reason why uh, there is no first we were using it off label and then now we have a dgci approved now dgci or uh, anybody which approves is based on the previous clinical trials which is for five to 15 years of age and that is how that is the age group and these were the studies which were done for a set period of two years just to see the response of atropine because they could not assess the response in one year then they saw it in two years and in atom two they found that in the second year they got much better response compared to the first year of the study. So they started using it for two years and you know that was the one thing which triggered it. We did an RCT for three years, regardless of already published data that it was for two years. We still do it for three years, but we tell the patient after two years that this is the data and this is what we are doing. If you wish, you can stop it. Or if the myopia is still progressing slowly, you can continue it. My own son, we have been putting since almost four and a half, five years. We have not stopped it because he does not complain of any problem. He has never complained of glare. He plays cricket and he is able to play. There is no glare. There is absolutely no problem. At least he doesn't have a problem with the low concentration atropine. So uh, not scientifically, uh, but uh, as, a, as a personal opinion, uh, we can use it till three years. We use it for two years, tell the patient that, see, this is the available data. You can, if you wish, you can stop it. But if we are going to stop it, then we have to assess them at three months, not at six months, because there are a lot of patients when you stop, there is rebound. So rebound uh, is less with 0.01%, more with higher concentrations. That has also been already uh, documented that rebound will be there. And if we know that, if we suspect clinically that this patient is going to have a rebound, we can ask him to put it in on alternate day. But those are all anecdotal things. Those are all uh, Jugaad things, not really evidence-based because it is very difficult to gather evidence for each and everything. I mean, we, like, you know, we started giving uh, antibiotics pre-op cataract for five days and then three days. So these are all things which were like a hit and try and th th Every factor cannot be studied. I mean, it is very difficult to study whether alternate day would work or not. So a lot of patients who complain of glare uh, initially. So we started putting them, started telling them that you start putting on alternate days. At least some atropine is going. And if dopamine secretion is increasing by that atropine, maybe they may be helped. So some of the patients are still on alternate day atropine since the beginning, because when they were putting it daily, they were feeling that their pupil was dilated or so if they complain that daily atropine is causing a problem, we tell them to switch over to alternate day. Rebound, we tell them to start. Yes. But I'm also the maximum length that any child of yours has been sitting for five years. Thank you. 
Sorry, uh, we lost the audio, Dr. Jitani. Can you please unmute? Great, thank you. So, uh, morning and evening dosage, uh, whether, uh, you know, there are a lot of factors. So, uh, it was difficult to measure that factor because there will be so many confounding variables which will come. So, at this point of time, we have not, uh, we have not really seen that morning is working or not. So, uh, since I've been talking about time since uh, and we use one of our credit speakers. And he was totally against of using kind of operator measure uh, soft contact measure. He said it doesn't work. And he was, of course, uh, advocating of atrophy. Of them, I would start advocating of atrophy. Uh, atrophy does work, but the problem is rebounds. So you need something to hold it back. And now the international studies have shown the operator measure. Uh, was uh, on actual So, like, so if I look at the you cannot control much. Uh, Multi-modal sulfur dialysis uh, may control this little bit. So, what we do is minus 5 is a cutoff point. If the dialysis is minus 5 or above, then we do combine that. Multi-modal sulfur dialysis or other kind of thing, combine it. Uh, only hydrogen because of as you said, you know, two years you have a strong again you again start. No, no, but so just one. Combine, good no, no, you so should combine, combine, why not? Combine with other Way to do it. So, just one quick comment on rebound that it has been studied that rebound occurs with low concentration atropine. But if you see in terms with rebound, also, if you see in terms of rebound, even after adding to the rebound, the total growth is not as much without atropine. 
so in the longer term atropin works even with the rebound also but combination therapies are always better why not i mean since they are working at two different aspects why not it, it can have a symbiotic action i think it is not no 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 I, i will tell you see we both ophthalmologists and optometrists we are for the patient only but the point is that uh, ortho k is uh, the, the, the two problems uh, which come to my mind is one of them is the prohibitive factor is cost and second thing is uh, i know that the chances of infection are as much as with any other contact lens but with kids sometimes we are more scared because we are in the in this part of the country where it may create a problem and once you are advising the child that you know you should do this and if even if it is his own fault you know infections are never optom or doctor's fault they are always if the hygiene is not proper it has nothing to do with being our you know we cannot take onus of that on ourselves but if there is a problem then it it will create another problem which will be like that you know you told us with atropin also there can be side effects as i said and parents do come back and they tell us that you know you gave this drop and this is causing the problem the only thing is once you stop the drop the side effect is stopped so that is where you are more safe so that that is the only reason i think uh, most of uh, eye surgeons have a uh, have this uh, yeah i think power in online power also take up power are you there Yes, yes, I am here, uh, Shekhar. Thank you. Yeah, Sorry. You, you wanted to say something? No, no, no. I I wanted to ask a question to Dr. Jitani about the, you know, although we say that zero point zero one do not lead to a lot of complications. Uh, I mean, clearly uh, it does not affect everybody, but small percentage of people do have this complaint of difficulty in reading yes, as soon. Yes. and uh, how do you change i think you have already answered that you know instead of instilling drop every night maybe you ask them to go alternate yes yeah. yes very correct very correct i think all of us Dr. Jitani, you have to unmute. We lost the audio again. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. We are talking only about ortho. We are not talking. You cannot talk about these are two. We are comparing apples with oranges. I mean, yeah, yeah. Why not? the cost remains a prohibitive factor no see that is what i was i was discussing with uh, somebody uh, yeah so the uh, once the cost goes down it is going to make a huge difference because see what happens is at the end of the day in indian market it is price sensitive once the cost goes down it is going to make huge difference because everything is going to change once the cost is affordable things will change immediately see i would i would answer that question the cost of vision is uh, you know you cannot take it in a cost once your vision is lost even by two lines it is a immeasurable loss you can't compare the amount of loss in terms of economic and social loss so the the loss is not the see sometimes what happens is that these are all things in the future like in rop also and madam is there she has done a commendable work in rop also so in rop also sometimes when you try to tell the patient that this can happen you know they cannot see it so they don't like in glaucoma you are trying to explain it to them and only by you know oct is so popular mainly because when you show them see this is red even when we know that visual fields are gold standard we have to do an oct just to show them see this is red you are you are at a problem you are at a problem so once you tell them that this is a problem 
they won't agree that a, a, a inefficient glass power something which can be corrected with glasses can lead to a, such a big problem so that 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 becomes a problem in terms of money otherwise see once they are convinced and once they know that this they they go for even for atropin see when we started in 2013 2014 when it was not available commercially we had a two page consent form which we used to get it signed and once they get consent form in their hand they will read everything as you know we have lot of circulations on whatsapp that they will eat pani puri and uh, pav bhaji on the street and will have infections but they will ask each and every simple thing that since you have reconstituted the drops what are the chances of infection so they are going to you know once you give them a option they are going to ask you uh, they we used to convince them as if you know we have to do the study and it is not for the kid so th- that happens that happens a lot with uh, clinical sciences Thank you, Doctor. Sure. Uh, in the class, thank you. Good work, online engineering, and thank you. So, uh, let's move forward. The next speaker is from US, but he is unfortunately not going to join us via Zoom because he uh, became grandfather yesterday. and he's in a flight right now so i he has sent me a presentation i'm going to run uh, with his sound picture sir So Steve Ernest is uh, one of our very close friends uh, from California. Uh, incidentally, he is the uh, Context OK uh, Orthokeratology manufacturer, and he was uh, in India uh, thanks to uh, uh, Sauji uh, because uh, that was the fantastic uh, thing that you did is the uh, getting international, uh, you know. figures talking about myopia control and that has started a good uh, enthusiasm in indian community so uh, steve has been kind to help us with uh, developing in india or okay uh, of course uh, euclid did started uh, was, uh, because i i used to use euclid lenses since last 15 20 years but uh, they have issues uh, and uh, uh, contacts is now easily available thanks to again preeti Uh, who's the distributor for them in, in india so he has sent me a presentation i'm going to run hi i'm steve ertz from contacts and i'm coming to you here from california today as i was unable to travel to india for the super special specialty lens symposium uh first i'd like to thank chandra for including me in this incredible faculty uh I hope you all enjoy the meeting and I uh, hope you enjoy what I have to present. Uh Chandra asked me to talk about the wonders of OrthoK and uh it is it relates to the Context OK lens and that just made me wonder what I'm going to talk about. Okay. 
Well, the first question I have for you is, have you ever wondered who invented the first reverse geometry lens for ortho K? Well, the answer to that is Nick Stoyan, the founder of Context. Nick started making reverse geometry lenses by hand back in the early 1980s, before we had the micro CNC machines. Over the years, Nick and myself received many awards in orthokeratology for our innovation of the reverse geometry lens design and the patents. Um, our different lens designs that we have at Context are the OKE system, which reduces up to five diopters, the OKEX, which supports myopic control theories and works very well on high minus patients. And then we have the TAC torque option on all of those designs also. Uh, and then we also make an OP lens, which is for hyperopia. The E system and all of our lens designs are based on the corneal eccentricity. The corneal eccentricity is divine, defined as the rate at which the central cornea flattens from the center of the cornea to the edge. As you can see in the diagram here, a circle would be 7.85 with a zero eccentricity. But as you look at the 0 0.3, 0 0.6, and 0 0.9, they gradually become more elliptical and the radius flattens. The E-system lens design uh, was developed from a corneal model that after reviewing over 600 topography maps. So we analyzed these 600 topography maps and we found the average apical radius and corneal eccentricity. Uh, I believe they were 7.83 and 0.52e. Uh, that's where we came up with our 0.5 eccentricity. Uh, one of the unique things about our lens design is the reverse zone widths and the radii are calculated using tear film depths rather than just nominal numbers. This is a basic diagram of a OKE system lens. Uh, it's similar to many other reverse geometry lens designs out there now. It's got a base curve, an optic zone, a reverse zone, and two alignment zones, and then a peripheral curve. Uh, not, not anything real different. It's the way we come up with our curves and zone widths that make it different. The design code that we use is as simple as the flat K, the refraction, and the eccentricity. In this case, if you had a flat K of 43, Rx of minus four and a 0.5e, e, you can see the design code is simply a 43 minus 4.5e, e. very easy. We adjust the fit of our lenses using the E value, whereas with 0.5 being the average, if we went up to a 0.6, that would loosen the lens, which flattens the reverse and alignment zones. And if we went to a 0.4, that would steepen the reverse and alignment curve. Now we actually call it a double hinge system where we're adjusting the reverse and alignment zone at the same time. Here's a close look at our alignment zone. We actually use an aspheric curve in the alignment zone. Since the cornea is aspheric, we try to line it up perfectly. Uh, you can see here in the diagram that we contour, we try to contour that peripheral cornea perfectly. Uh, if you have an elliptical cornea, a spherical curve, or even a straight line or tangent is not going to line up properly with that cornea. Here's one of the wonders of ortho K. Have you ever wondered who patented and obtained the first ever FDA approval for ortho K? Well, the answer again is context. We, we had five patents for ortho K, and we obtained the first FDA approval in 1998. And that was on our original OK3 design. We have four fitting methods for the OKE, for the OKE system and the EX. Uh, you can use central K's refraction and topography, diagnostic sets, or dispensable inventory sets. Uh, the fourth method is something still in development, and that's an auto fit method using the Medmont topography. We look forward to getting that completed. For empirical fitting, the most important thing I can tell you is to have your equipment calibrated. Make sure your data is accurate. If you're going to order empirically off of K's refraction and even topography, if the data is not good, the lens won't be good. So make sure that you get good round maps 
open up the eyelids and get nice round globe topography maps and you'll get much better results with any lens design that you use. Diagnostic sets actually allow the doctor to put a lens on the eye and let the patient experience how it feels. And some, some doctors even do overnight trials with that. Um, it lets you over refract on top of the lens, find the best fitting lens, so that that first lens that you order has a much better chance of, of succeeding and performing well. The OK Lens Inventory Set actually saves you lots of chair time and can increase your profit tremendously. It allows for on-the-spot dispensing, so you can put a lens on in the office at the dispensing visit, and if it's a little tight or loose, you can change it out right then and have the patient leave with that lens at night. Uh, if they come back in a week and the lens has tightened up or not centering well, you can actually take that lens back, sanitize it, disinfect it, put it back in your stock, and then dispense a new lens to that patient from your set. Uh, one of the nice things about our inventory sets is they're quarter doctor increments, 10 microns. So very small changes in our set to where there's really nothing in between uh, that you would order. So if, if the patient's within that range and their cornea is pretty standard, there's gonna be a lens there that fits them. Uh, we also have software, uh, a fitting program that we use that just allows you to match the flat K and target power, and then it'll recommend the 0.5E lens to order. Um, with topography, you might adjust that based on seeing a higher E value or lower E value. So you can actually you know, use this fitting program with your topographer as well. Well, this is a chart that we use for the inventory sets that allows you to see the difference in the fitting. You see the 43 minus four here, the green uh, lens, all of these lenses colored here have an 882 base curve. And as we move up the chart, they become looser. This would be 10 microns, 10 microns, 10 microns. And that, so same thing going tighter. So the tightest lens here with the 882 would be the 45, and the loosest would be this 41. Uh, and there's a good 100 micron difference between those. Uh, but this, this chart really lets you see how easy it is to fit these lenses. Now, this is an example of a good fit. Uh, it's basically a centered reverse geometry lens. You can see the alignment zone bearings nice and even. You have peripheral edge lift everywhere. Uh, it's just a basic good fit. Um, this is a loose lens. This is a lens that's sliding down. You can see the clearance in the alignment zone, the breakaway here, even have a little air bubble down here. A very distinct central bearing, but small. So as we would tighten that up, we would see that central bearing increase and the alignment zone get darker. So in this case, if it was a 0.5, we might go to a 0.4 or 0.45. Now this is an example of a tight lens. Uh, you can see the dimple veil in this picture. Doesn't look very nice. Heavy alignment zone bearing, minimal edge lift here nasally, and uh, that lens definitely won't perform. So we would have to loosen that up by, I'd say, an easy 0.1E. So we would probably go to a 0.6E on that fit. We offer some fitting tools too. We have a flourishing grading scale. We have our OKC e system refit form. And we have a troubleshooting chart as well that allows you to you know, pick a problem and it'll show you a solution. Um, the Thorsey grading scale, we like to analyze the alignment zone bearing first. That's the most important. And then we look at the central bearing and then we grade the reverse zone clearance. Um, so once you get that alignment zone bearing correct, usually the other two zones will, will come into play. They will be correct also. So the alignment zone fit is very important. Uh, we like to look at uh, post wear. For post wear maps, we really like to look at the axial and the tangential map. These two maps are from the same patient, the same image, but you're looking at an axial map versus a tangential map. Um, you can see the central bearing here looks very clean and perfect on the left axial map. But if you look at the tangential view, you see our central bearing has a little steep area here and the, the reverse zone is much more distinct. 
you see the alignment zones breaking away here. So, you know, the tangential, the exaggerated view helps us to improve the fit. When you look at that axial map, you kind of think everything's perfect. Um, years back, we did a, a empirical fitting study group with 65 patients. Um, out of those 65 patients, we averaged 4.67 doctors of reduction. Uh, the patients ranged from minus a half to minus 825. In that entire group, we averaged 1.35 lenses per eye. So this gives you a good idea of really it should be no more than two lenses per eye for any patient. Um, of those eyes, 80 of them were four diopters or less. And you can see the number dropped to 1.07 when we're doing four diopters or less. So 74 out of 80 eyes only needed one lens. Uh, if we look at our second group here, the 44 eyes that were over minus four, we had an average of 1.84 lenses per eye and 74 out of 80 eyes only required one lens. So, well, that may be a wrong stat. So let's go with the 1.84 lenses per eye when you're over four diopters. Uh, to summarize the E-system e lenses, you know, they, they can reduce five, six, and even seven diopters. Accurate corneal data is a must to me. Uh, if you're gonna be fitting empirically, we really, uh, need to get K readings, refraction, and a topography map to help us design the best fit possible. So one of the other wonders of Ortho K that, that I came up with a question for is, have you ever wondered who developed the first high DK oxygen permeable material? Uh, again, here it's context. Um, we invented the first material that was DK100. It's one of the most popular materials around the world. I think most everyone in the audience here has used that material. And uh, we, we, keep, we keep going. We keep developing materials. We keep developing designs. Uh, we just don't sit still. And we've been in business since 1962, and we have over 50 years of experience with orthokeratology. But now let's talk real quickly about our OKEX design, which is more based on myopia control. Uh, why do we need myopia control designs? Well, basically, the studies have shown us that peripheral defocus can stop the axial length from increasing and stop the progression of myopia. Uh, traditional ortho K designs with the average 6.0 optic zone and wider reverse zones did the job, but we didn't know why. We didn't understand why it worked. And now we do, and we've made some adjustments in our lens design to, to make that work better. Um, what we use is we use hyperbolic treatment zones, which are very aspheric. We have double optical reverse zones. And that's kind of a key sentence right there. Optical reverse zones mean that the radius of our reverse zone is on the visual axis so that the peripheral blur is going to be optical. It'll be, it's not just blur, it's an optical blur, which is very important. Uh, we also use double aspheric alignment zones and we offer large custom size diameters and custom size optic zones as well. Um, myopia reduction versus myopia con re control. I really have come up with these definitions. Ortho K for myopia reduction is a temporary reduction of myopia associated with corneal flattening. Whereas ortho K for myopia control, we reduce the myopia and stop the increase in the axial length of the eye. So, you know, we're really doing two different things here. Traditional ortho K, we use the larger optic zones, uh, spherical optic zones, and a single reverse zone. Here we're using smaller optic zones, a spheric optic zones, and double reverse zones to get the maximum peripheral blur. Okay, how do you determine the optic zone that you want, you want to use? Uh, our average is 5.4 millimeters. We find that that works the best. Uh, patients don't get so much blur and we get the peripheral defocus, the plus buildup that we're looking for. Um, we do have doctors that are fitting custom OZs where they measure the pupil each time and they go a couple tenths larger 
than the pupil for the optical Z diameter. Uh, and I'll point out real quick that boys tend to have larger pupils than girls. So you can do your own research on that and determine the optic zone you want. Uh, myopia controlled post wear topography maps are going to have smaller treatment zones uh, due to the smaller optic zone. And you're going to have a steeper reverse zone ring where we're building up all of that plus. Uh, and then Obviously, with the double alignment zone out there, we're going to have wider, flatter alignment zone rings, especially in the forcing patterns. Uh, another definition I came up with in my, my mind is that myopia control ortho K is really pediatric ortho K, whereas the traditional designs could be labeled as adult, adult ortho K. Um, adults need the largest treatment zone possible to reduce glare and flare at night while they're driving. Um, I kind of put down all this in red down here, but basically, I think once a child or an adolescent is driving, that they should be pulled out of a myopic control design and put into the largest optic zone possible. And that's just my own opinion. Uh, myopia control ortho K, I think it's best to start with these patients when they're minus one. If we wait till they're a minus four, we're not really doing myopic control. They've already become myopic. So try to get them at minus one, even before minus two, so that they can, we can even get them down to Plano and keep them, keep them at Plano throughout their adult life. Uh, that's the whole advantage of myopic control. Uh, so prefit data, this is prefit data for all patients. Is get good round prefit topography maps. You want to get a manual or auto refraction. Uh, for post wear visits, auto refraction doesn't really work that well because it, it depicts the steep reverse zone ring as cylinder astigmatism. And you'll get refractions like Plano minus two when they're reading 2020. Uh, you want to determine are they central limbal astigmatism? Is there a lot of peripheral astigmatism with a spherical center? So these are all things that you've got to look at when you're determining if a patient is a good candidate. The auto fit method with the MedMont topographer, it's going to allow you to simulate fits and it'll work very well for torque designs. And you can even put diagnostic lenses on to see if the simulated fit matches the diagnostic set. Uh, so we're really excited to get this, this going. Um, this is a good simulated lens in the MedMont, one of our designs. You can see that the uh, tear film analysis down below is right where it needs to be. Um, we get into a loose fit. Now you can see that that central cornea, uh, central optic zone is dropping on that central cornea where you might get some central stain or SPKs going on. And then here we have a tight fit where we have too much central pooling here and too much alignment zone bearing out here where we're digging into the cornea and that lens begins to vault. Now, I think these tight lenses, too much sag can give you SPK and problems too. So that's something you want to look out for. For context, we can assist you with high myopes, high astigmatism, hyperopia, presbyopia, and even keratoconus patients. We have many different designs that we're willing to help you with. Um, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I know this is a, uh, a very quick 20 minute presentation. I tried to keep it right around 20 minutes, um, but I'd like to I'd like to actually let you know. Here's one more one more wonder is if you wonder where you can get certified to fit the context OK lens, go to oklens.com forward slash doctor certification HTML and get certified now and start fitting ortho K lenses. Uh, if you wonder where you can get the lens in India, Primex Enterprises is our distributor there in India. So meet with them, uh, discuss with them what you need and they'll be willing to help you out. Okay, so thanks again. Everybody enjoy the conference. I hope you enjoyed my presentation and I look forward to being back to India after we get rid of this COVID, okay? Thank you very much and everyone have a, have a great, great day. Hi, I'm Steve Ernst from...
Hello. Hello. Yes. Any questions? I'll try to answer on his behalf. Anybody? See, you are here to learn, so don't be shy. Okay, ask anything, and no question is dumb question. So go ahead. Yeah, so this is a very good question. Uh, so I'm telling you my personal, uh, uh, you know, way of doing it. If it is a simple myopia management, that is, you know, somebody who don't want to go for a LASIK and uh, wants to have a, you know, clear vision, everything. Most of my uh, patients that come to me are housewives around age of 45, 50. They don't like uh, bifocal and all. Uh, most of them are myopic, so we give them a monovision or something. That's where the the standard ortho works, like Euclid. So you just send them the K1, K2 refraction, and you have very good, like 90% uh, success rate with first lenses. When it comes to little customization, uh, context is better because then he's willing to go with you. The Euclid issue is uh, they have a lot of issues with the FDA. They can't do this. They can't do that. They have to remain like even uh, he said up to minus five only you can make, right? Because that is what the FDA approval is. But off label, you can prescribe minus eight also, but Euclid will not make it. Yeah, I've been dealing with them since so many years. So I know they had minus eight design, but now they, they stopped because of the FDA. But uh, Steve is kind enough to, you tell him like whatever you want, you make the optical zone smaller because your question was myopia control. So in myopia control, you want the optical zone to be about smaller than pupillary size. So about 5, 5.5 mm. So that is uh, good with context. But once you are an expert, once you know, you know, all the parameters, JSON factors, how to design these, that, then wave context is the best option as of now. Uh, so they, they will give you a software uh, that will download it into your computer. It is connected with your uh, Medmon. So that whatever data comes from Medmon goes into the wave software and then you play with it. And it will simulate what you're going to see, what you're going to get with the fluorescent pattern. And once you finalize your design, then just hit click it will go to the wave laboratory and they will make a lens and send it to you. So that is the most uh, freedom you have uh, of even toric lenses, uh, myopia control, any, anything. So, but it, it takes little time for you to understand. That's why I invited Nitesh Bharat to talk on designing uh, lenses because once you start into ortho -K, you want to learn, you want to know more and it's really fun. You know, the patient is also happy, believe me. The, there was a question of cost and all, of course, when it comes to child, they think that, you know, it is like so much to invest and all. But in my practice, if the husband, wife are, uh, you know, working, they have no worries about, you know, that much finances and they're worried about the child because they can't give that much time to their children so they can spend money. And if you can, you know, touch that uh, emotional factor, then definitely they will uh, spend that. And as you rightly said, the, the ortho -K is done inside the house. The child doesn't go out with the lenses on. So there is no question of any other lens falling off or infections and other things. So that is the best modality. Plus ch child's confidence increases. It never goes with the spectacle in the school. So that is the best uh, part. So you have a variety of other, there is a RGP designer software also from Europe. That also it's a free, uh, means you can design whatever you want and you give that parameters to Steve or any other lab and they will make a lens for you. So you're not stuck with wave and uh, this also. So RGP designer is uh, another uh, option you have. That is, I think $30 per month. Uh, yeah, so that is easy. And then, but you have a freedom of designing whatever you want. Because nowadays, uh, toric orthokeratology is the thing because if you see most of the children's are you know, astigmatic. And you ask the question about astigmatism. 
actually there is nobody has done a study especially for astigmatism that's why there is nothing but it works for astigmatism also okay. Definitely, yeah, it works. That's what I'm saying. So, as long as you have a 360 degree seal, the, whatever the cylinder, of course, it depends on cornea and you know how much is uh, astigmatic limbal to limbal or not. But yes, if you design, it works. So, with respect to the size of the See, when I came from UK, my guru, Dr. B.T. Maskati, uh, he, of course, whatever, you know, I'm practicing thanks to both of them and I learned everything. So first thing he told me when I came back from UK, he said, don't underestimate your intelligence. Whatever you decide is the cost, is the cost. Patient will pay. And believe me, patient pays. Of course, you, you have to justify yourself. If you are not just, if, if you think that I'm charging on, you know, exorbitantly without anything, then of course you will not sleep in the night, right? But if you know that, yes, you know, you have spent so much money, you are attending this conference, you are spending money, staying in a hotel. So who's going to benefit? Your patient is going to benefit. So who's going to pay? Patient is going to pay. So that is uh, only thing you have to convince the patient. If you are convinced, you will be able to convince. And again, it, it's not a, you know, uh, this thing against ophthalmologists or optometrists. Ophthalmologists are interested in surgeries. They're trained for surgery, right? So they, they don't think much about non-surgical things. But now here it is a teamwork because both of them has to manage. And the optometrist has a good opportunity now to, you know, become that partner with your ophthalmologist, you know, learn this because they don't have time for all these things. But you have time and you can do this learn this and add that value to that practice. So ophthalmologists also will be happy. They don't mind sharing money with you. So it is your benefit that ultimately is, you know, uh, if you add this to your practice. Yes. That is what, yes. So the child, they remain with the practice, yes. That's a good idea. So uh, the initial investment of starting orthokeratology practice is like, you know, a Medman topographer for around 7,000 ESP profiler, that is Eaglet profiler is one of the best instrument. If you can invest about 19 lakh rupees, then you can uh, practice clearer lenses also with that instrument. If you have the proper instrument, of course, your confidence level increases, but there are so many LASIK centers now, and they have the top of the world instruments. So you can tie up with them. See the child, no ophthalmologist will operate a child of eight or 10 years, right? So there, you don't have to worry about losing your patient or in fact, they will be happy to you know provide you with that data. So you send your patient, even I used to do the same thing before I invested into my topographer. Send the patient to ophthalmologist, get the reports. In fact, ophthalmologist will do the complete checkup and it is, you know, on his letterhead, everything is written, care breakup, time cell, AK, everything. And uh, follow up also you do with the same uh, person. So he gets, in, you know, impressed with your practice and he, anyway, he's not going to outdo anything. So he's going to refer his patients also to you. So it's a win-win for everyone. Any more questions? Sir, what's the maximum so as far as the US FDA approval goes, it is minus five. But as far as the reality goes, uh, up to minus eight with ease you can do with contacts or anybody else. And uh, our favorite star, uh, Nitesh Barot has how much? Minus 13? Minus 21. Of course, it depends on uh, what is the condition, but 
uh, Joma Paume and uh, you know people from Europe, they have fantastic uh, work done. And uh, you know, you you give them any myopia, and they will try and. Uh, of course, what happens is like LASIK. You know, if the the higher the myopia, you have to reduce the optical zone. So when you reduce the optical zone, there is a difficulty in the night time driving. Uh, you know, once you get used to that, it's okay. It's very difficult to get used to it because we have example here. Uh, you can't drive. He has an ortho -K lens, but he can't drive in the night. So same thing. But if you are so much like minus twenty, he don't. He just throw want to throw off the spectacle at any cost. LASIK is not going to help him. Of course, you can do uh, you know clear lens extraction or uh, IPL other thing. But then again, it has its own complications. So ortho -K is the safest. Go ahead. Minus five. Certificate from Paragon. But yes. Yeah, how much? Up to plus three, it works fantastic. Uh, recently, we have corrected uh, 4.5 plus 4.5. When the patient was a patient from India, I am I am doing it from US. <laughs> Preeti is helping me here. Huh? See, hyperopia. Of course, in the next lectures, we'll have the you know the how to fit ortho and all. How it works is basically you are creating that suction effect, and the the epithelial will grow into that area. So in myopia, what you are doing is you are you are redistributing the epithelium to periphery. In hypermetropia, you have to bring that inside. Simple. Every one year. See, the child is going to grow, and uh, yeah. So I'll I'll tell you both because I practice in India also I practice there also. So in India, the if it is only minus 0.5 or something, the parents say, sir, chalo na, ek saal aur nikalte. And even you have to convince like that only because okay, let us see after six months if it is really increasing, then we'll do. Uh, in the US, it is like a global fee we charge. So every year they have to pay same amount. And in one year, if they lose the lens, if they break the lens, we replace the lens. So that is the advantage. But every year, because there the cleaning and other thing is not like what we tell him here. You know, it is rub and rinse and everything. So the lens remains cleaner. In the US, they just ask them to put in a hydrogen peroxide overnight. Next morning, just take the lens in, put it in. So the lens is definitely going to gather all the proteins and everything in one year. And uh, child is going to complain about you know, discomfort. So throw off the lens, make a new one. Still, yeah. Yeah, the lens has to be good in the eye, no? Otherwise, the lens will cause a problem. So it's up to you. You design your own, uh, you know, thing. Like uh, the, the people who are like uh, about 30, 40, like for myopia management, I have patient wearing for four years, five years the same lens. And then he himself called me, sir, five years ago, badli karo. So after wearing for a year or two, is there any change in the thing like the lens or whatever? Is that also happen? So the lens warpage uh, is a reality. So that can happen. Another thing is that is again my own experience is when I change the see fitting one time is a simple thing anybody can do. Same patient when you fit next time it's very difficult because there are so many changes happened you are already molded the cornea even a regular corneal RGP uh, has the same issue here you are purposely doing it and if the lens is what that's why the reason is every one year you change the lens okay but. I have seen like this patient, what I was talking about, four years, you know, five years, we change the lenses and same parameters, everything same. 
but he was not happy because now he required a high dk so we started with 84 dk then 100 dk then 120 dk and now i am fitting him with 160 dk otherwise he is not comfortable so that also has to be considered okay so let let us move forward uh, pavan is uh, waiting from lv prasad online and pavan varkicharla is a research scientist uh, head of the research department at lv prasad institute and he'll be talking about uh, the myopia management pavan are you there yes i'm here can you hear me and see my screen as well yes all right uh, very good morning we, are, we still have two more minutes to go to college as afternoon in india uh, thank you the organizers uh, dr chandra shaker and uh, dr maskati for inviting me to talk in this symposium this is a very broad topic and already dr maskati and dr jitani has already covered i in fact message dr jitani saying that you already covered my slides so i constantly hearing to the talks and changing my slides so i hope i will not bore you all right so for the next 20 minutes i will be talking about uh, quickly on the myopia in india just couple of slides and uh, myopia management options emphasis will be on the optical strategies emphasis will be on the environmental strategies and the theories for why optical strategies are working and uh, i will back it up with a couple of research findings from our own lab and finally i will end my talk with the uh, case i want to acknowledge the support i get because a few slides that i'm showing today are supported or funded by one of these companies so quickly about the myopia scenario in india uh, a lot of you have seen the similar slide but talking about the worldwide scenario india is also encroaching upon a global uh, part of being the myopia epidemic with 48% of them to develop myopia by 2050 and this is clearly indian scenario Uh, like uh, dr maskati has mentioned we have only data until 2020 and we have extrapolated the data if this trend continues how would you see this myopia situation in india in the years to come and if you put them on some sort of preventive strategy say effect of uh, outdoor activity uh, the preventive strategy instead of 48% maybe we will drop down to 30 32% and a lot of people ask what's the myopia progression in indian scenario clearly indian children do progress it's not like india and children do not progress we see about half adapter progression on an average and a good number of uh, people also progress by um, more than one adapter which is uh, 17% and these are pure myopes although we got this data from lvpi these uh, individuals did not had any sort of ocular pathology and purely had refractive error and what sort of percentage do indians have pathologic myopia clearly 4% of myopes tend to have pathologic myopia and we also reported that irrespective of the um degree of myopia irrespective of the age you tend to see this pathologic myopia lesions so careful peripheral uh, 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 retinal examination is mandatory in myopes talking about the myopia management i thought this slide is apt in the current situation it's like a covid 19 situation and the too many protocols and every day we hear something and in last two years everything got updated in relation to the covid 19 clearly even myopia and its management every year uh, there are about 10000 publication this is not exaggeration if you go and search in the google scholar or the pubmed you see tons of publication coming out so i want to highlight that clearly this is a 21st century's public health issue if you don't stay updated and upgraded and you will be clearly outdated and you will be talking about something that's 10 year old or 20 year old so what is myopia management uh, clearly not everybody undergoes or develops myopia only few will develop myopia very few will undergo progression and very few will have the pathologic myopia leading to the visual impairment uh, at times so what's the myopia management goal number one prevent myopia uh, which means you're targeting normal not who develop myopia even before development of myopia you are eyeing on myopia management 
And part two is identify children at risk for myopia progression and ensure you put them on some sort of anti-myopia strategy. Clearly, the myopia management strategies goes on and on. Um, uh, this is the 2016 publication in contact lens and anterior eye that sort of indicated what's the percentage efficacy of various anti-myopia strategies with the highlights being the orthokeratology, atropine, and the peripheral uh, defocus lenses. And under correction, if you see on the left side, clearly the uh, studies indicated that under correction or single vision lenses are not of great use in controlling myopia. Like I said, atropine and the pharmacological management, orthokeratology, again, this is 2016 paper, uh, but uh, we have a lot more addition uh, in the anti-myopia strategies from Hoya. We have my side, uh, my side from Cooper Vision, MioSmart from the Hoya, that shows about 70, 80% efficacy as well. So I think uh, before we uh, talk about the percentages, it's important that why these uh, strategies are working in a great manner. Now, myopia strategies have come into picture to counteract the risk factors. Whatever we talk about, myopia is multifactorial and uh, clearly the genetics and the environmental factors play an important role. Be it genetics or the environment, clearly there must be some structural changes for the eyeball to grow and therefore you get the rays to be focused in front of the retina. Uh, which means it's altering the optics. So when we talk about the uh, altering structures, is it center, is it uh, foveo always, uh, but is it the periphery? Again, compelling evidence comes from the animal experiments where uh, they indicated that fovea may not be essential for the ocular growth or for the development of myopia. Clearly, fovea forms a tiny portion of the entire uh, visual field or the entire retinal eccentricity. And the, uh, it, it, it is reasonable to consider that the uh, retinal periphery might play an important role. Again, as I said, uh, studies that have ablated the uh, fovea, as you see in the image, did not inhibit myopia, but that still led on to the development of myopia. This is the experiment, the famous experiments conducted by Smith uh, in uh, early 2000s, which indicated that, hey, that fovea is not essential, but there's something in the periphery that could drive for the actual elongation. So what in the periphery could play a role? What is that in, in the periphery that could drive? Now, whatever uh, uh, you talk about myopia, we always define it in terms of rays being focused either in front of retina. When you talk about hyperopia, you say that rays behind the retina. So the retinal plane is important. Now, one of the factors that we have to consider is shape of the eye in the periphery is not always circular. It's not sphere in three dimension. It can be prolate, it can be oblate. The shape of the eye is known to be different. And when we talk about myopia or actual growth, uh, it's not the actual length changing from 22 millimeters to 23. It's not just one point, as you see in this image, arrow mark, it's not one point that's extending. The entire eyeball undergoes stretching, right? So that's the global expansion all the way from the limbus. There are a few models that were proposed to say how eyeball might grow in myopia. Eyeball might grow in the uh, global expansion model, equatorial expansion model, posterior pole, much like what you see in just a phyloma, actual mode, uh, the actual or the hybrid model. So I say refraction is always linked to the retinal shape or retinal plane. We always do ret uh, retinoscopy only in the on axis. But clearly, the shape is tending to be different, and refraction in the periphery seems to play an important role. That's where our anti-myopia strategies counteracting the peripheral defocus came into picture. In emetropic eye, uh, we tend to have the peripheral emetropia, as you see in the top panel. Whereas in case of the hyperopia, you tend to have rays being in front of the retina. So rays being in front of retina, the signals of stronger, so it's good in the ball will not grow. Rays being behind the retina, that's the case in myopia. Eyeball is more prolate or more curved in the periphery. It's more steep. The eyeball is more steep than the rays tends to be focused behind the retina at certain eccentricity. And this peripheral point P could say or send signals to say that, hey, I'm not on the retina anymore. 
please stretch back. And that could lead to the actual growth. And this is considered as an important uh, risk factor. So, and we all agree uh, that the myopia management is beyond single vision correction of single vision lens. Why is, under, why is the uh, single vision not a good thought? Uh, based on the previous slide, if you see uncorrected myope is tending to have central rays in front of retina, as you go towards periphery, rays tend to be more hyperopic. The moment you give single vision lens, it's a diverging lens, it's a negative lens, everything gets pushed back. Central rays are on the retina back because you said, okay, I want to push this rays back. Great, it is back now. But unfortunately, you're also playing with the peripheral rays. It does indicate that single vision lens is not really great. In cuts, this is something like this. The center, you have optimal correction. And um, as you go towards periphery, you want those rays to be much in front of the retina. So that's where our multifocal contact lens have come into the picture, a center distance design. As you go towards periphery, it's more on four plus. The initial lenses were developed by the Zeiss. It's called MyoVision. And uh, various studies all the way from uh, are published from 2006 to 2012 indicate the efficacy of good 40%. Uh, this is again old publication. I said there are a lot of new uh, lenses that have come into the market and they're doing good job. Like I've said, uh, the lenses from my side, uh, Cooper Vision, Silar has got Stellate lenses, and Hoya has got the Mio Smart. Again, the percentage, all these lenses indicate about uh, 50 to 75, 80 percent, which is good enough. Uh, if you talk about optical strategies contracting the myopia. In a similar fashion, the orthocratology, uh, of course, at, at central flattening, mid peripheral steepening. All it does is takes the rays uh, and puts it in front of the retina in the extreme periphery. And there are different studies that indicate the efficacy of orthocratology lenses. So now I will just talk about a couple of our recent works in Indian scenario. If you're wondering how is the peripheral refraction scenario in India, are we ready to uh, give whatever lenses that were developed by the uh, non Indian countries or, or uh, the uh, foreign countries to suit their population. Now we have lenses from Taiwan, China, all these East Asian countries contracting the uh, peripheral defocus, but do we need that? So this is the data from Indian scenario and look at the left panel, uh, the squares and the circles data is for the hyperopes and emetropes. There is relative peripheral myopia. On X axis, you're seeing the eccentricity y-axis you're seeing relative peripheral refraction. Now, if you concentrate on the triangles, this is the data from the one uh, total 161 myopes. And uh, only in one meridian, there is relative peripheral hyperopia. So which indic this indicates that uh, this is a temporal meridian, there is relative peripheral hyperopia. And uh, the lenses might also work in the Indian scenario. But point to note, maybe we might need a bit of alteration, asymmetrical designs. That's something that's for the further research to really explore. We also uh, did another study uh, to see how peripheral refraction sort of varies with orthocratology, with single vision contact lens and single vision spectacles. There are all, before we conducted this study, there are studies to indicate how the peripheral refraction varies. But what's special about this study is we looked at during near work, how does this alter? Because children from nine to three or four o'clock, they are at the school or um, they are reading something, they are in the uh, near work environment. So it's important that we also look at how this defocus changes uh, during accommodation and when you give orthocratology. Uh, Again, just concentrate on the highlighted area, the red ones. With accommodation, without accommodation, orthocratology is leading to the relative peripheral myopia, which is brilliant. And that could be possible reason for why orthocratology is working great in terms of myopia control. Whereas other lenses, they for the distance correction, they might do the job, uh, but for the accommodation or during near work, they might not. So orthocratology is doing good, possibly because it takes care of both distance and your viewing. Other point that I want to highlight is if you look at the peripheral myopic defocus, it's leading to about one diopter. 
all right now like the previous speakers have indicated we have to pick a lens that leads to more and more myopic de defocus pick a smaller optic zone pick a uh, treatment zone that should be uh, much greater uh, leading to the greater um, uh, mid peripheral steepening and therefore you're seeing more myopic defocus in the periphery so we also indicated that the moment you pick more uh, mid peripheral steepening then it might do the job otherwise you might not see fruit flowed much talking about the environment aspect of myopia in terms of environment we have two broad classifications either you talk about the light or you talk about the near work now in terms of near work why near work could lead to myopia genesis the two different theories again number one mechanical tension theory that indicates that hey you're accommodating you're stressing your eye contraction of ciliary muscle and then as i explained before eyeball just not expand in the posterior pole we have to accept that eyeball changes would happen all the way from the limbus as well or from the equator or it can be just posterior pole so mechanical tension theory indicates too much of tension could uh, lead to the stretching of the eyeball accommodative lack theory uh, uh, indicates more lack meaning the rays are behind the retina meaning it's a hyperopic defocus meaning it can trigger for the eyeball to grow so the two different theories for why near work could trigger and there are different lenses we can i mean any lenses any bifocal multifocal and spectacle format can be given to go deep bifocal you want to go executive but slr has its own uh, lenses called myopilex max uh, or myopilex uh, different varieties uh, the uh, efficacy also indicates that compared to the orthokeratology compared to atropine compared to the other strategies bifocal lenses are not doing great job maybe the poor compliance cosmetical appeal uh, maybe they are not looking to the near zone etc 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 so we also conducted uh, a uh, study recently i mean i'm talking this again because in terms of near work uh, like dr jitani has indicated uh, our recent work i thought i will bring this up is reading from smartphone and hard copy or same we conducted this experiment i want to highlight this how we did this experiment all that this is experimental stuff it's important that we understand in real life people may hold mobile phone very close very far uh, it, it varies to have a controlled setup in research we fix the distance 20 cm is a target distance everything is same except the near target is varying it is a uh, mobile phone reading mobile phone video or reading a book distance is same so you know that the accommodation is kept constant so we gave 15 minutes of time and uh, long story short we found that the if you read more on a hard copy there's too much of stress on the eye and that could lead to the greater changes compared to watching a video and we sort of proposed a theory that hey accommodative lack theory may not hold water but it could be the uh, mechanical tension theory because more stress there is uh, greater less lack so if you look at the video watching right if you look at the top panel here accommodative lag is too much when you look at video why if i'm looking at video i'm looking at faces if i'm watching a 3 idiots movie i'm looking at amir khan's face or whatever in the scene it's constantly moving the stress on the eye is relatively less it's a temporal domain whereas if i'm looking at the paper the resolution is very high you're looking at n6 font n8 font versus a face which is occupying my entire mobile screen right so the lag is very high you are sort of relaxed uh, in terms of watching a video whereas if you look at the accommodative lag with the hard copy the lag is very minimal meaning the eye is trying to push more and more to get things clear and clearly there are corresponding changes in the actual lens so we said that even if you have accommodative lag and studies have also indicated that accommodative lag may not really uh, under, uh, lead to progression so we sort of went on to support the mechanical tension theory now there are various reasons pupil size if i'm watching a video with backlit pupil size reduces depth of focus increases retinal illuminance is different accommodative effort is very different brightness of the target resolution i want you to focus on this below picture here in 1990 1980s prevalence of myopia in east asian countries is already 60 70% right if you look at this picture here the smartphone advent came in in 2007 2014 how can you relate 
screen time for the development of the progression of myopia. When China, Singapore has already seen myopia peak in 1980s or 1990s. So like uh, Dr. Jitani has already sort of summarized this work, the purpose is we're not saying that a hey, screens, use screens and then you may not develop myopia. We are not saying that. We are saying that anything near can trigger for myopia development. So more with the paper, right? I mean, a lot of, a lot of us uh, 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 did not have mobile phone when we were going to school, but still went on to develop myopia. I think the instructions to the uh, children or the parents should be related to near work instead of just the screens. Coming to the light, I want to just highlight that the various studies indicate that time outdoors is productive. This is our recent uh, overview of systematic reviews. We have submitted it to OPO. Indicate that 25-50% uh, control in the myopia uh, incidence. Now, if you look at the change in the spherical equivalent, so myopia is under control with regards to the prevention with time outdoors, all right? But does it still work if somebody had developed myopia? You know, there are four systematic reviews that we build upon. They indicate that, well, it might do the job, but if you see these bars here, uh, they are indicating 0.13 to 0.17 adapter control. I mean, 0 0.13, 0 0.17 is very less to, uh, to relate it to the clinical significance. So I think we have to be a bit extra careful. We have to, in advance, say that well, we are trying this. It might work, it might not work. If you already develop myopia, good days, well, you spend more time in outdoor, but we will try and see if it actually controls in your case. Why outdoors is good? The various theories, again, more light, indoor, outdoor, very different. Uniform drag trick space, if I'm here, I have my laptop, I have my water bottle, I have a window, everything at a vicinity of 20, 30 centimeters. If I'm in outdoor open space, the expectation is that I'm getting all the central and peripheral rays from optical infinity, say, and uh, the uh, peripheral rays are relatively on the retina, but not really triggering for hyperopic defocus. Accommodation is relaxed, depth of focus, and uh, the recent theories also indicate that if you are in outdoors, there's dopamine release, and that will inhibit the actual length elongation. And more recent theories also indicated that the spectral composition of the light is very different in indoors and outdoors. That could be the reason as well. And we have uh, published this paper recently in PLOS One to indicate that ambient light level significantly varies even within outdoor locations, even within indoor locations. So we did the study. I will just summarize the findings. Uh, if you look at this tape, uh, uh, figure here, there's a different locations from top to bottom. Top is outdoor open space. Bottom is indoor. Indoor may the light levels are less than 1,000, four locations. If you look at the uh, in between, we say that these days, a lot of individuals live within apartments. They play within apartment area. They play within the buildings, in between the buildings. Although we say that this is outdoor, but clearly the illuminance levels are not more than 1,000 lux. Okay, now if you're outdoors open space, this is 50,000 lux, 60,000 lux. Between the buildings, technically, although this is outdoor, this is not good for myopia control, maybe. And with hat and cap, the variation is not much. So we say that indoor, outdoor, there's clear cut difference. And among outdoor, it's very different. So I started to advocate to my patients that kindly uh, spend more time in open space and not between the buildings. So we ask in the history, time spent outdoors, how many minutes? They say two hours. They say they're going outdoors after five o'clock. They say, I'm playing, I'm living in an apartment and they play in the parking area. Now, clearly that doesn't help us if light is precious in myopia control. Different times of the day, it's very different, uh, but nine uh, from seven o'clock to 5 p.m., uh, the values are not very different. It will be different, but it is more than what you see in indoor environment. Uh, and different weather and seasons also, they're not very different. And this is at least in India. Uh, in India, again, we got this only from the Hyderabad uh, uh, city. So all outdoors are not really outdoors. And if we talk about myopia management and emphasizing on time outdoors as preventive strategy, maybe we have to be extra cautious, spend more time to indicate that the uh, you better spend more time in an open space. 
So uh, just in nutshell, we also looked at the exposing individuals to different wavelengths of light in the laboratory setting, the various animal models that indicated that blue is good. So we thought we will replicate this and uh, humans uh, in the lab and then see how that will control. Uh, we found that the red and uh, green light led to axial length increase, whereas the blue light led to the reduction or the control in the axial length when there is a stimulus in front of the eye. We gave hyperopic defocus stimulus so that eyeball will grow. And we found that blue sort of inhibited or it took eyeball to shrink. So it's so far sounding good for us. Uh, I will end my talk with uh, one of the cases that I've seen recently. This is 25 year old uh, uh, male visited myopia center at LVPI. And uh, uh, this person was 25 year old when he visited the myopia clinic, uh, but he was uh, having myopia since 10 years. So at the age of 15, he started having myopia using spectacles since 10 years. If you look at this uh, prescription changes, right eye did not change much, but left eye minus five, minus 7.5 and minus 2.75. So clearly from 2010 to 2017, uh, eyeball changed by one after in left eye. And this is 25 years old, there's still myopia progression. So for first point to note is there's, there's uh, irrespective of the age, I think we should keep in mind the progression could happen. Of course, this is extreme case maybe. So on the day we conducted the uh, cyclopelagic refraction, we got minus one, minus 9.5 um, on the visit that I've seen in 2021. And uh, the, I've uh, got different refraction profile. If you look at the right eye, the uh, center is minus 2.25, spherical equivalent this is. And as you go towards periphery, it's more myopic. So it's good, not a problem. In the left eye, we got again the peripheral refraction, central spherical equivalent is minus 9.5 approximately. As you go towards periphery, it's only minus six. So three diopters of relative peripheral hyperopia in one meridian. So we said, all right, uh, uh, if this is the case, I want to put them on some sort of anti-myopia strategy that can take care of the peripheral defocus. So we put them on the uh, uh, yield of lens, the uh, uh, external depth of focus, center distance multifocal, and we asked them to come after five months. And we saw that the changes in the actual length were nil or less than 0 0.01 millimeters. So we said, let's continue with this. So I want to highlight that we want to look at myopia in a multifactorial nature, look at what triggering, uh, and then accordingly put them on strategy, uh, measure all the in the clinic, monitor regularly. There's no cutoff that we have to see them in 12 months. I usually every uh, four to six monthly, and at times three monthly. Uh, managed with anti-myopia, clearly it's beyond the single vision lens. I want to invite you all to the second myopia conference that's going to happen in the November 2021. And with this, I thank you for your attention. Happy to take any questions. Hi, Baba. Hope you're doing good. What are your we all know that contact with the very possible way to get a type of myopia, but when it comes to spectacles, how will you advise us to decide anti? Because as we know that myopia are not other than anti myopia. So, by talking about this, so you may have to decide what is the way to get a type of myopia. So, you may have to decide anti and what is that we will look at. Because you are also saying that accommodate it back to the way to go, right? So, how will you take it back and then? Uh, no, no. Ch Chandrasekhar, can you repeat the question from where you are? Because it's very difficult to. I, I uh, guess she is asking how to prescribe uh, bifocal spectacle lenses. Because okay. accommodation. So to tackle the accommodation. No, but let it yeah. be. So I, go ahead, go ahead. I look at the. Can I go on? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Pawan. Yeah, so I look at the, what's the lag uh, first, and then I look at the working distance of the child. If if, if the agenda is to relax the accommodation, uh, then the I would go for what's their working distance. And usually I go with plus 2.25 or 2.5. Uh, 2.25, 2.5 is where I go. Uh, 
accordingly. And if somebody is already myopic by three diopters, so you accordingly play around how much you want to really relax the eye. Does that satisfy your question? If a patient is uh, still minus three, uh, minus albuminol, uh, it can be to remove the glass in the green and do the linear mode without glasses. So the question is, Pavan, is, since the patient yeah. child is already myopic. Yeah. So, do yeah. you ask them to remove the glasses and read? Will that work? Well, the it sort of you are as you are sort of prescribing bifocal to counteract that. Uh, I I do not know how much it works and how much children will be compliant about removing and uh, wearing it. So, I usually go with bifocal element directly. And uh, like somebody said, if somebody is minus three. You want to accordingly match it uh, with 2.5 or whatever. So I usually prefer to go in bifocal segment, uh, given that they may not remove, they may not remember, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. okay. So, so there is one, one uh, presentation after the mind presentation, which talks about spectacles. So I think we'll uh, take more into that. And uh, in fact, I have done a lot of studies on spectacles, so that also I will talk. See, the whole idea is to give, you, you have to bring that hyperopic defocus to the myopic defocus, right? So plus two, 2.5 doesn't work actually. You need at least plus six diopters to really bring it inside. But right now, whatever we have is up to plus three addition, right? So whatever you have, you are managing. And executive bifocal or regular bifocal actually because you are treating only half of half segment of the return. You want 360 degree. So it is like you are just, you know, since you have it, so use it, but uh, it is not that effective. So you need something which is 360 degree and there are like Zeiss and SLR and other people are coming up uh, with 360 degree accommodative lenses. And that is the real thing uh, that may help. Pavan, you want to add anything? The last closing remark? No, no, no. I think what you said is right. Uh, we have to look at the uh, philosophy. Are you wanting to counteract the peripheral defocus? Are you wanting to relax the accommodation? So accordingly, you might want to play around. Uh, uh, so yeah, I don't have uh, much to add. Thank you. Thank you, Pavan. It was really wonderful. Thank you. Uh, and we are so proud of you. You are doing a fantastic work. Uh, and uh, hope to see a lot of uh, papers as usual uh, from LV Prasad. Uh, and uh, thank you. Thank you. So, Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let us go into the next uh, topic, which is Okay, so I'm going to talk on multifocal soft contact lenses for myopia control. There are three, four talks, so I have to read every time. <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, so there will be a little repeat of, uh, you know, whatever happened since morning, uh, but that's the whole idea, right? So after the COVID, everybody knows about ep epidemic and pandemic. Before that, it was like, you have to go into the Google and search what it means by epidemic and what is pandemic and all. So now everybody knows. That means it is happening all over the world at the same time, right? So this... 50% of world's population is going to become myopic by 2050. That slide we have been using since last 10 years. 
because that was like golden standard brian holden says so nobody can question it but now that number is going to increase because everybody knows that you know quarantine for one year has uh, made a lot of impact and that is what we are talking like 2050 future who is the future these children are the future so this number will increase so that's why it is more important to talk about this subject and being i care practitioner it is our responsibility to help the patient patient don't know they don't know they okay if you get a glass okay go to optical shop doctor will give you a prescription they will get a glass and continue parents also doesn't know unless you make an effort and educate them otherwise there is hardly any uh, material available online or uh, facebook or anywhere else uh, that makes them aware of uh, you know that ultimately they may have to meet dr karubilari uh, you know in future <laughs> so so coming back to dr larry that is why the retinal detachment or retinal issues are going to happen because of the actual elongation the stretch pavan has ex explained it very nicely the whole eyeball is getting stretched and that is the reason you have to worry about you don't know what is happening where the leak is going to happen where the stretch is going to happen and the, it is not the prescription that you are trying to control you are trying to control the actual elongation of myopia that is the real myopia control uh, so that is where what modality are you using is important whether you are using bifocal lenses you are using atropine whether you are using ortho k you are using multifocal lenses everything differs so the whole idea is to control actual elongation and if your modality or treatment works on actual elongation that is my opinion so uh, of course there are you know uh, comorbidity like glaucoma macular myopathy retinal detachment uh, it is i always you know correlate this with heart condition because everybody knows about heart condition uh, everybody knows if, we, if you buy try to buy a cigarette packet it is written there smoking is injurious to health right but there is nothing written on spectacle that using a single vision glass is going to give you myopia progression and you know it is it may cause a retinal detachment at later age but this is a good comparison you know this slide i borrowed from uh, dr uh, thomas wishevsky uh, who has you no know, uh, compared this with the myopia so smoking equals to stroke everybody knows this right so risk of heart disease is equal to you can compare it with like myopia increase is related to vision loss so even if you try to control by 50% just now pavan said the child is usually about 0.5 diopter is increased every year suppose you have 12 years and only 0.5 increases so it is you are talking about six diopters right it should it goes into high myopia more than minus 5 so even if you start with anything you know bifocal spectacles multifocal soft contact lenses atropine anything what you have so that will at least control 50% and even with 50% you are risk reducing the risk of glaucoma by 67% cataract by 74% retinal detachment by 98% so which is a good good thing so at least do something the whole idea is don't leave that child when it comes to you don't just leave him give him a single vision glass and don't you know just sell any glass and send him off take that extra time as dr larry said she has to spend one hour to discuss right so same thing you also have to take that extra time don't don't think that okay itna why should i spend that much time is anyway going to get single glasses no the counseling you have to do only once then next time they will just keep on coming and you keep on selling so but you take that much time make the awareness and parent should know child doesn't know right the parent should know and if the only one parent has come with the child then you have a difficulty because that parent can't go and explain to the other so you insist on uh, you know both parents should be present like they insist on school right in uh, your uh, teachers uh, parent association meeting they say no you both of you have to come otherwise it is the take home message is not delivered properly so common argument by parents is like you know okay we also had myopia we did lasik and nothing is happening 
but most of them are in their 30s less than 40s the, all this complication will start in 40 45 50 60 which they have not yet reached there and by the time they reach there that the child is about 18 years so the chance of controlling that myopia is gone so that's why I, it is difficult to convince but that is what you have to do so let us so the cutoff point is about 12 years of age you have to start if if the parents are well aware if everybody knows then they will come to you before the age of 12 and you can start something but if they come at around 12 then you have only another 12 years left to control so if even if you try to control by 0 0.25 so minus 5 minus 0.5 every year increase if you do something and it will increase only by 0 0.25 still you are talking about minus 3 when the child comes to you he is about 1 1.5 or two, and if you add minus three, so is already going into that minus five stage, which is again risky. This you already see in the, the uh, image shell, myopic image shell is like this. You are trying to put a my you know minus glass, and then you are bringing it to fovea. Child can see clearly, but the periphery is going still away, and the stimulus to the peripheral retina goes that you have to increase, and that's how the whole eyeball starts growing. So to control myopia, what you have to do is you have to bring that peripheral defocus inside to myopic defocus by any means. Now to bringing from there to here, plus two diopter is not going to work. You need more like, so at least plus five to plus six uh, diopters is required actually. So prescribing single vision glasses, you are pushing that child into myopic progression because of this. Uh, Earl Smith, uh, you know, did a lot of animal research and he showed that, you know, he, he tried to give only controlled focus in only one meridian of one area of retina and that much retina actually stopped and another part of the retina elongated. So it, the, the eyeball changed the shape totally. So that is what is proving that bifocal spectacle is not going to work again because you are trying to treat only one part of the retina. Dear focus vision correction devices in general is what is required. So center vision should be clear and the periphery is you have to bring it inside. So D bifocal, executive bifocal, progression, progress, uh, progressive addition lenses, all are treating only one, one part of the rating. Okay, other part is not still working. So what you need is 360 degree glasses. And as I said, there are some like well-known companies like Zeiss and SLR are coming up in the market with the 360 degree. It is take, going to take a little more time because of the FDA and other thing. Uh, I am also trying to work on some uh, lenses which I already filed a patent for, uh, for astigmatism control. So it will control myopia as well as astigmatism. And hopefully that should be easily available in India uh, in a uh, few, few months time. So, same thing again, just to uh, reiterate uncorrected myopia, traditional correction, you are bringing it to the fovea, but the periphery is causing uh, the stimulus for uh, elongation. And what you need is a myopic defocus that you have to bring. So uncorrected myopic refractive error, of course, nothing is going to happen. Gas permeable contact lenses also doesn't help much uh, because you know, again, the near work is going to bring that peripheral focus outside. Outdoor timing effective on, you know, reducing the onset of myopia. But again, in today's time, it is difficult to uh, have a lot of outdoor timing. So uh, as I was talking, uh, Padma, uh, Padmaja Shankari Durg has a good paper on the outdoor timing and which uh, she says about two and a half hours is average time the child should be in the sunlight. Then, uh, of course, vitamin D and other thing we checked and we know that vitamin D deficiency, that means child is not spending time outdoor much. So I don't know how much it affects on the elongation vitamin D, but uh, it, it proves. Executive bifocal, again, the, so here if you see uh, the, uh, whether you can see there or not, the executive bifocal did not, you know, help in actual elongation. It will slow down the myopia progression by 39%, but it has no effect on elongation, right? 
so it is just a false thing that oh you are doing something at least yes you are doing something but orthokeratology it helps in actual elongation control also and around 45% of reduction in myopia control bifocal contact lenses that is multifocal contact lenses we are talking about because contact lens is 360 degree so this is 50 to 81% effective and at the same time 29 to 55% actual elongation so multifocal soft contact lens is really working well and uh, of course the atropine has uh, you know 59% slowing down the uh, myopia but there are not much of a actual elongation effect that is what the research says so kids should grow stronger not their eye glasses right so as a eye care practitioner it is our duty to help them with the control so uh, my site by cooper vision got fd approval in 2018 and uh, that shows about 59% of myopia uh, control which is very good it is fd approved product and safe for the children's and uh, it is working well as of now it's called my site uh, of course i have no financial interest in any of the thing this is just for a education thing so the design is peculiar because they have a center distance then they have a plus uh, uh, 2.5 2.75 plus 3 then again distance and then again plus so of course when you make a soft contact because i design lenses also so i know getting plus 6 is very difficult because the lens will have a yeah it is very difficult so all the contact lenses which are there in the market like soft lenses they are plus 3 not more than that so but it works another is natural view this is actually a presbyopic contact lens uh, but this also works means people have tried this for some reason it works means they have the, the the contact lenses for presbyopia is center near and periphery distance for myopia control you need reverse you want center distance and periphery so uh, it's these are ready made which are available in the market so you can still try with that now this is particular very nice nutri focus uh, optics uh, so this particular design has a special way of bringing the periphery so it is still a distance near uh, design but still the the design of the lens is such that it is bringing the periphery uh, into the eyeball that is myopic defocus it is causing so this works very nicely to defocus optics because as you see it is bringing everything inside so what you need for myopia control is center distance and periphery near so this is a particular company called uh, specialized so they are customized they will they will make the lenses customized to your order and this is the fantastic tool they have and you can have a toric lenses as well my side and other lenses which i am talking about they don't have a toric optics whereas this people have a toric capabilities and uh, of course they are not daily disposable it's a monthly by monthly disposable this works fantastic so you can order center distance and periphery near uh, they have all the guide you, you can go online and you know uh, become their uh, you can just file uh, fill up your information and you have a lot of information there uh, study materials and they have this uh, particular uh, calculator where you can put in the distance power near power and everything and it will show how much pupillary size also you want it will show you the the how what kind of vision the child can get or a patient can get basically they have developed this for presbyopia but now you using that for myopia so opticing is the new technology which i was talking about where uh, you can have uh, this uh, you know the decentered optics the putting a bifocal or multifocal uh, optics for presbyopia or you know myopia control is very tricky it's easy to talk but if your center of the the power is not in the visual center it doesn't work that's why there is a distortion and other problem shalu pal from canada is going to talk about uh, multifocal uh, scleral lenses so same principle applies to even soft contact lenses 
if you put a soft contact lens the optics is in the center whereas your visual axis there is a you know a lambda so it is if it is not centered the child, the patient is not going to be comfortable of course child will never complain uh, and plus you are bringing it very smaller into the pupillary zone inside but if you want a good optics good vision without any problems that is more important so decentered optics which is which not i think nobody is offering except these people because they can customize it whatever is available in the market you know all the companies have a standard and it is not in the exact center so my side natural vision multifocal biofinity multifocal and proclear multifocal these are the contact lenses multifocal contact lenses which are available in the market uh, so my side has a concentric design and rest of them have a depth of focus design so they have a aspheric design actually and they have a visit in that is a little bluish tint so uv uh, there is no uv cut off because you need uv light to enter for myopia control that's why my side do not have a uh, uv control whereas uh, natural view has a uv control biofinity not don't have because they have designed this for myopia control uh, water content about 60 59 dk is low of course because the soft contact lens they are uh, daily disposable um, my sight and nutri uh, view biofinity and proker are monthly disposable so that is what the choice you have toric multifocal soft contact lenses uh, there are companies who are making like cooper vision decenter toric um, that is biofinity but they are not easily available uh and they are available in different parts of the world this is just a data i am sharing with you uh you know uh, once it is available of course it will be available in india also the take home message is multiple soft contact lens is a very good and easily available option for myopia control so don't try to push on a spectacle if you still want to put spectacle give at least bifocal or double d or something and if if there is a 360 degree yes you can try the problem is spectacle is you put any glass it's going to cut off the uv light so that is another drawback so contact lenses is another you know best option but again we discussed at length in the morning about infection and the child is so small you know who's going to put the lens there is a chance of infections and lot of thing but believe me uh, once the child is you know given that choice i have seen child within one month to two months they says okay parents you don't touch me i'll do it even that 10 month 10 year old 12 year old child you know he himself put the lenses he takes care of it he knows what is to be done so the kids are smart actually so you just have to give them a chance and they will do it so uh, this is your option to uh, you know get this uh, defocus happen and uh, of course you have another another option like ortho ke but since this talk is about myopia control with the soft contact lenses uh you I mean i'm not going to talk much about this in the next talk i'll talk but here i want to bring in the atropine again because you have to do a combine there then only it will work of course as i said uh, if it is uh, less than minus 5 you can still go ahead with the soft contact lens because uh, as an optometrist you are not supposed to prescribe any eye drops unless you are practicing with ophthalmologists then of course uh, that's the best combination it's best combination for both so atropine uh, we already have 0.1% atropine by entort uh, who's our sponsor also today and uh, as uh, dr jetani said 0.5 0.05 also is coming in india slow eventually and uh, even if you have 1% atropine so there is a there is one paper which talks about using 1% atropine once in a month or once in 15 days so it works uh, there is a talk by uh, uh, sayanthan vishwanathan uh, sayanthan uh, from singapur eye research institute who is again a research scientist our indian fellow from uh, you know uh, shankar netralaya uh, he has done fantastic he is research he is research scientist now in shankar netralaya i have been related with him because i supply them uh, you know the animal lenses and everything so he is fantastic his talk is really good so he talks about 
what kind of percentage is good for what kind of myopia so that is again because right now whatever available we are using it but whether it's a low you know if your myopia is less than how much percentage you should use at what age how much percentage you should use it's very nice talk so we'll wait for him i'm not going to spoil the mood so minus 5 is the cut off point as i said you you know you have you must uh, do a combined therapy a myopic astigmatism there is not much of a study happened so far so that's why that not a much of a data um, but yes it worked uh, there is a toric orthokeratology available now and as i said 30 to 50% of all the orthokes now are toric orthokes so these are the like companies which are available you can contact them um, by email and you know go online everybody has a certification course do the certification course you will get at least one certificate we are happy putting certificates right so do that but at least you will learn something and because everybody talks about the same thing but it's a repeated knowledge and you will get confident and some of them may uh, ship you the lenses and if you want a easy way out priti is here you can contact her and she will get you the uh, all the lenses uh, available in india and of course you can design the lenses as you want so start early consider uh, parental myopia that is a you know factor uh, we are going to publish our paper about point system uh, so you will have a ready reference so you know considering how much is the severity you can approach whether to do uh, you know multi factorial approach or just a regular spectacle or something lighting condition and food also is a major part of uh, myopia control so monitor actual length because that is what you are actually trying to control uh, give any options that you feel satisfied and uh, again the same picture trying to bring it to you bring that hyperopic defocus to the myopic defocus by whatever means possible this has already been covered uh, food is of course important for general health and uh, everything because that's what whatever you are eating that is what you are becoming so two and a half hours of outdoor activities the distance between like when you are reading writing the posture is important one and a half feet must distance try to keep as much as possible good lighting condition you can always treat them sometimes but should not be a regular meal uh so in summary bifocal progressive of course you can start with something so they they get to know and then next time when they come you can emphasize on going for a better choice orthoke low dose atropine uh, outdoor activities posture and good food so this is what is our future right so you have to take care of most of us have a children right and uh, you you want to know what can be done because you are into eye care practice and you don't know what to do thanks to uh, you know dr jetani he knew exactly what to do so he could help his children otherwise there are so many i have get i get lot of uh, calls from ophthalmologists that uh, you know what should i do so it's good way to start at least now there is awareness happening so this is going to be nice thank you very much so i think we'll break for lunch here and then uh, we'll uh, continue the session do you have any questions what kind of outdoor do you say what is the timing that you use okay so uh, as i said i was referring to shankari dur that two and half hours so nobody counts two and half hours right it is difficult for it is difficult for uh, sorry for the distraction um child cannot go alone so many times the parent has to accompany correct so best is to develop some kind of a hobby that is like swimming or badminton or something where the parents also can join and do it in the morning before going to school as i said sunrise to sunset is actually you should leave right so get up early okay don't do your facebook and instagram and everything in the night so you can get up early start your day <laughs> as the sun rises and spend and the early morning sun is good for vitamin d and other thing also because the moment the sun goes after 11 o'clock then the child especially our indians they'll say kala ho jayega mera bachcha sun mein jayega to right so better hai use it use that 2 3 hours in the morning you're done for the day 
two hours is sufficient. Two and a half hours is sufficient. If difficult, then again in the evening. But by evening, it is difficult because uh, parents are in the their own job and other stuff. And you know, uh, if possible, yes, again five to six before sunset. You can if you can, you know, go to beach or something. Good. Otherwise, if it is difficult to go out because it's difficult. Even child don't want to go out because he's playing on the uh, you know mobile phones. Uh, there is a good joke I thought of uh, that you will listen in the evening. So uh, <laughs> no, then it will it will get spoiled. Not by me, so some other actor because I was going through. So I uh, thought, but the exercise is important, and nobody's want to do any physical exercise. So they are doing exercise on the mobile phone. That was the thing. So give them something. So what you can do in my practice, what I do is I give a a, a ball or something as a gift. So if you have something, then you you will go and play outdoors. Otherwise, they are going to play on mobiles and it's it's difficult. Plus, there is no space outdoors now, right? You are worried about where where to send the child. So all those are practical difficulties. So to solve that problem. What I suggest is at least you open up the windows and doors, let the natural light come inside, and get that child do homework in the morning, in that natural light, because I have found that the natural light bouncing off of the book is a very good stimulant. Okay, and but but if you do that in the evening, it is bad. So you should know the timing also. So it should be done in the daytime. Okay, is that answers? Huh. Okay, so. He is already done. Eighteen years. Me, kya karoge? Or kitna? Twenty four. Tak suppose you have a time. Maximum addition, whatever is available, you don't have a choice. All the soft contact lenses, you can't say I want plus one addition. Oh, no. So go high, high, add. high. Add. Whatever is highest add, you can get. You add. I said plus six, so no. At least plus two point five, three, whatever. So uh, Subhash says that this row can start going and get the lunch place. You know whatever. Your place, and you can bring it back to your table, and you know, eat, relax, and we can continue the discussion if you want, or I will not disturb, and uh, we'll have a good lunch. Huh? <laughs> you can go for the lunch. Everybody can go, no problem. Yeah, it's not too. <laughs> Thank you. Maji, Maji, Ah, this is slide. It's a nice photo, Maji. Ah, hi. एक मिनट
Hello, check. Hello. Hello. Hello, my check. Hello. 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 Hello, mic testing. Thank <laughs> you. 
पीडीएफ के साथ कॉपी करना है अभी मैं देखिए डेस्कटॉप के ऊपर ये दोनों डाल दिए है यहाँ पे और इनका ये फाइनल यहाँ पे भी है ठीक है ये दो है इनका हेलो हेलो चेक कहते ना
आपल्याला वरती करायचं जर असे हाईट वाढवायचे जर असे कागद वगैरे तुकडे असं काय रोल केलेला आहे का काय राहू देता
So, uh, unfortunately, uh, Debra is in uh, Port St. Lucie, so it is almost 12 hours, so it's midnight. Uh, actually, she was having little, you know, health issues also. So, I'm going to give on her behalf, okay? So, this is Spectacles for Myopia Management. She's a board certified optician, uh, has uh, two... Board certified optician, yes. So they, without uh, licensing, you cannot practice. Opt optometrist is different optician is different uh, so this is so ldo means license dispensing optician and she's a board certified that means uh, you are certified by board of florida optician i am also board certified uh, florida so with optician certified optician you can fit contact lenses no that is the advantage uh, but you cannot, uh, you know, initiate means somebody has to prescribe first, then you can fit the lenses. You cannot start from zero. So optometrists can do uh, everything, what means treatment, glaucoma, retina, everything except the surgery. And opticians can only do the basically spectacles and contact lenses. So not all opticians are doing, but it's very strict there. You can't just uh, open up anything. And uh, yeah, even I got sued because uh, I still had never had a license, but I got a, so you have to appear for ABO, that is uh, American Board of Opticianery. That's a national examination. There is another exam called NCLE, that is National Contact Lens uh, uh, Examination. So after you pass those exams, then you have to give exam for the state board. And then only you will get a license to practice. But if you put a certificate of ABO, since you are passed, that means you are misleading people that you are an optician and you can get sued. So they're very strict. I'm purposely telling because Ajit is here now and uh, he's trying to get the uh, optometrist regularized in India. So uh, that will help. Anyway, so let us go back to uh, this. So of course, some slides will again uh, get overlapped. Uh, same thing, 50% of myopia is going to be, the whole world is becoming, now that number will, I think we can only start 60% or 70%. So people will give reference of Brian Holden, say, Achavi Chandrasekhar Chavan, reference. <laughs> so, of course, for myopia, what you have is uh, spectacles. Opticians can fit spectacles. Uh, optometrist, of course, multifocal soft contact lenses, orthokeratology, ophthalmologist uh, can manage with uh, atropine. And uh, the whole, uh, basically, eye care community has to take care of the myopia progression or control. So you need proper education, certification, because just education doesn't help. Sometimes you have to, somebody has to check whether you are learning correctly. So certification training is ongoing. This is what we are doing now. So if equipment upgrade, because if you have to put, you know, you have to fit, say, ortho case, so you need uh, topographers, uh, other instruments. So, so if you have a good system, then you can serve your customers better. Then that will generate a lawyer customer base and you can stand out of the crowd. See, I congratulate all of you because you have taken that extra efforts and come here. I'm sure not tomorrow, day after tomorrow, but sometime you will definitely start I, you know, implementing all this knowledge to your practice and definitely you will stand among your colleagues that you are a specialist and ultimately it's going to, you know, increase your revenue. So uh, what you're trying to do is actual myopia control. Same, you know, I'm not going to repeat the thing because from morning you have been listening. So this is just to show the, pro the spectacle number keeps on increasing and uh, then uh, again uh, can land up in a other issues, um, 
same the uh, because she has prepared the slide so it is repeated thing um, but it's again repetition of the same thing the image shell by putting a minus lens you are bringing it back to the retina but the periphery goes uh, becomes a hyperopic defocus and that gives the stimulus uh, for myopia progression and these are the comorbidities cataract glaucoma myopic maculopathy retina and these are the percentage wise the most worried percentage is 126 times so if the power number goes more than minus 7 you don't need a jyotishi you can tell him that you are definitely going to need uh, to take appointment with dr karobilari <laughs> so the the idea is to control it you know less than minus 5 is good if it, once it goes above minus 7 then it is definitely going to get serious complications and since retinal surgery okay surgically they can fix it but the vision wise they may not get a uh, normal vision back so it is same thing like uh, comparable to smoking uh, so it is very serious issue so depends on the risk factors like you know one parent myopic or nobody the child is the first myopic uh, you know child in the family or uh, whether mother is myopic or husband is myopic or both of them are myopic so like that uh, the severity will increase so if so that point system when we were talking about same thing like so the moment you have one parent myopic or the child is myopic already on a slope so you are in a car suppose and it's on a slope what is going to happen is going to go down unless you put a brake so what you are doing is putting a brake to the myopia progression otherwise the child is going to go down and meet with an accident like that so this is just to understand simple and easily so minus three to minus five the slope is more the point system wise it's more like that so same unless and until you do some kind of a correction the eyeball elongation will continue and uh all smith has proven that you can actually create a defocus and control the actual growth of the eyeball so what you have is uh, you know the spectacle lenses soft contact lenses and orthokeratology this is what you have right now and clinical consideration like lifetime uh, lifestyle lifestyle change can be added to that like food and outdoor activities etc so this is already we covered multifocal lenses uh, this is what is available in the us which is very popular now but as a optician or a spectacle so you have choice of bifocal executive bifocal progressive additional lenses and double d you may not have seen double d lenses but uh, it is uh, like I, i'll show you in a picture so zeiss has come up with uh, a lens it is still not in the market but this is what they designed the center is for distance and periphery uh, for the near so that is plus power there um, myo myo uh, pilux is by slr so they also are coming up with this there are a lot of studies they definitely did it because without the studies they, they can't get a us fda approval so so the studies are there and soon it will be available pal is already there you are already prescribing to you know presbyopic patients so that same thing can be prescribed to uh, for myopia control but the thing is it will only correct the superior aspect so superior retina will not progress but inferior retina will keep on progressing so the importance is uh, while fitting this the importance is the centration uh, monocular pd is very important because it, it, this has to be taken individually uh, because even if there is suppose minus 3 diopters or minus 5 diopters one mm also shift in a visual axis you, the child is going to get a prismatic effect so you you have to consider all these uh, points so binocular pd monocular pd you have to take plus the the segment height has to be correct at correct level so that the child can uh, you know have a dis without a disturbance a clear vision and uh, choose the largest segment like instead of 20 mm choose 25 mm uh, segment for uh, uh, inverse d uh, then for near segment also you have to have that correct uh, angle because uh, then the child can when it looks near it will help him relax the accommodation also plus he'll get a benefit of plus power so these are the different uh, uh, you know glasses available they are uh, uh, professional glasses indicated for different different reasons but this can be used instead of a single 
PLL lenses. So this is used for pilots or uh, you know other professionals where they have a superiority also. So the down is full power, that is a plus two. The the top is plus one. It is half. So it is for the intermittent, like looking at a computer or something like that. So this also at least plus some plus is there. So now you are targeting superior and inferior both retina. Of course, the peripheral retina is still remaining. Again, for that you need 360 degree, but at least you have that. Plus you have to consider the rotation. Uh, so because eyeball is going to move up and down, so you have to adjust the pentoscopic tilt accordingly. Plus the, the frame has to be you know, fitting properly. It should not be too much tight or loose. Otherwise, child will not wear it properly. Uh, pentoscopic tilt has to be considered. Uh, many times we neglect that the periphery you know, the, if it keeps on bothering, child can get, you know, headache and pain. Of course, uh, we are, for children, we usually ask for polycarbonate lenses, high index, mid index, trivex, you know, uh, Abbey value, all these things has to be considered when you are designing or advising uh, what kind of uh, spectacle uh, you should prescribe to the children. The material also is important. You know, if you give a metal frame, it is not advisable, better to give a plastic frame and, uh, you know, make, let child select or get, get him involved into the selection because then only he's going to wear. Otherwise we have seen that, you know, they will get the spectacles, but child don't wear it, uh, you know, because for near thing, they can see everything clearly unless they want to see TV or something, which they're not going to use it. So it's very difficult to, especially when the power is very, less. So these are the references. Thank you very much. That is her email ID. If somebody wants to communicate with her, she is, she'll be happy to uh, correspond. Any questions? In fact, I would like to have your comment because you are the one who's practicing actually in reality, spectacles and all. I don't fit spectacles. If you can give some tips. No, practically whatever needs to be done, you've already covered. So the fitting aspects, the materials, the Abbey value, these are certain things which normally we tend to ignore. I mean, not many of us and none of the patients know anything about Abbey value. So as you said, you know, for children, we prescribe polycarbonate lenses, but Trivex is a better material as compared to polycarbonate because it has got a higher AP value and uh, much better scratch resistance. So these things as clinicians, we need to know so we can recommend the right product. So what options we have in, in India? Trivex and polycarbonate, both are available. Both are available. Both are available. So do you routinely prescribe uh, bifocal lenses to start with? No, <clears throat> no, no, no. You'll try to convert them to ortho -K or soft yes. multiple? No spectacles. I am waiting for the specialty spectacles for myopia control, specifically which are designed for controlling myopia. Right. Once they are available, then that will definitely be a very good option. But unless you have uh, problems related to your accommodative lag, I don't think these work. No. no. Ajit, do you have any comments? How often would you ask the child to change his money is not an object? How often should they be changing their frames? I would not like to put a number to it, but as and when the glasses are soiled, definitely they need to replace. No, what I'm saying is, when, when would you like to ideally call a patient back to you? See, every year we do examination. So that time you make it a point to examine the eyeglass quality as well. Because that is something which is frequently missed. You know, we check the vision, we check everything, but we fail to check the eyeglasses. So that needs to be done. And not only that, uh, if the glasses are slightly round in shape, you may even want to check the power also because while wiping, I don't know why invariably we tend to wipe it like that, you know, and that changes the axis. So you may have dispensed the glass with the right axis, but after six months, the axis changes on its own. So I tend to avoid exactly round frames, you know, Gandhiji type of frames. Slightly rectangle frames are better because the access change does not happen that easily. But every visit, make it a point to check the eyeglasses for power and the quality. 
Well, polycarbonate lenses are more prone to scratches. Yeah. Whereas uh, Trivex is uh, more stronger. Add to whatever Doctor said is uh, that see these children generally what we do because we've got multiple children coming with CBI and all those kind of things. We call them every six months for a follow up. We do their uh, the cycloplegic refractions and all that six months, and obviously there's generally a change. It's very rare that you know the number doesn't alter. These numbers are mostly sphero cylinders. They are never pure spherical. Yes. Very very pure sphericals will come up. Now what we do is that you see the how the child is wearing the glass. See most of them have a tendency of removing it one hand and throwing it. They're throwing it because children do that. We have to counsel them that you learn glass with two hands, remove it, put it, keep it in a case. And we tell the parents that you have to teach the child to do this, watch him for the first two weeks, how he's doing it and make a habit out of it. That is one thing. Second thing is that when he comes back with the glasses, of course, scratches, of course, if it's there, then you have to, anyway, if you have to change the glass, the same frame can suffice if it's fitting, fitting well. Now you look at him, suppose he's got a big humongous frame. You know, where his eyes, the pupil center is up, with the centration is bad, or the ear bends are very far away from the ear, you, or somebody has bent it like a Chinese mustache, you tell him that you take another frame because this is not working well for you. It is never going to help the child, especially when you're going to do amblyopia treatment for the patient. And if there are scratches, of course, so you discard the thing. And if it is a frame where the child, because of constant bad removal, has sort of flayed it, then you have to tell them to change the glass. So sometimes there are some <laughs> children who are very proper. They do not need changes sometimes even for one year. But sometimes people need changes every because sometimes they break it. And the option that we have of these Miraflex frames for the smaller kids, Miraflex or the pit and mitt, which is there, they are good because the thing is that they have a universal size where if you do the centration properly, it doesn't bend, break or anything. So it's fine for the child. So those have a longer longevity than the other glasses. No? That the glass pops out. They have to put quick fix. Ajit, you want to say something? As Madam rightly pointed out, the simpler way is to ask every six months. And uh, I generally uh, teach the parents to check for the balance. If that is wrong, and when the child is growing, if the edges are, you know, pressing on the temples, uh, the kid would never understand the difference, but it hurts on the temples. And if you teach them that to the parents, they would generally come back and say that my child has grown bigger and uh, he or she would need a replacement. So then it doesn't become a, a difficulty of convincing but every six months as a golden rule. Ajit, more than hurting, no? When the sides are tight, the glasses tend to come forward and the, then the kid is undercorrected. <coughs> Vertex, Vertex distance Sorry. increases. So all these things need to be reassessed. Sizes or patching or whatever. Uh, having a well-centered frame where the child is using the proper power which gives him the maximum kind of vision is always very, very beneficial. Of course, you know, he has to do it on a very regular basis every day. That all counts. But these things also carry a lot of weight in improving their visible uh, visibility. Do you suggest any photochromatic or tinted lenses for children? No, I don't. I uh, don't ask them to get photochromatic because see, it's every six months you change. It's too expensive. But tint, yes, if it's an albinotic and all, I tell them to get it. Yeah, that's a different thing. Yeah. In okay. fact, uh, I remember uh, your conference in, uh, I don't remember the place, but in one of your conferences, we, we had a tiff about UV protection. Yes. You remember? The, uh, so after yeah. that, you know what I'm doing? I, if it is for myopia control, I recommend two glasses, one which is UV protected and one which is non-UV protected. Because till the time we have clarity, 
But the problem these days is you hardly get good quality lenses which are non-UV protected. That's the sad part. These days, everybody wants 100% UV protection and blue control. Yeah, yeah. So that is because now everybody is talking about blue, blue, blue cut, blue cut. And both but that is good for people who are grown up, not for children. The, the thing is, if you want to give a 1.6 or a good impact resistant lens to a child which is non-UV and non-blue cut, it's practically impossible. Impossible. So we as practitioners need to demand this from the suppliers. So abhi to aisa ho gaya ki in my practice, because I'm saying no blue control, the patients think he doesn't know anything. Right. Yes. Because outside everybody everybody's saying, talking about blue card. Card. Uh, Sir, online school, my child is sitting on the computer for, for six hours. Correct. In fact, they, they have seen the blue card lenses and then they come just to get the power. And then when That is of no use or for rather, the child. Uh, for the child. I have predominantly pediatric optical practice. That is what actually I was about 90, to come to you because of my patients are children only. Yes. So so what happens is you are you are telling something and he is going to that place and blue cut is the most, you know, yeah, the standard now. Uh, that is like uh, and you can they can charge more also. That's the whole As idea. a result, you know what has you happened? Know, I have a very simple way. I tell them that uh, okay, you want to spend money. Or you want to save money. So obviously they say save money. I said, okay, do these, these things. This will work as well as your blue cut lenses. Um, very uh, bad situation when we uh, are forced to answer such type of questions from parents. And uh, like all of you are unnecessarily wearing ties and suits. It doesn't suit the Indian scenario only in AC. It is like that. I tell them that this is not required by you. Do you wear sweater every day? He says, no. Only because you have a good sweater, you don't wear it. <laughs> Unless you are, you know, chilly. It is something like that. Your child does not require this. Why are you unnecessarily wasting your money? Basically wasting money. <laughs> Sorry, then it is, it, is, it is just a one sentence. Sir, yes, but yeah. I have, because I face it every day and I do have my own optical outlet. And in spite of that, I'm saying that don't use it. <laughs> so, uh, I generally that would uh, uh, suffice. And so if we uh, have to go one step ahead and create more confusion, I don't know how much you know about the blue cut, but blue cut is not supposed to cut 100% of blue. Some part of the blue has to pass through. So when you give a good quality blue cut lens, it's not going to cut 100%. So the next door optician will demonstrate, they have given it, they don't cut it cut it. They have cut it cut it. So that complicates it further. What I have done at my place is that I've made a chart of all VIVGR and put uh, values cross values and say, uh, just ask your uh, optician, whoever has told you, what is the wavelength? <laughs> no, no, that will generally cut off all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a serious suggestion here. Either American Academy of Optometry or Ophthalmology, I don't know. They have issued a public statement saying that we do not recommend blue cut lenses. Yes. Yes. So, if something like that can be done by people like you, because we need to protect, see, it's protective of myopia, right? So, our kids should not wear blue cut lenses. So, if your association issues such guidelines, it will be really useful. You will be upsetting few spectacle manufacturers, that is for sure. But we need to care for our kids. <laughs> yeah, but now, now I think there is a good amount of uh, you know knowledge and uh, awareness because what you said we are talking about 2015. So that time you fought with me yeah, about yeah. Um, you know how how can you say that you don't you, you know. Uh, allow blue light. So 
now people know the importance but now because they have come up with blue cut lenses they are marketing so they have to sell so again you have to do some counter of course you sell means it has a value but not for a children that has to be hey correction there i was debating you got angry i, I know not fight with you <laughs> so yes Let us go ahead and uh, invite uh, Madhavi Panchamiya and Preeti Mistri to enlighten us about uh, topography. Uh, this is a I have selected both of them because both of them have a a different module. Like one has a Medmont and one has a Cirrus. Uh, so one is uh, practicing exclusively ortho K and uh, contact lenses, whereas uh, Madhavi is expert and. has a lot of experience with lasik and other things also so this will be a good combination for us to learn i invite both of you you can take a uh, uh, yeah at least one so that both of you can talk the presentation number so good afternoon everyone um so myself preeti and madhvi we both are going to speak about the topography so we we no 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 we are going to speak about topography only and uh, here like we both are showing a different part of the topography like as a uh, chandrashekar sir mentioned that i'll be covering the medmont and the contact lens speciality uh, how the medmont is useful in contact lens speciality and she'll gonna cover about the serious topography so the medmont is a placido based topographer which is a non invasive imaging technique which we use and uh, it measure like basically it gives you the quantitatively and qualitatively um, morphology of the cornea it measures the shape and power of the cornea and it represents by color like uh, hot colors you can say red and orange represent the stiffness of the cornea and the yellow color represents the normal and green and blue color represents the flatness of the cornea we can use this as for orthokeratology you can use for dry eye management and you can use for therapeutic lens fitting also now madhvi will share as uh, we are discussing about the topography uh, we'll just go little bit into as basic overall corneal diameter what we say and uh, dioptric power is highest what we see in average 43 to 45 diopter right overall when we talk about the shape of it the cornea is not a sphere we all know so it's generally it's a prolate shape because where it's have a steeper thing in the center and flatter in the periphery generally post lasik post uh, prks or any post ortho k uh, contact lenses when you see where we are purposefully making flatter in the center and steeper in the periphery so that is what uh, oblate shape i uh, just go quickly into evolution where we go and we used to read in our ugs where the evolution started with basic keratometry where you used to take, take give us the corneal curvature and then the keratoscopy started so where the placido disc 
has come into a picture then it is computerized with a video keratography and then all this scanning slit technology has started where it is taking a consideration of your whole cornea right so that's how and then the shinflage uh, camera so this is how the evaluation has happened uh can just go to the next slide yeah so generally on an average what topographer names we come across is opscan galileo pentacam and cirrus uh it has a different uh, combinations as it has a placido disk plus it has a semflage uh, camera mm -hmm. so cirrus uh, topography it has a semflage plus placido disk so what placido disk does is it takes the whole concentric rings so it takes the whole mapping of your cornea along with that when you have a semflage camera it takes the anterior to the posterior cornea 9 out of 10 times what we look is only anterior cornea but generally who is practicing into clinical uh, will be knowing so because mainly we need to look out whether it's a keratoconus or a from fruste where we need to rule out there it helps out to take care of the posterior uh, surface also so it has a 22 uh, 22 placido rings and 1600 points which is covering anterior and posterior i need to tell yeah. you this yeah. so like in medmont you'll get 32 rings yeah, and 9600 points it's covering yeah. so basically for contact lens fitting if you are seeing on that perspective the anterior cornea then the medmont is uh, like ideally useful because it because it covers the 0.01 mm distance of the points right right so when we are particularly talking about uh, uh, keratometry uh, particularly i'm talking about the cirrus so there's one study published by dr rohit shetty because he is uh, uh, probably i would say a godfather of the uh, topography and the uh, transpiagis procedures so uh, in his study he has come up that basically what we need to look now see because we are talking a lot about interpretation but uh, i would say being a clinical optometrist i would like to just put a few focus focus point on how to do the test even that makes a huge huge difference sometimes even performing a test you know just blindly and you see some hot spots and you starts getting into borderline thing and just doing a proper scans with proper proper evaluation takes you to the other context of it the summary of this uh, study was showing that up to uh, one diopter of uh, astigmatism and up to 10 microns of pachymetry microns you see between each graphs so that's why minimum three test three time uh, capturing should be done for any one eye and that's how the best images can be taken now let's see how the medmont uh, captures the image so medmont is like uh, basically is a auto capture and it covers a large corneal uh area basically it covers the limbus to limbus that is more than 14 mm you can cover the uh, medmont has a one more facility which is a called composite capture that i'll explain you later and it gives you as i mentioned that it gives you accuracy of 99% so yeah now what is composite capture so when if you see like a patient has a small palpebral fissure or a large eyelashes which is like you know obstructing the placido rings so in that case you can opt for this composite pic capture where you will be getting a two visual uh, like a, a there are a total um, eight maps two is from visual axis two is from geometrical axis and uh, four in all principal meridians that is a superior inferior nasal and temporal and the machine itself the software itself composite like Uh, merge all the maps eight maps and gives you a full corneal coverage if you can see over here so that will be ideal for when you are designing your own ortho k lenses or large gp diameter lenses or uh, scleral lenses it will be a uh, helpful to design the lens from edge to edge now how to capture this uh, eight maps so for visual access you have to ask the patient to look at the center light of the placido inside the concentric ring you will see in that you just look at the center light so that uh, the uh, map which you are capturing that is a visual axis from the visual axis then you have to ask for a geometrical axis so you ask the patient to look a little nasal to the red light inside maybe first uh, like there are four the first innermost uh, ring to one two three four you can go up to four innermost innermost ring to get, get any uh, map from the geometrical axis this is the how to capture only
and then all your eight maps will merge together and form a one uh, uh, map, which is a, your composite capture. Now, how to capture a good uh, placidus? So basically, you in this medmont, you just have to this green bar. You have to coincide with the red line. So, for example, if your red bar is little above, that means you are little away from the machine. And if your red bar is little below, that means you are too close to the uh, patient's eye. So you have to move the machine little, the joystick little backward. And in the next uh, picture, you can see that you will be getting the percentage. So from 95 to 99 percent is accurate. So at, when you get the accurate uh, graph, then you can just zoom it. Here the three options are there. Select, clear and zoom. If you are not getting good, then you can clear it. If it is a good, first zoom it, just see the placidos. If it is intact, there is no tear abnormality, the placidos are intact, then you can select that map. Now, so this is the how you have to take, uh, capture the good map. Now, how to interpret? So actual interpretation, basically we use for the diaptric uh, power to check the diaptric power. So which is the flattest meridian, which is the stiffest, and that the what does the diaptric power? Basically, when you are designing the lens, you see the pupillary area way like uh, diaptric power, or the power is changing. If there is a too much change in the power, that means the normal GP lens won't help. You need to go with the toric surface. Second one is a tangential curvature interpretation. Basically, that we uh, do uh, that will come to know about the shape of the cornea. So. Uh, and the size of the shape of the cornea, size of the cone, size of the um, exactly placement of the uh, cone, that all you'll come to know from this uh, tangential curvature mark. Okay, now one more thing. Over here, you can see this IS index, SAI index, and SRI index. Red bar over here. This one. So basically, if this bar is coming into the yellow color that means there is a suspect any corneal disease is suspected if it is in green color that means the cornea is normal and if it is showing in red color that means definitely there is corneal abnormality in the shape like any shape abnormality is present now the elevation so elevation basically we use for to just to see the any elevation or like any depression and elevation present on the cornea so for example here you can see in this example the superior part is like showing in red color. It's very steep. It's elevated plus 310 micron. And the below is a flat showing in blue color, which is minus 290 microns. So the difference between this two, sorry, is more than six, seven, 700 micron, right? So the thing is that if the difference is more than 300 microns, then you need to, you cannot select the normal GP lens. You need to go with the scleral lens only for that patient. Right. Now, Madhvi will continue. Uh, right. So as uh, just now Preeti has explained about the interpretation, uh, we will continue the same way. As I was talking about the acquisition, so on the uh, top right side, you see the acquisition quality, which is stick with the green uh, sign. So it shows that image is captured properly because if it is image captured properly, then only go to evaluate and interpret it. Very important thing in serious topography, what we see is you get the pupil offset, okay, which is equivalent to angle kappa. So the smaller the value, I'll make it very simple. Uh, the smaller the value, it means the image is proper. Patient has fixed it properly and you can calculate that image. So whether it is for your contact lens fit or your, for your LASIK evaluation and even for your keratoponus C3R, topoguided C3R, any of the procedure. Then it shows the thinnest point location on the cornea. So what we, what we need to do is how thin the cornea. See here, the first map, what you see is a corneal thickness. Basically, Cirrus is made of just four uh, uh, map, which just now also Preeti talked. So tangential, anterior elevation, posterior elevation, and your packy map. Packy map, what you need to see, if you see this packy, you see, oh, wow, it's, it's nice, all 600, 700. But what you need to see is where the minimum thinnest location point of the cornea. So if periphery could be 500, but center thin thickness is, has to be, which is what we see less than 500 or more than 500. And it has, uh, along with that, it has a many other features, like it shows different pupil size, all corneal curvatures. So 3 mm, 5 mm, 8 mm, 
pupil size it shows corneal curvature same way it shows back corneal curvature also which is useful for a ophthal ophthalmologist for you know deciding uh, eye oil calculations or toric eye oil plans or ipcl whatever then uh, it shows a normal keratoconus summary i'll come to the next slide later on but you know for easy faster interpretation in heavy opd if you need to know it finally gives a class here so above there is a vector analysis which combines all your data and it quickly tells you whether this patient is normal it's borderline it is keratoconus or it is treated means patient has underwent any procedure on the eye and the cornea doesn't show a normal look right so it shows a normal keratoconus summary anything crosses yellow is borderline and red is treatable so i'll just give a little gist of it basically in the elevation map interpretation how you interpret there are just two factors sif and sib this factor what it describes it describes the vertical asymmetry between superior and inferior curvature and kvf and kvb this too also is the highest elevation point on your cornea so your cornea is like this but where exactly it has got elevated it picks up that point one end and one point in the posterior part so kif and K, uh, kvb and kvf and uh, generally opscan people use it to the widest level where uh, you know it comes with a bad d values generally whoever is used will be having idea and it shows with the best fit sphere and it shows the value with that whether patient is normal or suspect or keratoconus here it shows with the delta z what does it mean is you just have to run your cursor from superior to inferior and just check whether it is getting steeper it means wo red ho raha hai kya or whether it is flatter whether it is getting uh, blue or into green zone and so rough guide again it is not the final cut off value to finalize your keratoconus but still if kva goes more than 7 uh, microns and kvb crosses more than 12 microns then it, you are into your suspect right so basically three thing for just keratoconus summary which is very simple to remember in serious manually look for elevation map stiffening and thinning but main criteria if you have a follow up a uh, progression of your keratoconus just look if there is one diopter increase in k values suppose last visit you have seen the patient patient was 45 46 this visit you have seen it has become 46 47 so it is one diopter increase there and if it is 25 microns thinner in your pacchi value so your 500 was a pacchi and this visit after a year you saw 475 it means it should alarm you ki patient is getting into some suspect and you any topography uh, interpretation comes on the shape indices so uh, generally it is called as uh, rms so rms has been taken at 4 mm and 8 mm and this data has been actually studied very well with opscan also and this data has come where exact 4 mm rms if it shows suspect it means patient is suspect and there is a something called as beosi kelosi varasi index there all this bcvf and bcvb was calculated in short what does it mean any patient is going into keratoconus or post lasik ectasia their higher order abrasions that's affecting in that also out of seven higher order abrasion what all get affects is the main common thing is uh, your coma uh, trifoil and spherical abrasion only this three abrasion gets connected so these are the just normal values i'll not get into too much detail because people are not used serious will not understand but still uh, these are the cut off values uh, overall we use only one good factor is it has a one normative data which can actually differentiate normal patient from suspect also and one is suspect from keratoconus so you cannot label every patient as a keratoconus but yes there will be one big class of people who will be into your suspect right so vector analysis shows like this uh just can you go to the next yeah and it has a wonderful other features it has a glaucoma screening also where it actually measures your irido corneal angle so it is helpful for the glaucoma screening and it gives the pacchi also 
uh, it has another pupillography. So mesopic, scotopic, and dynamic, all pupil diameter in different lighting conditions, you can measure with this topography. Uh, you can have a mebography, where nowadays, I guess, dry eye something, which is again a hot topic uh, in all our ophthal and optom industries. So there to uh, measure all your tear glands, and it's a non-invasive, and it shows in the grading, mild, moderate, severe, right? And it shows the aberrations also. So if you want to just work on uh, aber aberrometry, it, it has an aberrometer attachment also. So these all are the different features for Cirrus. Let's see what about the Medmont. So as you mentioned, even in Medmont, we have a dry eye uh, uh, measurement. So this is also non-invasive. You don't have to uh, put uh, any fluorescent oil because that also, uh, yeah, yeah. So that, uh, and even you can check the soft lens wetability also in this. Can be measured yeah, dry and the dry eye, eye yeah, non-invasive. Non and you can see like, a, you can ask the patient to wear the contact lens and you can see the equally distribution of the, yeah. And if you, for the first appearance of the dry spot, that is, that will appear in the red color. So you can take a videography also of that. And uh, yeah, so the blue color, what you can see, that is an equal distribution of the tears on the, patient's eye or on the lens and the red patches appears that that is a dry spot and you can measure the and you can measure the in a second so the normal is like 12.2 if it is lesser than 12.2 seconds that means patient is suspected the dry eye okay so now the case so this is a like a simple case of high astigmatism you can see the patient is a like uh, wearing a plus three with minus four cylinder in right eye. And uh, if you can see the keratometry reading also, they are also showing like 3.7 adapter cylinder. So this is a like pure case of corneal astigmatism. Even you can see the red bar, the three index, which I said. Now this is another case of ortho okay, pre and post. So after a two hours of trial, you can see with the ortho okay lens, how the corneal surface got changed. And this is the scleral lens patient. If you can see the cone in the same red color, and if you can see the three index, are showing complete red color. That means there is a uh, surely keratoconus is present. And up with scleral contact lens, you can see that index color changed to green. That means it became no. Even you can compare the K reading. Here it was showing 3.7 diopter of cylinder. After scleral lens trial, it was becoming 1.25. So patient was like taking a, accepting 1.25 diopter cylinder. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, sir. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So now Madhu will take it further. So uh, this is yeah. the So this is a uh, uh, normal case. Uh, let's have a look. I think a lot of hearing, a lot of interpretation. Let's do a little practical interpretation now, okay? Because so when this is the same patient, both eyes topography, okay? When you forget the values, when you look at this, okay? What all? What do you can think of? Yes, please. Perfect, perfect, excellent. So how how you got that? If you can answer that, it's it's better for audience also. Correct. Correct. And there is no steepening, what you are seeing, right? So it's a perfect, it's a, basically, if you see the K reading, of course, I guess, uh, picture is not that clear, but I'll just tell you, it's the K1, K2 is around 40 to 45. So cylinder is around 3.5, your cylinder is around 4, but still it is just uh, with the rule astigmatism. So uh, I guess I'll just share some cases, so which may help for your uh, future uh, reference also. So this is the first case, I, again, if you see, 
just look at the curvature map. Center, can you all see the yellow petal, right? So, of course, it's not into a complete flatter side. It's slightly gone into borderline. Inferiorly, if you see slight orangish shadow, which has started. So, again, when you go into refractive indices, quickly, uh, what point I said that SIB, SIF, and KVFB, all that is showing the red triangle uh, mark, which is alarming. It is basically a borderline keratoconus case. We had seen it over the three to four years. And she's a young female. So, of course, the chances of progression was high. Patient wanted a C3R. So, we hold that for like three, four years. And finally, C3R was performed. So sorry. Yeah. Uh, right. So, this is a post C3R case. Same patient. Just quickly see this value now. The SIF before K-Conus treatment was 0.92. And now it has gone to 0.49. Okay. And all that, even respectively, all the parameters have changed. Simply to make it very clear, just look at that map, which was a yellowish in the center and getting into oranges. That side it is getting now a little flatter. So this was the borderline keratoconus case. Uh, now let's look at this. What do you feel after looking at this map? Any, any suggestions, any comment? Very good. That's the first thing should come into optimum minds. Actually, all, all my interns start telling me, every time you feel dry only, you don't feel anything else. I said, that's the first thing which you need to actually rule out. If you rule out, then, then go into some other suspect. So simply putting a lubricanting and repeating the topography after 10 minutes, or you will see the different or else even post contact lens wear. If you immediately take a picture, you get similar image like this. So basically, uh, if you see here, the indexes I'll read out for here. It's again 42, 43. Cylinder is around 1.52. And this is the post-treatment of that patient. Okay. Now, uh, here, cylinder is just gone to 0.36 post-surgery. See the map equality also no? on the right-hand side, both top. So, basically, it's pre and post. Uh, it's pre and post PTK. Okay. Basically, patient has a corneal scarring past history of some injury patient has been having corneal scarring the only one uh, good advantage of the series it has a Schwinn machine also again there's no financial interest it is just because i work with the institution where this machine is there so the one beauty is we can do non-touchable laser so uh, even since last so many years i have also seen so many patients if it comes with a corneal scar or opacity if transplant or DSEC is not done, nothing can be done for the patient. Only few practitioners will fit RGP and still the vision can be improved. But otherwise, nothing else was done. Only one good thing with this, all this corneal scarring, if we do a PTK, uh, half of the cornea comes into almost regularized. And then if you fit a RGP, patient is like 6'6". Six, six. So I have so many patients like that. So this is one more case with a PTK thing and PRK. It is the same. See, I have shown the corneal scarring images also. That was ASOCT picture. Right uh, above, if you see, that was a corneal scar and below it has completely got clear. So that's corneal opacification. And now this is the interesting case again. Anyone? <laughs> yes? Correct. So one, one thing I'm comes with the routine as a PMD. But basically, this patient uh, has actually come for lazy evaluation. But of course, after looking at the map, that is so absolutely got abundant. But uh, when you see, basically, it is a corneal warpage uh, case. This had literally had the long discussions on LVPA groups also, SN also, because keratoconus every time was showing a suspect. But we had followed up over three years. It is not getting progress. But that's ultimately, you see, that was a quite six, six months picture, what I have put up here don't have more time to show so i have just put three and this was the patient actual refraction it was 4.5 with four cylinder but if you see the k1 k2 just see the difference it's just 41.5 and 42.25 but over the years just with the lubricant we are just following up with the uh you know topography images and patient's vision is 66 uh, 66 part at present with that acceptance so that was a corneal warpage and this is our typical central cone right with the central stiffening Again, all that the screening as the class directly shows. So practically when you do, you don't have to put your mind because it's showing keratoconus compatible. But for definitely for better understanding, because if you're going to take any decision on patient's operation or staying down or for a contact lens, 
you need to evaluate all this factor which we discussed earlier and uh, this patient same uh, nowadays keratoconus also one c3r what we are being hearing we do but nowadays in the c3r there is called topo guided c3r okay uh, in that what we happen this you try to correct patient irregularity along with the ctr so you are just not stopping the keratoconus but you are changing the patient power also so this was the case where pre op was 2.25 with 2.25 and post op patient has accepted only minus 1 with half cylinder and patient has reached to 66 so of course you always try for specialty contact lenses but there are some patients you know they feel ki oh i have to spend for ctr also after that i have to spend for uh, you know all your specialty lenses also so options are available where you can combine the treatment and also give it so these are the different cases and uh, this is the last one which again recurrent corneal erosion the commonest cause you see in or regular opd patient gets some injury and they come with the epithelial defect you bandage but again when recurrency happens this is the recent last month we did so after uh, third time recurrent corneal erosion we just did a ptk permanently patient is fine and the cornea is irregularized so this how the topography helps us in evaluating Indeed. the different and this was the uh, flap related complications what we routinely see in lasik no so post lasik uh, if you see the peripheral the red circles if you are seeing no it's not absolutely in the same shape all 360 degree because near the hinge there was a flap related complication which has happened and this is the post lasik ectasia so here only one clue is if you are seeing uh, this the k1 k2 value is not falling into your keratoconus uh, guidelines it is hardly 43 47 ideally post lasik cornea becomes flat but post lasik when your ectasia starts again it starts stiffening so this was the post lasik ectasia so this how the different uh, things what we generally see <laughs> flap related complications Thank you. Thank you for thank listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you, sir, for giving us this platform to present. So, thank yeah, you. Thank yeah. you. Yes, sir. Sir, I, I haven't fitted the contact lens on this, but yeah, first I'll definitely fit the normal RGP. Sir. I'll sorry. I'll fit the normal RGP. I'll see the fitting. I'll check the vision, and then if needed, we'll go for the toric. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
and how to incorporate toric orthokeratology lenses into a treatment regimen. Since it's about one o'clock in the morning here in Seattle, I thought it'd be a good idea to record this. So when should we consider a toric orthokey lens? Conventional thinking is whenever we have more than about 25 or 30 microns of elevation difference at about nine millimeters in the principal meridians. But what if we have a spherical periphery and a significant toricity in the central six millimeters? then we should be thinking about tericity in the treatment zone as well. In this situation, a simple toric periphery will do the trick. There is a small amount of with the rule astigmatism. Proper alignment in the periphery will center the lens and sphericize the treatment zone without any additional gymnastics up to about one and a half diopters. Here's one that I had recently. Centralized astigmatism and a nearly spherical periphery. Experience tells us that if we use a rotationally symmetrical treatment zone, we're going to end up with about the same amount of astigmatism that we started with. So, how do we flatten the vertical meridian more than the horizontal meridian in just the central cornea? Number one, it's important to stabilize rotation. We can use tericity and the reverse curve to do that. Since we don't have much, much tericity in the periphery, with this Rx, we'll need to put some tericity in the treatment zone as well. We'll want to use tericity in the treatment zone to selectively flatten the opposing meridians about a tenth of a millimeter for every one to one and a half diopters of cylinder usually works pretty well. Here for the left eye, we were able to achieve alignment at a 0.2 millimeter difference in the treatment zone and a difference of about 85 microns in the periphery. So here are the final results. Note that we flattened the vertical meridian three diopters more than the one diopter in the horizontal, giving us the desired result. I really appreciate these simulated fluorescein patterns. They give us a great way to guide us to predict the look of the final design and enhance the outcomes. If we look at the left eye, we see basically the same results. I used an arrow to color match to express some meridional differences. That dark blue in the vertical meridian, I think, has become my favorite color. So the final Rx was plus quarter minus 50 axis 3 and plus 75 minus 75 axis 178. So it was 20, 20 unaided OU. I always tell the parents that these are very difficult cases. She may need to still need to wear glasses during the day. But when they read the 2020 line with no Rx, I am not only handsome and smart, but I'm also a hero. You probably don't get these in India, but every once in a while, somebody shows up with a LASIK surgery that didn't turn out quite as well as they'd hoped. According to the Journal of Cataract and Refractive Surgery, success is typically defined by quality of vision and patient satisfaction. LASIK weighs in at about 96 to 98% satisfaction. More than 13 million procedures have been performed in the U.S. since it was approved in 1999. If the failure rate is 2 to 4%, that's a significant number. I don't know if they were trying to account for a huge angle lambda or whether the surgeon was just cross-eyed. I refracted her and she could read the 2020 letters, but it just didn't look right. I just figured it was due to the coma from the decentered treatment zone. The next question is, can we move the treatment zone? When you were doing millions of LASIK surgeries and you only have a very small percentage of failures, that still leaves a lot of potential fixer-uppers. The key here is to try to move the existing reverse curve area rather than trying to build a new one. 
This requires using a very large treatment zone. I used a 7.2 millimeter treatment zone and a large 11.4 diameter lens, which allows us to land nicely in the periphery. Same for the left. Notice the difference in the tear layer thickness in the horizontal meridian. This allows us to bring up the nasal and flatten the temporal zones. The results are striking. Looking at this, there is a dramatic shift in the position of the treatment zone and just enough overall flattening to correct the residual myopia. Both for the right and left, you can really see the difference in the tear layer thickness in the horizontal meridian on both eyes. This is where the entire cornea is so important to stabilize and center the lens in the geometric center of the cornea. The change is very apparent when you look at the difference maps. There will always be a slight nasal decentration on these, but as luck would have it, it might match up pretty well with the angle lambda. The left even looks more dramatic. She turned out to be a very satisfied patient that only wears the lenses every two to three days. She ended up with 2020 HI and 2015 OU. The images were not distorted anymore and said the night vision had improved significantly. Winner. This last one's a very interesting case. He had tried ortho key previously, but never got satisfactory vision. His partner was a patient of mine and suggested he come in and try an evaluation. He was envious that his partner was doing so well and not needing daytime correction. He was highly motivated, 49 years old, wanting to be able to see distance without correction during the day. He was aware of the fact that readers would be necessary for near work, but that was okay with him. One look at the topography and it seemed very apparent why the previous attempts might have been a failure. The decentered corneal apices can pose a real problem as the lens will have a strong tendency to center over the apex resulting in a poorly centered treatment zone. On these I go straight to a quadrant specific design. I know that I'm going to have to force the lens to geometric center by using specific pressure at the more steeply curved nasal quadrant. A simple toric lens will not position the lens correct centrally. When the lens is broken into quads, it's simple to make the appropriate adjustments. As we've done here, steeper at zero and flatter at 180 for the right eye. Note again the tear layer thickness difference in the simulated fluorescent pattern. And for the left, we went steeper at 180 and flatter at zero. I was able to get decent treatment zone centration by using the quad specific design. Pretty much the same for the left eye as well. The final RX shows a right eye of plano minus 75 axis 90 and a left eye of plus a quarter minus one axis 90. The patient was very happy and being a 49 year old appreciated some enhanced near point probably due to proximity of the reverse curve and the residual cylinder. I hope you folks were able to glean a few pearls from this. Thank you so much for your attention. And thanks to the organizing committee for inviting me. I'm always open to questions and feedback, so don't hesitate to contact me if you think I can clear anything up for you. I've been to India three times, Hyderabad, Goa, and Mumbai. What a rich and fascinating culture. I hope to return in the near future. Many regards. Unmute for me. Bruce, you are on. Yes. Yes. Can you put on your uh, camera so that we can see? Uh, I'm in the dark here. It's two o'clock in the morning. So <laughs> I'm. Uh... It's okay. Yeah. Thank, thanks for uh, being there for us. 
Oh, you're welcome. Uh, anybody has any questions for Bruce? Compliments that such a difficult case managed so well. So highest order complications, uh, compliments to Dr. Bruce. Oh, thank you. So uh, Bruce, uh, when it comes to orthokeratology, uh, what is the percentage of patients that needs uh, toric orthoke in your experience? Uh -huh. I would guess probably about 75%. Wow. That was it just, 30 to 40%, you're saying 70%, wow. Yeah, uh, I think you could get by with a, a lower percentage on sphericals, but uh, once you start doing the tericity and the, the treatments come out so much better, it's, uh, you, you kind of just lean toward going, th going for that. So what is your cutoff? Uh, like, uh, what is the minimum uh, cylinder that you will say, okay, you want to go with the toric lens? Say 0.5 cylinder, 0.5 well, cylinder? Yeah. If, if, if you look back at that uh, uh, case with the high cylinder and the low myopia, that periphery was almost spherical. But we still put a little bit of tericity in there to try to st help stabilize the lens on the cornea. Right. It, you know, we had we had to use a toric center, but we uh, uh, we used some tericity in the periphery as well. So uh, you designed this lens uh, on what kind of uh, software? If you can share with the uh, audience. Well, that's uh, uh, this particular one was Forge, which is from iSpace, um, iSpace.com, I think it is. And you can go on there and take a look at it. Uh, yeah. But, you know, I, I use Wave as well and, and uh, some night lens and other stuff as well. So uh, it's, it's not so much the program, it's how you use it. Right, right. All, all of them have uh, the ability to do a quad specific or a toric or toric center and spherical periphery or toric periphery and spherical center. So Bruce, uh, how many times you have to refit? Suppose you, you made one lens and you started and then you realize that you need to modify the fit. So how, how do you go about it? Not very often. Uh, you mean like uh, you don't get full treatment or you yes. Yes. decentration or something like that? Uh -huh. uh, I th not very often. Oh, good. Okay, because it's um, difficult to wash out and again start, especially on toric corneas. Yeah, <clears throat> that's another one that uh, uh, I, a, a lot of, most people I think will, I, I get quite a few referrals from people that aren't having good success somewhere else. Right. And uh, typically I don't wash them out and, and restart. Uh, especially if I can get their previous pre-treatment data. data yeah. But a lot of times I'll just use a trial lens to uh, obtain a really good fit in the periphery and then I can over refract and adjust the base curve depend, uh, depending on what I find in the over refraction. Do, do you have a choice of uh, uh, any uh... Uh, treatment zone that you want to keep for everyone or you, you design different for everyone? Well, it's, it's well, as you, as you saw here, it's, it's pretty much patient specific. Uh, if they're a young kid who's a real fast progressor, I try to keep that treatment, that reverse curve right at the edge or inside the edge of the pupil in, in ambient light. Uh, I think even if you're outside the pupil, the lateral uh, rays that come in will, will also focus ahead of the retina and the periphery. But uh, I think you get better 
control, if you can keep that reverse curve right at the pupil margin. Wonderful. Yashwant, you want to ask anything? Hi, Bruce. This is Yashwant here. Hi. Uh, what's the maximum cylinder you've corrected using these lenses? Uh, four and a half. Okay. And what's the maximum spherical value? Uh, eight. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. You bet. <laughs> it's, I know it's most satisfactory. Uh, work that uh, you do, and it's really amazing. Uh, what is the uh, youngest patient uh, you advise to go with ortho -K lenses? Uh, I I think five is the youngest I've ever uh, done, and I had one one <laughs> my favorite little patient where she was a a little tiny uh, Chinese girl. And I mean, she was tiny. <laughs> she she looked like she was about a foot tall, right. but she was five years old. She just turned five, and she was real apprehensive at first. And we kind of went through the thing, and and finally was able to get the lens in, and everything was good. And she had a couple of tears, but not too bad. And then she came in the next morning uh, uh, for the one week follow up, and she she so proudly. I announced that she could put the lens in and take it out by herself wow. at five years old. So um, uh, in a regular practice, uh, do you find difficulty convincing uh, the child or convincing parents? Or you don't talk? Uh, I really, every, every patient I see is, is uh, either a referral from another practitioner or from another patient. So they're already... So, they're, they come in for the treatment, so right. I don't really have to convince anybody of anything. Wonderful. Wonderful. Lucky. Uh, Shekhar, just because these are... No, just old. <laughs> <laughs> because these are toric uh, ortho -Ks, how often does he recommend them to be replaced? I'm sorry again? How often do you recommend these lenses to be replaced? How often do I recommend these lenses? To be replaced. Oh, to be replaced. Oh, uh, oh when they need it. Some, you know, some kids run through these things about every six months. Uh, typically, I would say one year is about it. And I'll, uh, I'll bring the camera up and I can show the patient or the parent what the lens looks like. And it's generally pretty scratched up and, and uh, deposited. So you can see pretty easily that it does need to be replaced at about a year, typically, sometimes sooner, sometimes they go a little longer. Okay, wonderful, Bruce. Uh, any any last comments before you we let you go? Uh, no, that should do it for me. Unless there's any other questions, you can always get a hold of me via email, you know that, so. Sure, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. It was really wonderful. Oh, and, uh, thank you. Thanks for accommodating my request at the last moment. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> thank you. Have a good night. All right. Take, take care. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you. Thank you. So here comes uh, time for Nitesh Barot, who's... Uh, really help India to move forward on orthokeratology uh, on educational front. And uh, thanks to his efforts uh, and uh, uh, BIPOM, how, how do you say this? British uh, Indo-Pacific Orthokeratology Myopic Control yeah, Academy. There you are. <laughs> BIPOC. BIPOC, okay. <laughs> The stage is yours. Yep. Thank you. Are you. Am I on the uh, sharing your screen or not? One second. Keep my screen. Nitesh, Nitesh Varun. Uh, Nitesh will make you co host so that you can. Uh... Yep. Okay. Hey. Yep. Am I on? 
Yes, we can see. Can you see my slides? Yes, no? No, no, no. We can see you. One Something second. Is not... Okay. Okay, hold on. Share screen. So, be mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Agia? Huh? Share screen. Okay, hold on. Yep, I'm on. Okay, yeah. There you go. All right, guys. Bipox, so you can scan and you can see the website if you want to. So please scan me if you, with your mobile phones. Sekar asked me to design also care lenses for my API management. So that's what I'm going to be doing. But it's been a great conference moment. So far, what I've been seeing whole morning, I got up at three o'clock, really, you know, UK time. And I'd like to thank uh, Shekhar and uh, Dr. Muscati to invite me for this symposium. I did this symposium uh, 2017 first time. And that time my API, obviously management wasn't even talked about. So it's great that it's a whole topic now on it, a whole day on it. And great Bruce to hear from you again. Now, when we're looking at why also K, so we need to look at, is it's another modality. If you provide spectacles, you provide contact lenses, why not provide another modality to correct the vision, which is ortho-K. Is ortho-K good for myopia? Yes, it is. Can we improve myopia management? And advantages of, we look at all this and look at the simple OK uh, lens, which is the original ortho-K lens, how it, it gives us superior results. Now, the basic function of an ortho-K lens, as you can see here, Oops. Oops. is you got a reverse zone here, alignment here, and a peripheral zone. The, the reverse zone piece basically give us the hyperopic deep focus, which is what we require for myopia control. And the central target zone is basically what we are correcting for my, myopia. Now, also okay, safety studies have been done, Mark Berlima, I won't go into it, but obviously it's as safe as any extended ray soft lens. All my, my peer control studies with also okay have shown fantastic results in managing myopia. So this is with a standard also okay. There was a study done to, a 12 year study done, again, the results showed 36 to 56%, you know, also myopia management. Now, what, what's okay, and if you look at myopia control, why, not, why do we need to do a myopia control design? Because we know already the ortho-K lens is doing a good job, but studies have proven that by peripheral hyperopic deep focus can Hold a progression of myopia. Traditional ortho K designs can help with myopia control, but they were designed to reduce myopia. Oops. I think you probably have seen this slide before. I think uh, Steve did it earlier on in the morning. Ortho K for myopia reduction, temporary reduction of myopia associated with corneal flattening, also okay for myopia control, reduce myopia, but stop and control the axial lens. Now myopia, we need to be aware that axial length is what we will give us all the problems later on in life. And which we was uh, talked about this morning, but Dr. Karobi. So myopia the focus we're looking at basically getting the image to enter the retina. And therefore we reduce the myopia so the person can see without any aid. Now here we would, Aaron, I think the question about cost, there was a discussion what we should be doing, why we should be doing ortho K. I would just like to ask I, I, my patients and parents, one thing, have you ever seen what your child can see? And I would actually say minus three, I would put a plus three if the patient was perfect eye and say, then show them how the world looks to that child. To me, it's myopia is actually like, you know, when you give spectacles, it's like giving crutches for walking. 
So when you explain that to the patient, uh, the parents and say, look, this is the child who needs and can see without anything. In the morning, they take care of their lenses off, they can walk around and usually they like that idea. So it is one of the sellable points. Put a plus lens into the, in front of the parent and say, can you see the wall? They can't see, that's a very convincing argument. The optical defox theory again has been talked about all this morning. So all you're trying to do is give you as much hyperopic defocus as you can. There was also another study which was done for hyper reduction control with a two year study to monitor the axial length, vitreous chamber diameter changes in children undergoing ortho K treatment. Compare the ortho K rates of change with children. The actual growth results after 24 months, and this is with a standard ortho K lens, remember this. And it was 50% reduction. If you can see ortho K 0.23 and control was 0.48 after 24 months. Increase in axial length again 0.44. Vitreous chamber depth again 0 0.3, 0 0.48. I'm going a little bit faster because of the time. Control 0.48 in two years. Also, K 0.23 in two years. Now, what is the mechanism for my hyper control? Pre ortho K prolaconia. And then we are on the foia, but after the oblate cornea, you have a fovea blur. The steep mid peripheral cornea creates a high blur area on the fovea. Early on, again, Steve said that we will call lenses for uh, children, pediatric ortho lenses, because they've got small optic zones, a spheric optic zones, and double reverse zones. The adult OK lenses are large optic zones, spherical optic zones, and single reverse zones. So that's the difference between a myopia control lens and a normal ortho K lens. And that's how the fluorescent should be looking. This is a, a myopia control lens, and that's the standard ortho K lens. So traditional ortho K use standard 6 to 6.4 or even slightly larger optic zones, too large for defocus, usually because it's outside zone. Spherical radius is op in optic zone does not create any multifocal effect on the postponia ortho K. So you can look at standard ortho K. If you're lucky and somebody's around six millimeters people, you will get my IP control. And quite a lot of this was achieved in the past. So we are not saying that it doesn't work, but it, it depends on the Caucasian, uh, or usually Caucasian uh, patients who were six and above optic pupil diameters. While the re reverse zone is too far outside, the field of vision to create peripheral defocus. Now, this again the, is what the diagram you saw earlier on from Steve morning. My epic control, you're now putting a spheric, which gives you the multifocal effect. Reverse zone one creates a plus four edge hyperopic diff blur. Smaller optic zones allow wider alignment curves for better centration. So your lens is now sitting more, it's not rocking. So you get with a small optic zone, you get a larger alignment zone. So it's a lot better lens centration. And again, with the four diopter, you're getting a very good hyperopic blur. And this is what we are trying to achieve basically on the retina, correct in the middle and then hyperopic defocus. As I said, it's a four diopter, which is quite good. You can go even higher. Now, looking at ortho K is generally safe for myopia correction and retardation. However, the long term success of the treatment will depend on the combination of multiple factors, including proper fitting of lenses, rigorous compliance to lens use, and care regime, adherence to routine follow ups, and timely and appropriate treatments to complications. So, when you, you are going to be dealing with young myops, so children. So we need to be very, very careful when we are fitting also K lenses and explaining everything on the safety aspects and also monitoring it. In my practice, we tend to get every three months the patients to come in just for cleaning the lenses. Now we don't need to clean them for them, but we are doing it. We even inspect the lenses that they are perfectly okay 
and they're doing exactly what they've been told. We even reinforce everything, how they remove them, how they take them off, how they even wash their hands. Obviously, with the COVID regulations, we had a lot of issues, but we went again, like we're doing Zoom today, we've gone that way to again talk to patients and asking them what's going on. So we've never, last 18 months, our practice was running basically, basically on orthocade through Zoom. And what we were doing was, if necessary, get the patients in, because by the government regulations, we could only see emergency patients. We couldn't see normal patients. Now, orthocare and myopia control start earlier, still earlier on site, and minus one. I mean, I do it even lower than that. I mean, I, I'm now looking at kids, if they've got plus or 50 at five or six or years of age, you start to think, do I need to mention myopia control? I do mention it, and if need be, start early. If you start in a minus four, yes, you will control it. Although Steve said it's too late, it's never late. Every diopter counts. So make sure every diopter, if it's at four or a five, you do not want it to go to six because you know what happens with high myopia. So every diopter counts. We need to make sure we control. We try and control that axial length. Again, this is what I just showed you earlier on. The myopic control lens should fit like a normal reverse geometry lens, but with a smaller treatment zone. Now, if it was an adult, again, as Steve said earlier, there will be glare problems. So therefore you will change them at 18 or 19, or when you think sufficient that they're gonna be driving. So until then, I tend to keep them on my peer control lens now. Now, my upper control lens, if you're going to order it from a manufacturer, usually they'll be doing it a standard lens, which is 2.5 millimeter central bearing with 0.4 to 0.6 brilliant pooling, 0.4 to 0.6 pooling, one millimeter wide dark alignment zone, 0.6 to 0.1 wide light alignment, narrow but brilliant edge lift. So that's what you're going to be creating the lens for. Now, in the old days, we used to measure pupil diameter just like this with a ruler. And again, optic zone should be plus or minus two millimeter than the pupil. 5.4 millimeter is best average for optic zones. That's for average. Remember this, you can get better now, which I'll talk about later on. Average pupil diameter for a male is 5.8 and female is 5.4. So this is on an average basis, the manufacturers will give you a lens off the shelves. And post wear topography should show small treatment zones, steeper reverse zone ring, wider flattened alignment zones rings. So that's what a post topography should show you. Options for my control also K lens. You can do it empirically with tri lens or not. So like Steve in the morning side, you can actually phone him up and give him the parameters and he'll order you the standard also K myopia pediatric lens or you can be a master and design it yourself and get even better results. This is just a deer profile example I'm gonna show you. It's basically, oops. If you look at this, it's a minus one deer profile here, and this is a minus four. Now, what we are looking at is the reverse zone here, which is what's gonna be the peripheral zone created on your topography map, the red ring. This is gonna give you a much more higher red ring compared to that. It's the same parameters I put in here, except the power target power is one is minus one and the other is minus four. Now, we talked about earlier on the goals, we're talking about topography. Now, looking at topography again, it can give you a good idea what you're trying to achieve. Now, this is a differential map, a refractive map. And in a man mode, you can do tangential diffractive maps or axial, or as I said, just a uh, axial power or tangential power. And what you're looking for here is basically that graph at the bottom. If you look at that, you can see it's not much of a power or peripheral zone is not too high. So it's not gonna be giving you a good myopic control because if you've got a minus one and a Jason factor of 0.75, 
the hyperopic defocus is going to be below two. So if you look at literature around everywhere with the research people, they're saying, oh, it's okay for low uh, myopia, it's not good. Is it? You can see that later. Look at a minus three. Now we are getting somewhere. If you look at a minus three, somebody's coming in with a minus three and you your target power and with the Jessen factor, you're going to get that peripheral now, hyperopic defocus of 0.462 there. So that's where you, you got it corrected. This is my patient, so I'm just showing you what has happened. A minus five, again, beautiful. Again, you're going to get a good hyperopic defocus here. So it's giving you around four diopters of hyperopic defocus. So yes, it's good myopia control if it's a minus five or a minus three, but a minus one, you saw it wasn't doing it. Now, I'll give you an example how to design a myopia control lens. The effect to reduce is minus one, two, five. We kept the back optic zone spherical, compression factor is 0 0.75, and your back optic zone is 3.4. So this is a standard ortho K lens we are making at the moment with not my IP control in mind. And this again is the Kia profile. It's 46 microns. And it's again, not gonna give you much of a hyperopic defocus. Post is acting on the cornea, not it's a 6.8 millimeter. So if you look at that, this is forces acting, not a topography map. Here you can see it's a nice target. It's gonna correct the myopia. But if you look at this green zone, it's outside the pupil and the dead peripheral zone is way off. So it's not gonna give you myopia control at all. Now let's do a Jessen factor change. So what we've done is here is change that to minus three. We still kept this spherical and we kept the optic zone still 3.4. But just look at that massive tear layer going up a bit now. So you are getting a good hyperopic defocus, but for a lathe machine, a computerized lathe machine to cut this would be difficult. And also you're gonna have a lot of plus power. So your flattening is gonna be a lot more. Now, if you look at this is the, the instrument I use now to measure the pupil diameter. This is an automatic machine, which will give you the exact pupil diameter required to design your back optic zone. So pupillary meters are now coming into force now. A lot of instruments have got it and please use them. This time what we've done is we kept the three, there's just a factor. We've changed now the back optic zone diameter to 2.7. So we're now reducing the back optic zone diameter. And if you look at that red now, it's going further up. This red is moving in. This is forces acting now. You got to remember, this is not a top of map. This is actually showing you what the lens is going to be doing onto that cornea. And if you look at that now, it's a nice smooth finish, but we got a Another reverse curve here helping. So what we're doing is giving you a very focal effect, more or less. And that's before even changing to aspheric zones. Now let's change it a little bit and show you what aspheric, asphericity can do. This time we've kept the Jessen factor as a 0.75. The back optic zone is going to 2.7 and aspheric now has come in, a sphericity of 2.65. All the other parameters we're keeping same to make sure it's the same diameter lens. So we have to alter the curves, but I'm not going into that in detail today. So again, if you can look at it, the hyperopic defocus has been increased because the tear layer has gone up. The forces that's gonna be applied here, is gonna be a lot more higher. Again, you still got that because of your optic zone coming in, you got that ability to have this, the reverse curve, the second reverse curve there. And the other thing which I forgot to mention is we, with Bruce talking about toric lenses, most of my lenses now, 80 to 90%, I use toric alignment because it's the best to get, for my epic control, you want as much stability on the lens. So most of the lenses I'll use toric alignment now. This is not the same as correcting a, cylindrical correction. This is just to make sure the lens fits okay on the cornea. 
Now you can see it's very similar again, the tear profile. Just in fact, is 0.75, but we altered the optic zone and we've done the sphericity. Now another example of a minus four with a Jessen factor of 150. Same thing again, a sphericity, this time I've kept it oops, at zero, but it's still gonna give you the, the, the machine, the lead machine will cut it in a spheric zone, although it's not much. But because I've given a Jessen factor of 150 and 2.7 here, again, you can see it's very similar. So we have got various parameters we can change to have a good myopia control lens. So effectively, when you're trying to design a myopia control lens, it's the forces what we are looking at, the lens is gonna apply. So here you can see a large optic zone. And what you want is this, basically, the optic zone has to be smaller. And then the reverse zone comes inside. This is the fluorescent pattern you want. You got a double reverse zone here. You got a lighter green, and a darker green here. You can see this was 6.4 and this is 5.4. There's a big difference and the force is acting are completely different. So you can see exactly what's happening here. This is how the lens will be applying the force onto the cornea. So that the red is the force that's applying outwards and the center is going inwards. Can we improve my epic control of the K-Lens? Yes, we can. Because now we can change the back optics on diameter. If you custom design, you can change the Jessen factor, a sphericity, or we can change one or in combination. So my epic control now with ortho K can be taken to a complete serious level. Obviously, designing your lenses will give you superior results for myopia management. And I'd like to thank you. Hope uh, uh, you understood what I was trying to explain to you and any questions. Questions? Anybody? So, uh, Nitesh. Uh, we saw yes. designs, most of the time you try to keep a 2.5 optic zone. Uh, yes. Uh, and, but the, uh, the range went up to 5.5, right? Yes, yeah. Because average, if you order from Steve or any manufacturer, they can do a MIP control lens now with 5.5 or 5.4. But in my case, I was giving an example, but you can now control it even better. You can actually get the back optics on to be whatever you want. True. So you can decide what you want. And when you design design map control, it's not just different to doing a high myopia. Very true. Because you want that reverse zone to be in the right place. The peripheral defocus is the most important thing. Right. Yeah. It's amazing. Of course, uh, these people have never used any yes. uh, software. So, but it was really nice to get familiarized with uh, at least JSON factor and uh, terminology and other thing. But uh, thank you very much, Nitesh, for you know accepting this uh, topic to talk about because you are the best in uh, uh, you know, and you can justify the uh, topic. Wonderful. We enjoyed. Yeah, and it's like Bruce Williams is the other one who's doing it, but he's using the eye space. Yeah. But eye space has got a bit of its own limitations on that software. Because it's like the guys who de developed that, we're, we're going in a different quadrant uh, way of doing things. I, I use wave uh, designs. So, of course, everybody has their own thing. You should know what. Wave is a good software, don't get me wrong, but wave requires a lot of actual training again, because you need to be knowledgeable of what you're doing. Because again, I was, when it was being developed, I played a part in that. So I know how it was done. And I mean, the balls and that, it's a lot more learning to do. Yeah. So, okay. Anybody else has any questions? Thank you, Nitesh. I think we'll let you go. Thank you. Thank you for oh, your thank time. You. Thank you. Thank you. Hope to see you next year again. Hopefully. Uh, yeah. Thank you for inviting again. Thank you. Thank you, Nitesh. Take care. Okay. One more uh, thing. Nitesh. 
Yes. People are saying you are looking a uh, little more experienced. Especially this. I've become a grandfather. So. <laughs> That's what I said. He's relaxed now. <laughs> <laughs> so I've changed basically now to becoming a grandfather and enjoying the life. I'm semi-retired too also now. That's good. So you should you should uh, take more lectures here now. I'm doing more consultation work. So if anybody wants to learn, that's where I'm now more, concentrating more time on now. Sure. You know, and with Bipak, obviously, you may know, taking I... a little bit more time. Shekhar. Thank you. Yes. May I? Yes. I'm using uh, Nitesh. Hello, Ajit Limaya here. Okay. Yes, Ajay. Uh, hi. Using lenses designed by Nitesh. Good to hear from you. And uh, they are You can wonderful. talk about patient we dealt with yours we did recently. Very recently. And uh, the youngest boy which I could do with these lenses was a 12 year old boy who was to go to a uh, he uh, he ranked better in national exam and uh, was uh, selected at uh, Dune School, Military Academy. And they said that because you are myope, you are not able to, uh, they, they threw him out. And with these lenses, he got selected and uh, he got admitted. So that is the beauty of what Nitesh is doing. Thank you so much. Yeah, and the other thing I'd like to mention on that case, uh, Ajay, it, that was a bilateral amblyopia. Now, within six months, that amblyopia is going to disappear too. Watch that also. Keep an eye on that patient. You're going to see a little bit more surprising result there. Thank you. Thank you, Nitesh. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye. So till the time the system is getting, I hope the program has been very informative for all of you. And uh, thank you, Shekhar, for once again having me here. And thank you, Dr. Koresh Maskati. I don't see him here. So after knowing about myopia, after knowing about complications of myopia, and why we should get into myopia control, and what is the incidence of myopia in India, and after considering options control, 
using soft contact lenses and spectacles, it is now time for us to dispense the lens to the patient. And this talk primarily would be dealing with orthokeratology and not soft contact lens because soft contact lens dispensing is going to be the same as your regular soft contact. So ortho K, we have to make certain changes. So let's go through, is the system set? Yes, okay. Okay, so that's my name. And let's get the lenses ready for dispensing. Now, ortho K is basically just the opposite of your regular rigid contact lenses. Rigid contact lenses we wear during the day and ortho keratology we are wearing when we go to sleep. So conditioning of lens, cleaning the lenses because most of the lenses when they come from the lab, they are in non-disinfected state. So we have to disinfect every go to the patient, okay? So when you clean the lens, you need to physically inspect if everything is fine, then soak it in, required soaking solution, and get the lenses ready for dispensing to the patient. So what solutions do we normally use? How many options do we have for RGP contact lens solutions in India? Very few, right? Uh, some other solutions I've listed here, the Boston Simplus of Excellence Plus Plus, Shaker, I'm sure you're still dispensing these, no? Okay. So Flexilence Plus Plus is off the market, such a price possession. So Boston Simplus, that's the only good branded solution now available in India. And if you are if you are studying in the universities of WhatsApp and Facebook, some of you may have read that it's a very harsh solution for ortho K contact lenses. That's what the seniors believe. I don't understand much about solutions, but that's what some of the hardcore practitioners who do ortho K fittings, they believe in. So what I do is uh, we do use Boston Simplus for cleaning, but we ensure that we remove all the Simplus by using normal saline or sterile water for injection or some rinsing solution, which is available from Contacare. And I thought Flexilence was having it, but unfortunately, no. Uh, Contacare, specifically I'm mentioning Contacare because it's an alcohol-based uh, intensive cleaner, which takes care of lipid very well. So we know protein and lipid are the two deposits. So intensive cleaner is again a very good option. Once in a week cleaning is sufficient. You need to saline. Unfortunately, it's not available now. So sterile water for injection will do the do the job. And some bleaching uh, solution like the Prozac or the ProMaster. Unfortunately, not paying money to uh, mention their names here. So when to clean? Very important. Now I have worn ortho K lens and I have realized that when there are late nights and you come home at 11 o'clock and that time cleaning and then wearing the lens becomes a troublesome thing. So personally, I would suggest you clean it in the morning and scientifically also it's recommended because a clean lens will get disinfected better because you want to soak the lens all throughout the day for disinfection. So a clean lens would always make sense when it is getting disinfected. Now, this is for regular ortho K. You may argue that if we do it for myopia control and as the kid is wearing these lenses, the kid's morning time is a busy getting ready for school and having breakfast and milk and packing your bag and everything. So you may tweak a bit depending on the patient, but preferably in the morning. So once the lens is clean, it is put for disinfection all throughout the day, the lens is disinfected. So at night, your only job is take the lens out of the case Rinse and put it in the eye. Case hygiene, again, very important just with uh, all kinds of lens. Similarly, we take very good care of your cleaning regimen. We wash our hands, we wash the lens. We take very good care of everything other than the contact lens case. So, contact lens case cleaning is also very important. And if possible, replace the lens case every now and then. You might decide on maybe monthly or three monthly, depending on the hygiene. And now we all have come to a conclusion what is the best way of cleaning the case. Clean the case. Method of cleaning the case. Whether to use a suction device for removal of the contact lens, there are divided opinions. Some practitioners use it regularly. Some practitioners do not like to use these devices. Of course, the advantages are it's very easy to remove. If you're using this device, it's very easy to remove the lens from the eye. What are the disadvantages? It gets dirty. So it has to be replaced frequently or at least clean at regular intervals. 
Now to replace a suction device in India is a little expensive and patients may not like it. And it is risky if the lens is not there in the eye. If you remember when it comes to regular RGPs, how we tell the patient, close the uh, close right eye, see with the left eye. If the vision is clear, that means the lens is on the eye, then you can remove. But remember with ortho K, with lens or without lens, the vision is going to be clear. So the lens is there in the center or not. So this with one of my patients about six months back, she put the suction device directly on the cornea. She was a sclerant. So handling, it's pretty similar to your regular RCP. So cleaning the lens, either you can clean it this way using both the hands, or you can clean it using the three fingers, rotating the lens. Make sure you put adequate pressure, but not too much of pressure because these are ortho key lenses. If they work, your correction is not going to be adequate. Rinse them thoroughly, inspect, and then wear. Always make sure you teach the patients to inspect the lens because we don't want any nicks, any scratches, any cuts anywhere or any foreign bodies on the lens. Wearing the lens, after the lens is cleaned and rinsed, you put maybe one drop of lubricating uh, agent or you put uh, sterile water or normal saline and then wear the sclerin lens if possible. It is not always necessary to wear it like that. But sometimes some air bubbles can get trapped between the contact lens and the cornea, and most of them these disappear in half an hour of wear. But if you are taking air bubbles also, uh, insert the lens like your regular RTP and verify the lens is in the center. And then the most important step: wish everyone good night and sweet dreams. This is very important. So you teach all your children to wish parents good night. Removal in the morning, always educate the patient to ensure that the lens is freely moving on the eye. If the lens is not moving, do not attempt removal. So if the lens is not moving, just wait, a, wait for about 10, 15 minutes, the lens will automatically start moving. Then you can, or you put some lubricating drop or the uh, unit dose normal saline or sterile water for rejection. Provide some lubrication, the lens starts moving, then attempt removal. Remove using the one finger method, like we remove our normal RGB, or the two finger method, or the suction device. Personally, I prefer this because sometimes using two fingers, you can work the lens more easily. And clean and soak in the fresh solution. Sometimes it's a good idea to note the sleeping patterns. In fact, this is one question that we can add to our uh, ortho K case, wherein we need to understand how the child sleeps. So if the child is sleeping on the sides, it's okay. If the child is sleeping on the back, that's the best. But if the child is sleeping prone, then that's, that's going to be an issue. Sometimes, you know, some, some children sleep like that. And some of these patients may have lag of thermos, and that also could be an issue, like in my next case. So the picture on the left side, this was the first ortho -K we designed for this patient and the edges were a little tight. You can still see the staining. And because of the lag of the most, there was this, there was staining at uh, six o'clock. So we loosened the edges. And if you see on the right, it's almost a perfect fit, but still the patient had issues. Then the third lens was made, wherein the diameter was almost complete HVID, almost. So it's like 98%. But still, we had to avoid fitting and we shifted this patient to soft multifocal myopia control lens. So some tips, as I said earlier, avoid too much of pressure while cleaning. Physical inspection is very important. It's important in all the contact lens and also in auto because the patient is sleeping with the lens on and do not wear the lenses when you're awake. Now, when I wore the lens for the first time, when I got my lenses, I was so excited and I wore the lens without realizing that next morning, my wife had booked for a movie show. And I wore the lens and I it was for almost about five hours. And I could see clearly. But then when we did the photograph, we realized the lens has been moving all along. So the correction zones are slightly blurred, you know. That's okay. That's not going to harm the eyes. But suppose if it if it moves too up or too down specific area and if the lens is not fitting on that area is moving too much up and down it might actually injure the cornea 
So wearing these lenses during the daytime may not be a very good idea. Earlier, I used to advocate the patients, if you don't sleep with the lens on, and if your correction is not adequate, then what do you do? So that was a big question mark. So if your cell phone is not charged in the night, and you want to make a call in the, in the morning, what do you do? You charge the So I used to tell the patient, you know, you put it on, and that was a wrong advice. So maintain hygiene, and avoid washing hands with perfume or perfume-free uh, and oil-free soaps, even on using sanitizers. Dry hands with a lint-free napkin. I think we all are familiar with these things because we do it every day in and day out for all types of contact lenses. And clean the area of work. So initially, you know, my staff used to use those cheap quality selvets available, spray some sanitizer and wipe the uh, area of work. And after about two or three days, that uh, selvet used to get very dirty and it was so embarrassing using the same selvet every day. So we, we changed it and we said, okay, one day, one selvet. Until I met Shekhar and I realized that his method was the best, you get those uh, alcohol packs, sealed ones. So it, it cuts a very good impression also and you're being 100% hygienic. So you open a fresh bag, you wipe the whole layer, it conveys so much of professionalism. So that's something that I took from your clinician. Luckily, it's not expensive also. So all of us should do that. So follow-up, very, very important because this is the other first night which all of us are interested in knowing the details about, right? So patient removes the lenses at home. So instinctive, you know, how's the vision? Or we want to check the cornea, don't do that. Instead, ask a question like, you know, what did you enjoy most when you woke up and removed your lens? And when they start from their house and they come to your clinic for an examination, I can guarantee you one that small shops, or they would read the license plates of all the cars in front of them, or possibly they would do both. And the mother would be jumping with excitement. You know, finally, my child is totally away from glasses. He or she can see so clearly. The child would be so happy to see everything clearly without glasses. It's an emotional moment. And some of the patients cry in the morning, experience it. Check the vision binocularly. You're so tempted to check it uniocularly, you know? but you know it, I know it. After first night, the vision is not going to be 100% clear in both the eyes. So it may be 60% in one eye, it may be 70% in one eye, it may be just 20% in one eye. Right? So make sure you check the vision binocularly as long as the patient is happy with it and you're happy. Because you know the correction takes some time to, uh, to be completed. Do your topographies. Topographies are primarily just to ensure that the centration is there. The correction is happening in the center, in the right zone. And note the correction. This is just for your reference. So if you see this case, this was a high myo, minus seven. And after one night of wear, 3.07 diopters were corrected. And the correction is fairly central. So some people prefer to call the patient next after three nights or after one week. Most of the practitioners call after one week of wear. Patient again removes the lenses at home and visits the clinic in the morning. So this time your question is going to be a little different. How's life without glasses? So you're giving an invaded command in your question. You know, your life is going to be awesome now, now that you're not wearing glasses. So then they start reading about what their experience were in that week. So rather than concentrating on the tiny problems some of these may be having, because these are teething issues, right? So you minify the issues and you magnify the joys. Check the vision binocularly or monocularly, depending how the vision is and how you are happy with the progress. So if you feel the patient is able to read 6-6, the patient is very happy, you might have to check the vision monocularly or maybe postpone it to the next visit. Do your topographies and again note the correction. Generally, Three days to 15 days good enough, is good enough time for the patient to reach optimum correction and for the correction to stay all throughout the day. So replacement, a big question mark here. Uh, the recommended eye replacement schedule is one year. I think that's amply clear now. We've been discussing about it since morning. But all my patients, I, I don't even want to say most of my patients because all my patients have successfully worn lenses for two years. So unless there is a reason for you to change, 
you may postpone your change by maybe six months to one year because of affordability issue. It doesn't really harm the quality of the contact list. Condition is very good. The surface quality is very, very important. So even if you suspect that the lenses are damaged a little bit also, you might be changing the lens. But eventually, most of us should shift to the US-based system like Shekhar said, you know, they have to pay a global fee per year. So somewhere I think all of us need to adopt that practice. So you charge a yearly fee. And in that, if you have to replace lenses two times also, you should do it. And if it is not required, then the state pair can go up to one and a half years or two years, whatever. So if it is for myopia control, then just giving the lenses to the patient, testing the patient day one and day seven is not sufficient because this is just the start. Remember, you have to control the myopia. So you have to map its progression. So dispensing instructions are very, very important. Axial length measurements need to be done either every year or six months. Generally accepted norm is every year. Every year is good. So you can map it. You can make an Excel file and see the graph, how it is progressing. Uh, do your corneal topographies to see the changes. Again, after every year is good enough. You might have to send this patient for ophthalmology consultation because myop, you need retina evaluation also. And sometimes you might want to start them on atropine therapy along with orthopedology because it is accepted that ortho -K works best. Okay, Myopia control is best achieved when you put the patient on atropine and ortho -K together. So if you want to really attack that myopia, you know that you're already late in controlling myopia, then this is the way to go. When we see happy patients in our practices, whether it is an ortho -K patient or spectacle patient or regular RCP or regular surgeons, we automatically assume that this patient is going to send more patients to our practice. That doesn't work that way. Unless and until you ask, you will not get. So anytime you see a happy patient, make sure you tell them, please inform your friends and relatives that we do this work here and we'll be happy to have reference from you. If you just say this sentence, make sure you, um, uh, mind you, you'll always get reference. Otherwise you won't. So, uh, this is a picture. Can anybody guess what this could be? It's a random picture I put there. Sometimes pictures are confusing. This is not ortho -K. This is a refractive surgery patient. Surgeries were done on this patient and the cornea is, is highly irregular and we are now trying to fit a contact lens for this cornea. Thank you so much. Any questions? Oh, I get the meat. So you, after this, you said uh, you are sterilizing the lenses, right? Disinfecting. Disinfecting the lenses. Yeah. So which solution you are putting it in? In Boston Simplis. So uh, what about hydrogen peroxide? Don't you? We don't we don't get hydrogen peroxide in India as of now. We are expecting the solution launch soon. But if that is available, then that will be my first choice. Because in the US, uh, nothing is used except the uh, hydrogen peroxide. So the child removes the lens, put it in the hydrogen peroxide, shut it down. That's the best solution. Then morning you just take out because it neutralized, put the lens in, continue. It's actually more safer and much more convenient. Yes. And that is real disinfection. Yes. Uh, Boston Simplos will not disinfect. It will yeah. not allow bacteria to grow. That's it. Yeah. So that is why it is disinfection. Disinfection, some amount of bacteria still would be there, but it will be relatively safer to wear. Hydrogen peroxide, no doubt, is the best solution if it is available. That will be the last choice. And Boston Simplus may give a little bit of uh, toxicity because, uh, as, uh, and you said correctly, you wash it off. See, earlier what we used to do is uh, 
uh, we used to recommend the soft contact lens solution to be used with ortho -K. And uh, you know, we have a consent form wherein what solution needs to be used is also mentioned. So I used to mention soft contact lens solution or the brand of the solution. Until somebody pointed out if there's any legal issue, then you will be sued because this is a soft contact lens solution and you're giving it to an RGP patient. So there will be, there may be a legal hassle in doing this. So we discontinued that practice and we introduced rinsing of symptoms. So, uh, of course, no water to be used at any time. Never, right? never. So, but when there is a simplest like solution, which is more viscous, so that time we use uh, bio contact lens solution. Correct. So that will take care of, so if they, they are not using any water or not any other thing, but uh, you know, just a. Yeah. So that is why we use water for, for injection because it is available at unit dose. So safer. Safe. And no legal hassles. Yeah, so you never come any time. God forbid if there is an issue with one of the orthopedic cases, last Diwali, I still remember, uh, we have those flower pot injuries, you know, they burst in hand. So some part of it went in the eye and the patient thought, okay, it was a little bit of kachra, he washed it off and put on his orthopedic. There was a corneal inside. And he put ortho -K that aggravated. Next day, there was redness, there was pain. But still, patient thought it was nothing and slept second night. And then he had an ulcer. Atropine uh, combined with ortho -K. Uh, As of now, we have, I'm having a hard time convincing my ophthalmology friends to uh, co manage the case like this. First of all, I mean, I don't know how many of the are here. First of all, very few percentage of ophthalmologists is like to prescribe atropine. I mean, you are in Mumbai, everyone understands. I'm practicing in Nagpur, they're so confused about atropine. complication with they themselves are totally confused. And on top of that, I'm putting an ortho lens, which is like sleeping with the lens on bar day. So it might take some time. So in Mumbai, you started now, maybe in Nagpur, I'll start after a year. But that is what I would like to do if I really have to attack it in my opinion. Yeah, but after that time, I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, the start of my time there, we have to take time to prescribe atropine. People who regularly prescribe atropine, they even say that you can put the atropine and after one, one hour, the patient can wear the contact lens. In fact, some also have the minutes. Okay. Good, no, because daytime atropine is working better. So it serves the purpose. 0.01% daytime concentration. And yes. Vision care has. Okay, I haven't tried. Okay. Okay. Haven't tried. See, normally I'll tell you, I'm very careful when I'm selecting solutions. Though I am an Indian at heart, I prefer No, I have not used anything other than Boston Simples. Who said that? may be a solution which I need to try, yes. Which one? Okay. It's supposed to be a good solution. Can't do anything. They have to wear the glasses. They have to wear. So glasses also may not work 
So you might want to tell the patient to have a 50% prescription in glass and keep it ready. Everything will work for the patient. Of course, only on nights wherein the patient forgets to wear or cannot because the patient is sleeping or where else doesn't want to show her lenses or his lenses. I'm talking only of those instances. Otherwise, initial one week, all the infection stays on throughout the day. Then there is no issue. Some of the lucky people, I think you mentioned or Nitish mentioned or Bruce, some of the lucky people, they can sleep alternate nights and still have full correction. So I have one such patient. So she sleeps alternate night with the lens on and she's happy. And there is one patient who's uh, monocular minus one, the other is e metro. So she is very happy. Maybe Pernato, she has success vision. Are you explaining? I, I would agree with Nitesh that almost 90% of the patients need toric. And why not give it to everyone? Excellent. Toric lens is center better. All the problems get sorted out if you fit toric lenses. So we use RGP designer regularly to design toric lenses. This is again subjective, but generally six hours, six to eight hours is a good time. Yeah. It depends upon the power. It depends upon the corneal responder, how fast the cornea responds, but generally six hours to eight hours. And suppose that the patient only has six, six hours of sleep, and the correction is not going throughout the day, then you can cha change the Jessen factor and provide slightly more correction to account for the early reversal. So you can modify the lens design so that the correction stays for a longer time. That also can be done. No, that's what. Suppose if the correction is reversing, let's say in the evening at five o'clock and the patient wants clear vision up to nine, 10 o'clock, then you can change the lens design, increase the Jessen factor, so that the correction will stay till 10 o'clock. It's about the kids you had shown, so any kids who will not be sleeping in that position will not be a proper candidate. No, there may be an issue. It's not that there will always be an issue, but there may be an issue. And even the lag of the that I showed, you know. I believe there are some goggles. I did not read too much in detail, but again, there was a post on Facebook that some practitioner recommends those goggles. I suppose it will be something like a swimming goggle. I assume. I'm not very sure. So you sleep with those goggles on. But personally, I feel, you know, if things are more simple, then the patients would actually continue the treatment. If it is too cumbersome, they will give it up. One doctor recommended, actually it's the same patient, one doctor recommended taping the eye. The patient was so upset that she said, I will never go to that doctor and I will never come to you for 100 years. I mean, I can imagine putting a plaster on the eye. The kid was very, she was my youngest patient actually. Unfortunately, we had to abort it. She was six months old, six years old. So we shifted her to my pay controls of contact lens. Again, as I said, you know, if you keep it simple, then the compliance is there. If it is too complicated, after six months, the patient will say, don't want my glasses are fine. Because you know what can happen if the patient doesn't wear ortho okay. But they don't know, about it. they are bothered about today. They are not bothered about what will happen after 25 years. Very rarely I have used, this was one of the rare cases and we used OK Vision, Miracle Lens from Russia. No, it's available in Delhi. Yeah. And actually I luckily had the same power on my desk. So I just had to take the ortho -okay lens and give this back to her. Because she was my prescription and I had got these lenses for myself. Yes. You're talking about the orientation. You don't have to bother. If you're matching the curvatures, whatever way that you put the lens in, the lens will rotate and fit properly. Because it's a perfect match. It's a mirror image of the cornea. So the lens will rotate and set it up. No, no.
See here, how much ever you counsel, you know, the patient is not entirely convinced until I realize that my way of dealing with the patient is not as good as the way of dealing with the patient. You know what he does with respect to scleral lenses? First day, he will just put the lens in the eye without talking about the condition, without talking about the price, show the improvement, and later on talk about all these things. So I'm kind of experimenting right now with that. You know, there is a short trial for, for orthophil lenses in my practice, wherein we put the lens in the eye, let the patient sleep for one night, see the magic, and then talk about orthophil, and then they will become See, actually, orthopedic reversibility is an advantage. But in India, you're very right in saying it's perceived as a disadvantage. Because if I pay the same amount of money to a LASIK surgeon, then it's permanently corrected. But what about the other complications which are actually so much less in orthopedic? And plus, you have the advantage of reversibility. We need to counsel the patient that this is not a disadvantage, it's a disadvantage. Any other questions? Thank you so much. So we have uh, next topic of marketing tips. This is a wonderful talk. Uh, you will really enjoy it because this is, uh, he's actually using all the tricks that he's going to talk. Matthew Martin is wonderful uh, orator. He had been to India and uh, he's amazing uh, orthokeratologist. Uh, let us, uh, so he has sent me a video presentation because of the again time difference. So let us uh, hear his uh, presentation.
Hello, my name is Dr. Martin, and I am very excited and honored to have the pleasure of speaking at this event. Um, I'd like to thank Chandra as well as everyone else who's involved, and uh, I appreciate my opportunity to share what I think is obviously the best of all of the things that you can do at eye care. So I'm just very excited to be here today. Hello, my name is Dr. Martin, and I am very excited and honored to have the pleasure of speaking at this event. Um, I'd like to thank Chandra, as well as everyone else who's involved, and uh, I appreciate my opportunity to share what I think is obviously the best of all of the things that you can do at eye care. So I'm just very excited to be here today. So a little bit about me. So my name is Dr. Martin. I have been practicing orthokeratology and myopia control for well, more than 18 years now. Um, I'm a fellow of the International Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control. I'm involved in their fellowship committee. Um, I was briefly a board member of the academy as well. And I've been a fixture at boot camp with educating um, new uh, practitioners to the concepts of myopia control and to the concepts of orthokeratology specifically. So very excited, very honored to be here. And uh, I'm just so enthusiastic about sharing my knowledge. So let's do that. So today's agenda, we're gonna be talking about tips and tricks for marketing. So first we're gonna talk about internal marketing. And I think it's important to discuss the fact that internal marketing is by far and away the easiest place to get new patients for ortho K and for myopia control. And then we're going to talk a little bit about external marketing, getting to know um, people and getting people to, to be aware of your specialty. And then we'll also briefly talk a little bit about reaching out professionally to get other eye care practitioners to refer to you. So let's talk first about internal marketing. I think it's important with regards to internal marketing to look at internal marketing as a holistic view. And what I mean by that is I mean you want to start with a practice evaluation. You want to look at where patients come through your office. So we were going to start at the front. We're going to talk about reception. We'll talk about the role of technicians within the internal marketing system. We'll talk about the doctor's role in internal marketing. And then we're going to talk about um, just the whole concept of taking marketing from really the front door all the way through the entire practice. So let's talk a little bit about the reception area. So this is a, a typical reception area. And I think it's important to realize that there's a lot of things that can be going on in our reception area that is gonna prime the pump um, to get our patients excited about ortho K and myopia control. So one of the things that I believe everyone should do is I think you should take a testimonial for our patient, maybe who's already doing ortho K or myopia control in your office and make that a centerpiece of your reception area. So when people come in, they sit down, they're waiting a few moments, they get to look and see someone who's had success with your myopia control program previously. I think it's also important to have books um, that cover myopia control and orthokeratology. And it's also important to have brochures. Now we're gonna talk more about these things as we go along. What do you think is the most important thing in the reception area? In my opinion, the most important thing in the reception area is actually um, the television if you have one there. There's no reason that people should come into your office and they should be seeing anything but what you want them to see. So we're going to take a moment here and take a look at one of the videos that plays in our reception area.
Go serious, I look here. <laughs> So what's brilliant about having a video like this playing in your reception area is it does a couple of things. One of the things it does is it makes it a little less scary for patients to be in your office. It also starts to introduce them to the topics that are important for you. The last thing that you want is people watching some daytime television show or God forbid seeing commercials from one of the other eye care practices in your area. That television, if you have one in your uh, reception area, is just such a great opportunity for you to start programming and for you to start having the patients see the material that you want them to see in preparation for presenting information to them in the office. So that's just the reception area alone. So already we've had patients look at a poster. We've had patients pick up a book. We've had patients look at a brochure. Heck, we had patients watch basically an infomercial for us. That reception area is the place you want to kick off the whole program in your office. The next thing that we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about what things we have up there. So we talked a little bit about the poster. Posters are really easy to make. You take a picture of a patient, you take a testimonial from that patient, and then you can make a poster and hang it in your reception area. Brochures are really simple. The brochure here is one that my staff set up for me. It's just a simple trifold brochure. It has my information on it, and it's really simple and to the point. Here's some kids. Here's myopia control. Here's orthokeratology. We call that GVSS in our office. Here's information. There's a really great book called The Patient's Guide to Myopia Control that was put out by Rob Garowitz. There's a really excellent book out there called My Children Are Nearsighted by Dr. Despeditas. All of these are things that people can see in your reception area, pick up and start thinking about myopia control and orthokeratology. So the next step that patients are gonna go on on their adventure through our office is going to be the reception area. So in the reception area, the first thing that we want is we want to have an on hold message with a special greeting. So in our office, if you call, you receive a message that says, you've reached Dr. Martin's office. He's the area's leader in orthokeratology and myopia control. And then that meet, that greeting starts to prime the pump for people. They're waiting on the phone for you. They might as well be getting the message that you want them to get, okay? Um, again, the, the, my phone message is here on the left. But we're also going to have information that talks about myopia control. We'll have information that talks about GVSS. We'll have information that talks about comprehensive exam. And then when the receptionist answers the phone, she can say, are you calling to make an appointment for myopia control or GVSS, or are you calling to make an appointment for a comprehensive exam? So people who aren't familiar with the concept of myopia control or people who aren't familiar with the concept of orthokeratology can hear about it, and that will allow them later to ask questions that may be pertinent 
to planting those seeds for them. Okay, it's important that the staff knows how to educate patients. It's important that they know how to handle those questions, where to put them in the schedule if they're coming in for myopia control, and then the fees. When it comes to fees, I like my staff to be, I don't wanna use the term elusive, but I would like to say that I don't like to give fees until patients can come and sit down and we can talk about their case. So my staff is supposed to say, hey, if you're interested in orthokeratology and you wanna know the fees, let's set you up with a no charge evaluation so Dr. Martin can sit down with you and talk about what your options are. The next area that we're gonna do after leaving the, the reception area is we're gonna talk about um, technicians. So I have what are called co-op technicians in my office um, and they're pretty great, but you could just take the co-op off there and refer to your own technicians. I think it's important to fit your technicians in the office with orthokeratology, if you're doing ortho-K in your office, or at least to have them very well educated in myopia control. So oftentimes, both of my technicians will be ortho-K patients. So when they sit down with the, with the patient that comes into the office, they can say, hey, my name is Chris. I do orthokeratology. Are you here for myopia, ortho-K, glasses, contact lenses? You wanna, again, start programming patients to know that you're more than just a normal eye doctor. You are a myopia control specialist and you offer options other doctors don't even know about. So I think it's really important that your technicians be a part of that process, a part of that education process as well. It's also important uh, for your technicians to be um, able to take topographies for patients. So we can't do orthokeratology without taking topographies. If you're doing myopia control with peripheral defocused contact lenses, if you're doing uh, myopia control with atropine, you might be able to get away without a topographer. But if you're going to be doing orthokeratology, you absolutely have to have topography. So we collect topography on all contact lens patients as part of my contact lens evaluation. That does a couple of things. One of the things that it does is it allows us to charge extra for our contact lens evaluations because, you know, we're doing more. But more importantly, it also gives the doctor the opportunity to talk about how topography is important for orthokeratology or for myopia control. So I think that topography is just a great opportunity to introduce ortho-K when we talk about corneal curvatures because everyone likes pretty pictures. If you take a nice topography and you say to a patient, here's what your cornea looks like, here's one of the things that we can do as ortho-K where we actually mold that cornea. Even if the patient's not interested in ortho-K, it does plant the idea that there are other options out there. So now we're gonna talk about the doctor's role. So we talked about the front door. We talked about um, reception. You know, we, we talked about how when they sit in the reception area, they should be seeing your programming. They should be seeing posters. They should be seeing things that introduce ortho -K and myopia control. We talked about the technicians a little bit. We said, hey, you know, you're missing a bet if your technicians aren't introducing these subjects. Then now it's your turn. So you're there, you're doing the eye exam, you're grinding through options for patients. I think it's important that doctors should be asking patients, would you like to be free from glasses and contact lenses without surgery? A lot of patients will say, yeah, that sounds great. I would love to be free from glasses and contact lenses. Well, then maybe we should talk about fitting you an ortho -K. Another question that you can ask people is, do your kids play sports like hockey, basketball, football, swimming. If they do, maybe we should talk about fitting them in ortho case so they can be free from contact lenses or glasses as well. Um, I think it's important personally when we're talking about internal marketing to be uh, cognizant of time. And what I mean to say by that is sometimes patients aren't going to buy into it this year. They're not ready. They just got introduced to it. Maybe they saw the video in your reception area. They're a little unsure. I think it's important to remember that we're playing a long game here. When you see a person whose prescription is minus four, now is the time to talk, start talking about their children. Hey, I see you're a minus six. You know that it's very likely your kids are gonna be nearsighted. I just saw your wife for an exam. She was also highly nearsighted. 
Do you know that makes your kids much, much, much more at risk to be nearsighted if both parents are nearsighted? Um, I think it's important for you to start thinking about that. Maybe the kid's only two years old. Maybe the kid's only five. Well, it won't be long before they're six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old, and we need to be doing something about their situation. Um, you might want to ask, you know, do your kids have access to electronics and tablets? Are they dedicated students? Are they kids who tend to stay in a lot? All those are things that are going to add to the nearsightedness and will make them good candidates for your myopia control or your orthokeratology program. Again, remember, you're planting seeds for future patients, okay? Um, and I always like to start to tell uh, other doctors to start thinking about six months from now, a year from now, two years from now. You know, we need to be talking about your child is a minus one. Rather than wait a year, let's bring them back and let's get uh, a refraction in six months. If they go from a minus one to a minus 150, or they go from a minus one to a minus two, Man, that's something we need to be aware of. Um, when we have kids who are um, Plano, for instance, and they're five years old and, and, and they're not hyperopic, oh, maybe we should be thinking about getting an axial length because axial length measurements are going to help us predict the progression of their nearsightedness. You know, we need to be aware. Are they doing visual hygiene? Are they going outside? You know, what things are these kids doing and what can we do to start talking about myopia control, um, genetics, uh, what our options will be. Oftentimes, I'll give parents information, you know, orthokeratology, peripheral defocused contact lenses, atropine. Here's information. Your child is five. I know he doesn't need it at this time, but there's a high probability, given your nearsightedness and your uh, the other parent's nearsightedness, that they're going to need it. Here it is. Take it home with you. All right. Um, let's, talk in, let's talk about we talked about reception, we talked about technicians, we talked about things that the doctor can be doing to, to, to manage or to encourage people to start thinking about myopia control, peripheral decontact, uh, peripheral defocus contact lenses, ortho K and atropine. Now, let's say that we have a successful case. Let's say that, that a patient who sat in your chair asked to come in for a myopia control evaluation, and you did that myopia control evaluation, and the patient said, yeah, I want to do ortho K. So you fit that person in ortho K. Maybe it's a child, maybe it's adult. If that person is happy, that is the best place for you to garner future referrals from your happy patients. Whenever you have a happy patient, you need to ask for a referral, okay? Now, that referral could be um, a family member. It could be a child. It could be someone on a sports team. It is absolutely important to realize that those happy patients are the patients that are going to generate your referrals for you. So anytime I have a happy patient, I ask if they're happy, and they are, can I get a testimonial? Will they go on YouTube and give me a testimonial? We'll talk about that shortly. Will they let me do a poster? Will they let me get a family photo of them um, along with a couple of things saying, you know, that they're happy? If they do that, then again, we create posters from that. We create YouTube video con uh, content from that. It is very rare for me to have a happy myopia control or ortho K patient who doesn't want to share their story. These people are excited. It's awesome for them. And a lot of people want that. Oftentimes, I'll ask a young person, do you want to be posterized? And nine times out of 10, they're like, yeah, that'd be cool. So I make a poster for the reception area. Maybe it's a child throwing a baseball from the pitcher's mound. Maybe it's someone playing some other sport or um, doing some other thing that they love. And then when I'm done with that poster, I give that frame poster to the child, or sometimes I'll just make two copies and give them one. Because I think it's cool. I think it's fun for them, and they seem to love it. Um, don't forget to get a signed consent form, at least here in the United States. HIPAA is a thing. But if people are, are volunteering for the testimony, I rarely get any complaints about that. So if you get a happy patient, oftentimes they'll refer a friend to you. And what's cool about that is if you ask, they'll refer their kids. So I have families where I did adult ortho K, all right, and we were successful. 
And mom's like, you know, I think my kid would like this. And I'm like, that's fantastic. Oh, and by the way, my niece also is interested. And her friend who has a child is interested. Oh, and on top of that, one of the guys in one of my classes also said he might be interested. So what you see is this sort of chain of events. And it all begins with the doctor asking for referral. Do you know someone who would be interested in this? We're trying to get the word out. We're excited. And I see that you're excited about myopia control and ortho -K. Is there anyone in your life who that we can help out? And oftentimes it becomes this chain reaction where you've got all these interconnected families who are pursuing um, the things that you want them to pursue. Okay. So I think that's absolutely worth doing because it just goes on and on. And the nice part about refer referrals is that they can grow. You get one patient, then you get two, then you get four, then you get five. And sometimes that will go up and down. Some, some referrals will just be themselves. Sometimes you get two or three or four people from a referral. I mean, it can be really successful, but it starts with you asking, would you send us a referral? Okay. Now, how do I get new referrals? There's a couple of options for what I call referral bonus programs. The first thing that I want to talk about is never give a discount on your procedure fees unless it's a cash discount for paid in full. The reason I say that is once you start giving discounts on your myopia control or on your ortho K fees, what happens is that word gets out and everybody who comes in wants a discount. So I recommend against doing that. I don't think that's necessarily a good idea. Consider giving discounts on solutions. Sometimes what we'll do is we'll say, look, um, solutions will be discounted if you refer a patient to us. That's a way that you can do it. And that works pretty well. Um, another excellent choice is to offer a discount towards their yearly maintenance fee. So every year in our office, patients get a new set of retainers along with all their solutions, plungers, and all the things they need in order to make ortho -K, um, happen. We also see that with myopia control and atropine. And sometimes we'll give them a discount towards that yearly fee. Never the procedure fee itself, but towards those yearlies or maintenance fees. Okay, most importantly, and I can't emphasize this enough, don't forget to bonus your staff. Because if your staff is unhappy, if your staff doesn't feel like you're taking care of them, then that's not going to be good for anybody. Okay, here um, is a really great testimonial. I do lots of YouTube testimonials. Patients come in, they're perfect 2020, they're happy. I'm like, hey, you want to give me a YouTube testimonial? Yeah. I just take a phone, I record them. You know, this particular patient drives like uh, two hours one way to see us. You know, he just wanted to talk about how happy he was. It's easy, it's simple, it's formulaic. If you go on the YouTube page for Auburn Optical, again, that's A-U-B-R-N, A-U-B-U-R-N, Optical, Auburn Optical. And I would very much encourage you to do this. Take a look at our YouTube videos. We have YouTube videos that are testimonials, we have YouTube videos that are my, um, my co-op technicians. It's got some really great stuff on there, and I would encourage you to take a look at it. Again, it's Auburn Optical YouTube page. So again, when it comes to your YouTube, and you'll see my YouTube testimonials, just really keep them simple. You can also do more professional testimonials. This is a more professional testimonial that we had done. This is one that plays in our reception area as well. So I'm not gonna make you watch this whole thing again because it was tied to that video earlier, but I want you to notice the lighting here. It's nice and bright. She's a nice, bright, shiny, and pleasant person. She's talking about a sport right there. So you know that it was important to her. I think it's, I think it's important when you're doing a testimonial video to make sure that the person's enthusiastic, to make sure that you're keeping it simple. And then what's great about that video content and what I think is really great about social media is you can take those videos, upload them to your Google Drive. That's the first thing I have my staff do whenever we take a video. Then 
they post it on YouTube. Very easy. Post it on YouTube. It goes on YouTube. Then it goes onto our Facebook page. And if you haven't friended me on Facebook, you should. It's Matthew J. Martin. I'm on Facebook. Check it out. Once it goes to Google Drive, then it goes to YouTube, then it goes to Facebook. And then I don't do too much with it, but you can do a lot with Instagram. You can do a lot with Twitter. Once you've got that original, simple testimonial content, push it out there to all those places because it's easy to do once you made it. And, and it's really, it's easy to share. And the more it gets out there, the better it is for you and the better it will be for myopia control and ortho -K as a whole, okay? Sometimes I will even have a new patient speak to a person who is already doing myopia control or ortho -K. The trick with this is you have to make sure that the person that you're going to have them call, number one, knows someone's going to call them and make sure that the person that they're going to call is comfortable with that. Some people are not comfortable sharing information like that. Some people are. I would tell you that the vast majority of my ortho K and my myopia control patients are so enthusiastic about the stuff we're doing for them that most of them are very, very motivated to share their experience. But sometimes that can be very reassuring for a new patient who is interested in pursuing one of the specialty things in your office. I think it's also important to consider hosting a seminar on myopia control. Seminars are something of a difficult undertaking for some doctors. We have done a fair amount of seminars um, and we have had some pretty good success with it. I think it's important to take a seminar um, within the context of uh, the internal marketing you're doing. So when patients come in, you're giving them the information. Hey, I'm doing a seminar. If you're interested, come out. We've had as many as 20 people show up. We've had as many as three people show up. So you just need to be aware that if only three people show up, you're still going to be doing that seminar for three people. Okay. And that kind of looks a little bit like this. You want to choose a weeknight after school. You want it to be not too late in the evening. You want to make sure that you invite parents who are already doing ortho K. So let's say that I have someone in my office who already does ortho K and they're interested in sharing. I will invite them um, to my seminar so that the Patients who are interested in ortho K or myopia control can speak to that person who's already doing ortho K or myopia control. Um, I think it's also important to invite people from outside the office. Sometimes I'll put up something at the restaurant next door. Sometimes I'll post it um, at a, uh, a, a board maybe where community events are happening so that people can come in and get educated in the specialty care that we do at our office. So it's important to feed them. Don't get fancy. It doesn't need to be a full meal, just some little, little food things that they can do. I like to put up a simple PowerPoint so that uh, the patients, when they're sitting there, can look at what I'm talking about. And I have uh, gone through a number of different variations on that. The key with a PowerPoint, especially when you're talking to patients, is to keep the slides simple. For example, the slide I have right now has a lot of wording on it. I would never use a slide like this um, on a lay person because they would be completely lost. You want to make sure that um, what you're doing is very easy for them and very simple for them and uh, that they can get all the information they need. So it's important when you have a test, uh, when you're doing a seminar like this to remember that the seminar will easily pay for itself, okay, which is awesome, but that it also, you're not looking for necessarily a lot of patients. If you get 10 patients that show up and you sign up three myopia control or ortho K patients, that is a total win, okay? If you have a seminar with 10 people and no one signs up, that can still be a win because you're still giving information Maybe that person will decide not to do it, but they'll talk to their neighbor, they'll talk to their coach with the, that their kids are involved in, and it starts to propagate and starts to get knowledge of what you do as a specialty practice out there to the world. And again, success <coughs> at one of these seminars is about two or three new fits per seminar. Now, going back and summarizing again, we talked about 
the front door. We talked about reception. We talked about the receptionist. We talked about co-ops or technicians. We talked about the doctor. We talked about what to do when we have happy patients, how to make referrals, how to make YouTube videos, how to do testimonials and posters. We talked about putting on a seminar. Now, let's talk about things the doctor can do and things the staff can do and how to reach out to other doctors. And this is a very tricky subject. Other doctors can be very difficult to reach out to. Um, the first thing that I try to do with these is I try to set up a lunch or a treat um, for a fellow doctor. This can be difficult, but I think the first thing to do is to pick up the phone and say, hey, I'm doing orthokeratology and myopia control, and I would love to sit down with you and lunch over lunch and talk about this, okay? And you should always treat for this. And you should approach it as in, hey, I'm doing this, are you interested in this? And would you like any education that I can help you with the subject? You need to make sure that you're giving them information and not demanding patience from them, okay? You wanna make sure you meet their needs first and only after meeting their needs should you ask for referrals. And I'm here to tell you that this is difficult. I recently reached out to a couple of different doctors and got the cold shoulder. Um, it's important to continue to try to reach out to other doctors. If you can get other doctors on board, it can be very successful. I have a couple of doctors that refer to me and it is wonderful for business. Patients come in, they've been educated by the other doctor already. They know what I'm gonna talk about. There are, the, the, the pump has already been primed. Um, it does take a little extra effort to do this, but absolutely, pick up the phone, send an email, call and reach out. And also don't forget the staff. If you have staff and you're going to take the doctor out, bagels, donuts, the way to a staff's heart is through their stomach and swag, you know, mugs, brochures, gift certificates, you know, any of that stuff that you can do, um, the staff loves, right? Any, any a comprehensive exam to another eye doctor staff might not be successful, but it would definitely be sex, su su yeah, successful for a pediatrician's office or to a general practitioner. Also make an easy method for getting referrals. If you're asking a general physician or a pediatrician for a referral, consider strongly putting together some referral cards, okay? Or some pads with a simple means of communication. So I would give a general physician a pack of cards that say, um, referral for myopia control. And they just have to tear one off and give it to the patient. And it has the information for the patient to call me so that we can make that. You wanna make the hurdle between the doctor making the referral and the patient coming to you as low as possible. You wanna make that a really smooth and easy transition. And referral pads can be successful in that direction, okay? The big thing that I want you to think about is to be patient, okay? When you're reaching out to other physicians, when you're reaching out to other eye doctors, it can take a while. Sometimes you'll feel like you're just trying and trying and trying and you're not getting any response. Be patient. They will start making referrals, but it's difficult for other healthcare professionals sometimes to make that leap or to make that, uh, that referral, it can be difficult for them, especially for other eye doctors. It's very difficult for other eye doctors to consider referring someone outside of their practice for specialty care. So you just have to be patient with them, okay? Okay, we talked a little bit about uh, referring to other eye doctors. You may find your colleagues are not interested in treating or even considering the ramifications of myopia control. On that note, congratulations to you as a doctor listening to this lecture. So many of our colleagues across the nation and across the world are just not interested in myopia control and not interested in putting out the extra effort to help their patients. So. Just be aware that you may have to work a little harder in order to get other doctors to be aware of this. I think the fact that we as a nation uh, and as a world 
um, in, in India, in China, and in all these places, the fact that we're all getting more involved in myopia control is definitely going to be helping you to get those referrals. But just be aware that um, it may be a little difficult, okay? So we talked a little bit about that. Always offer to educate other doctors. Do you know about myopia control? Are you interested? Do you know about ortho -K? How can I help? Um, you wanna make sure that you are helping them as much as you can because that's where they will feel more comfortable with you and then maybe wanna make referrals to you, okay? You may wanna consider a co-management relationship. We are taking some of the fees for myopia control or orthokeratology, but not all the fees. Some doctors can be very apprehensive um, about losing money um, to uh, other doctors when they make a referral. So just be aware um, that that's something that you may wanna do. So I have patients who drive a, a, a number of distances to see me. Some people drive from several hours away. And so sometimes what I'll do is I'll see them for their myopia control plan, but I'll, I won't take all of the fee I normally take. And I'll say, look, I want you to see Dr. So-and-so who's back in your hometown. And that doctor can take a look at your cornea. He can take a look at your atropine. He can take a look at your orthokeratology or your peripheral defocus contact lenses. And then he's going to receive a fee for that. And then he will communicate back with me. This is a good thing for getting referrals from doctors because it makes it feel like you're not stealing from them, okay? Also be aware that there are some legal ramifications associated with this in some places. I don't know how that pertains to your particular area, okay? Um, again, don't hesitate to reach out long distance um, to find ortho -K and myopia control patients. Um, sometimes doctors who are a distance away will be more comfortable referring to you. Okay, I think it's important to make sure that we're giving back to other doctors um, and making sure that we're doing the best to support our community um, and some of the things that we can do in that direction um, is to offer to educate the doctor who's making that referral and to make sure that you're educating patients even if they choose not to do myopia control with your office, okay? All right. It's a new day in eye care. People are starting to get excited about myopia control and ortho -K, and there's never been a better time to, to renew your commitment to your patients and your profession. I hope that today's ideas on marketing are something that you can take home with you to help you to grow your myopia control and specifically your orthokeratology practice, okay? And my last thought for you is let's go out and change the world. Let's go out and make it a better place. And that starts by slowing down the myopia of these children. And that starts by you being a specialty um, care practitioner. It's been an honor and a pleasure to meet you and work with you today. My name is Dr. Martin. You can reach out to me at auburnoptical at gmail um, with any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Ajit, are you there? Yeah. So, uh, of course, we have been discussing uh, throughout. So, uh, if you have any questions, doubts, uh, Ajit, uh, you want to comment anything more because this is a, uh, a practice management se session. We already discussed, but any other particular question anybody wants to say? Because I want purposely kept it after his talk so that you got some more ideas and if you want any other tips or anything that you want to ask because of course that was his american perspective in india it's a different thing right Correct. Because see, unless and until you tell other people that you are doing this, how they are going to know. So you have to tell, uh, make awareness. So uh, if you remember, Yashwanta, I told you about means how I became 
more uh, what do you say uh, available to patient is i went on television i put advertisement in newspaper magazines uh, social media of course nowadays social media is free right so use that let people know that you are a specialist what is it you are a even when you are talking if you can ask them see most of you are optometrist and you are definitely getting a child for you know refraction and everything just doing during that you can always tell that option is there that you can see without glasses i'll tell you most of the parents in fact they came for a child but they become the, the parent become my patient because oh this is very good idea because the, uh, nobody likes wearing spectacles but they are afraid of lasik or whatever so this is the best option so one leads to another so i think i'll share with you what uh, i am doing and what has worked for me <clears throat> in every city there are there is a set of ophthalmologists who would appreciate the optometrist work so i've made a whatsapp group of uh, those ophthalmologists and any and every interesting case that we do whether it is uh, for ortho k myopia management or spectacles or fenel prism or artificial eye i keep posting those cases so it's an interesting read for them also they know where optometry is going these days and just day before yesterday i can show you this message we fitted the peli prism for one of the patients and i posted that on facebook also and about six or seven ophthalmologists sent me a message that we have a case we will send you the patient so that is how the practice grows so that has immensely benefited then i realized that myopia control counseling can go up to almost like 30 40 minutes so we experimented exactly what dr mathur martin did we announced to all our prospective patients about myopia control and ortho k and we are having a meet in this hotel and 100 people came 100 and as he very rightly said you know it pays for itself because out of those 100 right on day 1 we had seven patients so one patient covered for all the expense and six were profit so i've realized that rather than counseling on one one to one basis if you have group counseling sessions so that was like in a proper hotel but later on then we shifted to our clinic so every time we call five set of parents so if she has a question but she is hesitating to ask some other parent may ask the same question and her query gets answered so that builds up the confidence so these two things have really helped me in my practice hello um uh, i was less professional than uh, matthew and yashwant in marketing my own self and um, i still believed that traditional uh, things would work and to each and every myo i would talk to that person that these are the options available and believe me for uh, uh, at least a year and a half i kept on counseling patients and uh, we have a large uh, opd practice being at uh, a remote area we see around 60 patients average per day and uh, still for one and half year none of my patients said yes i am willing to uh, do it and there was one patient you know i was super excited i wanted to do everything for them that girl and i do not know what clicked what happened within a month's time i did six patients one month for one and half year i was kept i kept on convincing convincing i thought that i was able to do it but as rightly pointed out by so many people patience does work and uh, excellent thing about that is that each and every patient of mine has now sent me at least one or two patients which are in the pipeline so that that grows fantastically well because this is a new concept for many of us optometrists many of the ophthalmology and optometry community even the 
optical shop owners and they do not know and when this person says that abhi mera chashma nikal gaya to people do know are you wearing a contact lens and he or she proudly says no <laughs> i am not wearing anything you know that works that patient's mouth to mouth publicity works wonders apart from that i am not saying that it is enough and um, that is the only way to market there are methodical ways by which you can uh, do it because that initial spark initial exposure is required to be a bang you know you cannot meekly say that this is one of the option and uh, nobody will get convinced so uh, a professional talk like that in a uh, hotel or a restaurant or you, in your own clinic secondly i realize that uh, because we go to our own clinic every day there may be a loose plaster somewhere and the paint worn off and something like that but we get used to it uh, this was told to me by one of my friends who asked me how frequently do you change your car and what is the expense so we calculated and then he asked me last i i am practicing since 1987 uh how many times have you changed your chair on which you sit for 12 hours how many times you have changed it to a professional chair or a new one new set you can do that maths for yourself we very you know we are very Uh, non enthusiastic about changing that environment but once i realize that i make it a point to change the environment every 2 years change it people appreciate that change okay like you me everybody we want to have that change even in our dressing in our whatever but that change has to be a subtle change with so many things which are common so your place may be common but the environment is different and people start coming to you with more enthusiastic approach uh the only thing which i am using about uh, the matthews will is um, video presentations in my opd i have a very large screen on which i have written at the bottom that this is not for you to use every day okay <laughs> so <laughs> tv is there and then i keep on uh, putting my videos or my surgical videos my uh, uh, testimonials and other things and that works wonders um people ask you less amount of questions so your chair time is less they already have answers to so many things you don't have to keep on teaching them about insertion removal cleaning and everything you do it once with all the proper arrangements and setup and keep it on on and on and on 10 12 15 20 videos running after one another and that helps a lot all the questions are answered just before the patient walks in and you the best thing you can do i do not know whether you all do it or not like when you are looking towards me when i told you something you smiled okay that is what you should wear often on your face and explain everything in details even when it is a child as if because that person that even small child has the right to decide okay otherwise so many things are forced on that child ki aapko yahi karna hai okay you give that option and that child may not be able to tell you but that child is very happy that he is part of that decision making he goes home pesters the parents say that i want this next day morning they will come kya aapne bataya isko ya abhi isko yahi karna hai so there are few initial tips but uh, i strongly believe that though uh, 
Shekhar has uh, put on a panel. All of us are practicing at our own places and we are successful because we are individually different and we have our own successful methods. So uh, if, if the time permits, uh, in a minute or so, you can think about what is the idea which clicked in your own practice. Write down that this is the idea which clicked and we can all collect those ideas like what I shared. You can all also share that this is the idea I feel clicked in my practice or opposite. This is the idea which I tried, but it did not click. Collective individual uh, experiences would give a lot of encouraging answers, which we can readily follow. So my suggestion to you is instead of, you know, uh, talking to each other like a panel and you ask me a question or ask him a question, we all can share and enrich ourselves so that uh, uh, within five years, the practice grows so well that everybody buys a Mercedes. Okay. And if you have one, buy two. <laughs> See, it's, it's very easy to answer his question. Why after one case was successful, six others followed. I'll tell you the answer. Because internally, he was convinced that this works. And once you are convinced that it works, the way you counsel is completely different. I still remember the first LASIK machine which came into India. It was at LB Prasada Institute. And we opened the machine and the consultant, one of the best cataract surgeons and a very well-known surgeon, he was given in charge of that machine. And first patient he counseled, he asked me, Yashwan, do you think this patient will go in for LASIK? I said, no. He said, even I don't think. But why did this happen? I said, because you yourself are not convinced about it. So he says, you bloody fellow, you're right. Now you know who the consultant was because he said bloody fellow. <laughs> so then, then they changed the counseling person and then it picked up. So unless and until you are convinced, I don't know how many people sell Maui gems here. Anybody who sells Maui gem? How do you sell it? You're so passionate about selling that sunglass because they have actually struck the right chord with their uh, account holders. What they do is first sunglass, they give it to you. So that's a complimentary sunglass, whether it is Plano or whether it is powered. So when you wear it and you experience the comfort, then that counseling comes from within. We are so passionate about selling Maui gems that so many other sunglass companies came, we said, we don't want. So if you believe in the product, your counseling would actually help you to get more patients. So now you know ortho K works, so you'll get many more patients. When he talked about time, I just want to share one quick experience. Uh, initial days of my counseling, you know, patients used to say, no, we're not interested. We are happy with our regular lenses. And my next question used to be, do you have eight minutes? Do you have eight minutes to spare? If I asked you, do you have eight minutes to spare? What would your answer be? Yes, because it's such an odd question. Why eight minutes? Eight minute mein kya karne wale hai? And uh, we started our practice with Paragon CRT trial set. And Paragon had made a beautiful video which lasted for eight minutes. So the moment you say, you know, eight minutes, they would say, okay, TK, kya karna hai eight minutes mein? Watch this video. And nine out of 10 patients who watch that video, they will come inside and say, okay, we don't mind trying, let's try. So make a beautiful video and make it for odd time like that four minutes or six minutes or seven minutes and just inquire, do you have seven minutes? Why don't you watch this? It helps. So, I won't be able to finish in eight minutes. No? <laughs> well, uh, I always give an example like you want to have a idli vada sambar. In Mumbai, you get on a you know tea stall also 
you go in Udupi hotel. So tea stall on the road will be like 20, 30 rupees. You go in Udupi hotel, maybe 50, 70 rupees. You go to Taj, 200, 500 rupees. It's the same rice, same thing, right? But what is different? The atmosphere, hygiene, professionalism, same thing matters. It depends on how ambient your practice is. Of course, you have to be knowledgeable. You should know exactly what you're doing and all. But this thing also matters, right? The same patient, if I look in a, a you know, shabby clinic, will never pay me 1,50,000 rupees. Okay. Yashwant, how much do you charge for uh, ortho K? 50,000. My charge is 1,20,000. He's also giving the same lens. I'm also giving the same lens, right? Priti, how much we charged? 80, 90 is the lowest. So it depends on how you place yourself. To justify the cost, Okay, he is also giving the same product. I am also giving the same product, right? But what is the difference apart from the ambience? See, I attend at least six conferences in a year. Out of that, three conferences in the US and three in India. You have spent money and attending this conference, right? So you have paid for the registration fees, which is nothing, but you have paid for it. You have traveled, you have stayed in a hotel. So count that how much you are spending this is for your education, but this education is going to help to your patient. So same thing. If you think that I'm worth so much, I have invested so much money in my education, you will charge that much because it has to come from inside. You just can't say that, oh, okay, Chandrasekhar is charging so much, I'm also going to charge. It's not going to work. But if you create the similar atmosphere, same, I, I don't know, uh, um, if, if you see my clinic in some videos or somewhere, you'll realize that it, it doesn't look like a eye clinic or something. It looks like a posh office. You know, it's looked like you, if you go in KM hospital, you, you already feel sick because of that smell and you know, everything. So, but if you prepare your office or clinic in such a way that they feel that, Oh, wow. So sitting in that soft chair, the patient only, he himself calculates, like as you calculate when you're sitting in five-star hotel, so same thing. So he's, when he's getting that cold breeze on his face, you know, he sees everything nice and clean. Somebody's offering him tea, coffee or something like that. There's a big screen going on. So automatically they themselves calculate and this is not a necessity, right? This is a choice they have made. If it is a must thing, then of course, like when I started scleral lenses, I was charging 360,000 rupees, right? But not everybody will pay that much. And I also know that not everybody can afford, but I was the only person in whole of India to give this treatment. And if I say no, then it doesn't justify. So I have given free also. Right. That's how I started training people so that you also do so that now I can say, if you want treatment from me, this is my charge. If you, if you, if you can't afford, okay, go to LV Prasad or go to some X, Y, Z. Right. So same way you decide. And now if everybody is doing ortho case, so you decide your price. This is what is my cost. And uh, see, unless and until you make a profit, you are not going to feel like doing it. So in optical industry, our industry, usually it is into three or into four. That is a simple calculation to start with. But then you are giving a freebies or if you are giving a package like a global fee. So you are taking, it's like an insurance. But you are taking a risk. Child may lose the lens in two months, three months, you still have to replace. Or uh, same lens can continue for one and two years, same thing. So you plan your strategies. You decide where you want to be you know, call yourself into and start. It's, it's your choice. And how much instrument are you putting in? How much staff you have? How much electricity? How much space? So everything has to be factored into. It is not the cost of that lens you're buying from someone. But, you know, there are so many other indirect costs involved. So you calculate all those and say, this is the cost and uh, 
go ahead with it like ajit said you make videos is it easy to make videos no right of course you can definitely make videos from you, uh, your phone but it won't be professional so if you want to have that impact you know that 8 minute video what he said it is not made by him it was made by paragon paragon cit usa right yes so to make a you know that 8 minute video it cost almost 2 lakh 3 lakh rupees so same thing but you can definitely make it it again nothing is impossible see i went on television every year in fact they used to invite me after first year that television interview went to you know rural area because that time there was no cable only that dish and uh, you know doordarshan hello doctor mostly in the evening uh, that dr mahesh chitnis will come he became my friend now uh, because you know my program became so popular so every diwali he will call me and nay sir tum sab interview paaje of course first time this is secret first time i had to pay him to invite me nothing is free advertisement is paid okay whatever you see uh, in the newspaper in the magazine everything is paid advertisement you can use that people don't know that, that it is paid they they read anything black and white people will believe so you know, there is a in times of india thursday you get a medical uh, page i think fourth or fifth so there are like four or five doctors are featured so you put your name you do this 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 thing free advertisement on facebook you can do but facebook nobody takes you seriously unless you are something really different but if you do this you know midday or any local newspaper or anything definitely it it's a you know way to succeed and of course you should be knowledgeable you should means once the patient comes to you then it's up to you to give a good treatment and then convert that patient into a happy patient happy patient is important then it it will start another thing what you can do is uh, go to the nearest school in, during that parent teacher meeting or uh, another thing what you can do is meet a principal and say i want to give donation he'll be happy everybody wants donation right not much like 5000 10000 rupees donation but uh, i want to talk to your uh, you know uh, in your uh, association parent teacher he'll be happy to give you 5 minutes and there you can give a small presentation about what can be done what is the problem see even if you see my program how i started i made you aware that this is what can happen right you can lose the eye not everybody is going to lose the eye right but you should know what is the problem and then how to control and how to solve not everybody will go for it but at least even if you can convert about 10% of the population it's success Yes, uh, about the talking in school, grab every opportunity you can have. There was a solar eclipse few years ago, and I had made list of all the schools, and we had made four teams from my own hospital, and uh, I set all the four teams, including myself, to each and every school to talk free as to how safely you can watch solar eclipse. what kind of goggles you should use and etc no advertisement okay but that each and every child from each and every school went home to say ki limaye i hospital se hame safety instructions mile that name reached say 10000 homes so you you click on some opportunity you can have and uh, it may not be working on the next day but it does work it does work and regarding advertisement also there is uh, you should never stop advertising that is what i believe tatas and godrej and others still keep on advertising saying that this is the new product and every time though we all have seen cars on the road still the tata advertise that this is our car this is nexon and this is exa and this is that nothing bad in uh, ethical advertising okay so don't shy away from uh, saying what you are 
that is uh, what i believe anybody wants to say anything i request please everybody volunteer take part see this is not a very formal kind of setup so the whole please. idea is to you know interact talk make new friends and you know exchange ideas please come forward a minute for each and just say something which clicked in your own practice or we can take the mic no no kena bhai this is bahut better bahar se any koni koni lok bakta hai so it is better here i think ajit uh, will do that tomorrow sure. during uh, you know general this thing because it's almost 6 uh, okay, okay. 6 o'clock we have one But more presentation my, my request to you is to uh, maybe you should write it down and yes, bring it tomorrow uh, you know one idea that you think uh is good and then we'll debate over that use the night to you know actually uh, write down 1 2 3 4 points so that we have an entertainment can... program and i still have to finish one talk at least and you know there was a practical session also but that we'll do it tomorrow with clearer lens but today i'm going to show you uh, the lenses and everything hands on and tomorrow we'll actually put it in somebody's eye so we'll find someone Okay, so I'll take the next presentation, and then we'll proceed. So, Sayantan Biswas is a PhD and a research scientist at Singapore Eye Research Institute. This is the one of the best institute for animal research, whatever drugs drops. medicine that you get uh, in pharma has to be attested in uh, anim on animals and not many animal labs are allowed or not available but singapore is the only you know country where they have a a fantastic animal lab and uh, it's uh, you know all the drugs are been tested there so he's been uh, uh, you know working on something which i can't disclose but uh, he has very good experience and knowledge and uh, he has shared uh, because right now he is busy with his uh, research projects so he has sent me a, a video again uh, so i'll play that and if he is available he will join us for the discussion hello everybody we are going to discuss today about the current research trends in myopia control i would like to add in a short background of why it is important myopia has reached epidemic levels across the world 70 to 90% of young adults in the age range between 15 to 25 years has myopia in east and south east asia of which around 14 to 18% have high myopia what is more worrisome is that out of the high myopic eyes around 30% have pathological myopia and this prevalence of pathological myopia increases exponentially as a function of age with the elderly population at a greater risk what is pathological myopia is high myopia which is more than minus 5 diopters associated with staphyloma or outpouching of the eyeball the thinning of the retina choroid and skull walls associated with the outpouching is probably caused by the biomechanical forces generated due to the axial elongations the signs of pathological myopia are tessellation of the fundus when the underlying cord vessels becomes visible which normally doesn't happen diffuse choroidal atrophy or thinning of choroid with a yellow lesion at posterior pole patchy choroidal atrophy associated with loss of rp lacquer cracks or irregular lines in posterior fundus indicating break in the rp brooks membrane choriocapillary complex and the last is the myopic choroidal neovascularization which causes most frequent and maximum loss in vision However, some authors have suggested to change the name of myopic CNV to myopic macular neovascularization, as the origin of neovascularization is not always the correct. Coming back to our main topic of interest, projections estimate 50% of the world population will be myopic, and 10% will be highly myopic. The retinal signs of pathologic myopia we saw must have convinced you by now that it is associated with a huge risk of vision impairment and blindness. Hence, there is a need. For early prevention control of myopia and is crucial to prevent vision loss later although there several strategies been targeted through research the common strategies for myopia control are with special design lenses atropine timespan outdoors light therapy and orthocatalogy 
I'll be discussing the first four as orthocatalogy is not my domain of expertise and there are several experts in the symposium to talk about orthocatalogy. It's not easy to summarize everything within 30 minutes, so please pardon me if I miss anything specific. To begin, this figure is crucial to understand the change in shape of the eyeball and the retina of myopic eyes. Figure A at the top is of a prolate myopic retina, where the central refraction is focusing at point C in front of retina, causing myopia, whereas the peripheral refraction P focuses behind the retina, causing hyperopia. Remember, the normal cornea also is steeper at the center with greater power and flattens towards the periphery as its power reduces. Whereas figure B is of an oblate emetropic eye, where central P is focused at retina, but the peripheral refraction P is in front of retina, causing a relative myopia. So to correct this problem, a custom-made lens known as DIMS or Defocus Incorporated Multiple Segments was tried in Hong Kong. It has a central optical zone of 9 mm to correct the distance refractive error and a peripheral annular zone of 33 mm diameter containing relative positive power of plus 3.5 adapters in multiple segments of 1.03 mm diameter each. For example, if the patient's distance refractive is minus 6 adapters, the segment will have power of minus 6 plus 3.5 which equals to minus 2.5 adapters. What this design is doing is it is providing myopic defocus at periphery, which is like getting focused in front due to positive power and clear vision at all viewing distance. Children aged 8 to, 8 to 13 years were followed with this glass for 3 years and after 2 years, the control group without dim lens was switched to dim lens. The blue line in this figure shows the effect of dim lens, which reduces axial length elongation as well as myopic refractive error progression compared to the red line of the control group. The dotted line shows the change in control group when switched to the dim lens. Next comes atropine eye drops. Although there are multiple studies on the effectiveness of atropine on myopic control, the LAM study conducted in Hong Kong is of particular interest due to its robust methodology. Atropine of three concentrations, which are 0.05%, 0.025% and 0.01%, and a fourth one, which is placebo eye drop of 0.9% salt solution, were randomly tested on Hong Kong Chinese children aged 4 to 12 years with bilateral myopia of at least one diopters and showing progression of at least 0.5 diopters in the last year. They received one drop of the eye drop randomly allocated to them every night and were followed up for every four months for two years. To reduce glare and excessive light exposure, they were also given photochromic glasses when needed. They found an age-dependent effect of atropine with older age showing better treatment response compared to the younger ones. Also, higher concentration of atropine was found to have a better response in controlling myopia. Younger children need higher concentration to achieve the same reduction as older children with lower concentration. For example, myopic progression of a 6-year-old with 0.5% is similar to 8-year-old with a lower concentration of 0.05% and 10-year-old with even lower concentration of 0.01%. Therefore, treatment on younger myopic children with greater risk of progression should be more aggressive with 0.04% atropine. However, atropine has been criticized on various grounds. First, excellent changes were not significantly different among all the treatment groups. That means the dose response effect is not very distinct or clear among the treatments. There is a lack of efficacy in slowing excellent length elongation to the refractive rate change. That means although the myopic progression is reducing, excellent is not. Thus, atropine has been postulated to work through extreme cyclability of the ciliary muscles, producing an apparent reduction in refractive progression. Thus, we need to prove no, there is no rebound effect when the application of atropine stops. Current data is insufficient to draw any such conclusion. Next is time spent outdoors. Although there are hundreds of studies, starting with the one done by Catherine Rose in 2008, studying the effect of time spent outdoors in myopia, I'll discuss the findings from the recent ones only. So this interesting study done in Australia is a follow-up of children aged 6 to 12 years during 95 to 1999 after several years when now they are 24 to 30 years of age during 2015 to 19. They concluded that those children who spend more time outdoors during childhood back in 95 has less myopia in adulthood in recent times. Another cross-sectional study evaluated the effect of near work, screen time and outdoor time activity among children in China, Hong Kong, and Singapore. They found increased reading and writing and decreased outdoor time to be associated with myopia. Screen time may be a surrogate factor of near work or outdoor time, but not independent risk factor of myopia. The Gusto study assessed time outdoors, light exposure patterns, and outdoor activity among nine-year-old Singapore children and found that 
is self-reported time to spend outdoors is protective against myopia, but not any kind of light level or specific light measures. A prolonged, a multi-pronged approach, that is several small units of time outdoors, was recommended to increase the total time outdoors to combat child myopia. So if you take an overview of all the studies, systematic reviews and meta-analysis of the time spent outdoors, we'll find that time spent outdoors is protective against myopia development and increased near work is related to high risk of myopia development. However, they are not related to the reduction of myopia progression among existing maps. They can only protect against myopia development. Once it happens, they cannot reduce the progression. Physical activity has no effect on the myopia and needs to be separated from time spent outdoors. They are not the same. However, this studies have several limitations like parental response bias and recall bias to questions on the screen time of children, heterogeneity or diversity in the study designs, etc. Moreover, several studies have associated near work with myopia, but we must remember that association doesn't mean causality, as children having myopia may be restricted indoors and forced to do near work and not the other way around. We need more RCTs to investigate the risk factors as digital screen time, near work, time outdoors to get a clearer picture and to estimate the threshold or duration of outdoor exposure needed to reduce the myopia progression and by how much amount. Although a study in China, a RCT study in China has suggested 40 minutes of time to be a minimum daily time spent outdoors, probably we need a stronger and repeatable evidence from another population and countries as well to decide on it. Next comes light therapy. A small cohort of healthy young adults aged 20 to 29 years were exposed to 1000 lux of blue green light for 30 minutes for 7 days at 7 am in the morning. The subfill corridor is uh, getting thin, thickened with the light exposure after 7 days. Following which, Zhongshan of Therm Center in China is currently testing a red light therapy on myopic children. Children are using a light therapy device for 3 minutes per session, 2 times a day against a control group who are not receiving any treatment. All the results are not published yet. Preliminary results uh, such shows that they are effective in controlling both excellent and myopia. No other structural, retinal, or functional like visual acuity changes or in adverse events were noted. However, the study is limited by only red light and no other light groups, lacking another group with other spectrum of light. Moving on to myopia animal groups. Several animals have been used to create animal models of myopia, which helps us in understanding of myopia to a great extent. We now know that if a normal eye is covered with a diffuser or a minus lens, the little image loses its details and contrast and the eye becomes myopic. Similarly, eye covered with plus lens becomes hyperopic. This is because negative lens or concave lens diverges the light rays, placing the focal length plane or the point of the image formed by the visual system behind the retina. This in turn induces a need for compensation by increasing the ocular axial length, which is the signal to grow resulting in more myopic refraction. Diffuser gives the same result due to form deprivation as a consequence of loss of detail of the retinal image. A convergent or plus lens in front of the eye which induces myopic defocus by placing the light in front of the retina, the axial elongation reduces and eye becomes hyperopic. Regan Ashby and Frank Shuffle tested highness in bright light of 15,000 lux on lens induced myopic chicks as well as form deprived eyes and found that light, light can slow down myopia development in chicks. Similarly, Christina Bullsort and others tested the effect of removal of the lenses or the diffuser and found that removal of the myopic agent or the stimulus causes reversal of myopia back to metropia. This lens removal is equivalent to taking visual pricks as opposed to continuous near work which is a stimulus to myopia. Other studies evaluate the effect of dual power lenses incorporating both minus and plus lenses in continuing rings and then they added high density light of 10,000 to 40,000 lux to it. They found that competing defocus alone give rise to hyperopia. That is the plus lens effect or myopic defocus is stronger than the minus lens effect or hyper defocus if both are present. When light is added to this, the effect of myopic defocus becomes additive with light and eye becomes more hyperopic. There is a dose dependent effect which means greater the light intensity more the hyperopia. A recent study on violet light exposure compared to other lights like blue, green, red during different times of the day in mice showed that violet light is most effective in stopping lens induced myopia. Exposure in the evening is typically more useful to control myopia, which can stop axial elongation, myopia progression, as well as caudal thinning is stopped, which otherwise happens in controlled eye mice without any kind of light. 
So if you summarize the studies on light and myopian animals, we'll see that tree shoes and monkeys shows hypertrophic effect under red light, whereas chickens show myopic effect under red light. Chickens and guinea pigs, whereas shows a hypertrophic shift under UV and blue light. We should remember that there may be an interspecies difference in response to various chromaticity of light in addition to the difference in study design, duration, intensity, frequency of light used. Moreover, as research is progressing, more and more variables and factors are coming in which might influence the refractive error, like spatial frequency, contrast of the visual environment where the animals are kept, which needs to be accounted for. Also, animal studies are very expensive and the, needs a dedicated team. The breeding program itself is a big project. If you look into both clinical and animal studies on myopic control, we'll notice that the studies are different in terms of their treatment efficacy, which is outcome variable they're measuring, like refractive or axial length, the age group they're studying, whether young, very young, or young adults, or adults, the study design they're following, the cross-sectional or longitudinal, the light parameter they've used, like the light intensity, the duration of light, what kind of light pattern they're using, what spectrum of light, the studies on which animal species, whether they're using lens induced myopia or form different myopia as they walk through different mechanisms. Also, what is effective for animals might not be effective for humans. Plus, is induced myopia in animals equal to human myopia? Maybe, may not be. So, we need to continue our quest for more effective myopia control techniques. Clinical myopia control treatments to date are of limited efficacy of reducing around 0.5 m of axial length elongation or one adapter of myopia. Natural slowing of progression happens with increasing age, which might also give a, give a false effect of myopia control. Around 80% of myopes do not show progression to high myopia, which might again give a false treatment efficacy that the treatment is effective. Also, statistical bias introduced by relying on prior progression measurement and categorizing patients as fast and slow progressors are used, which may not be true in later time points. 40% of treatment efficacy is seen in the first year of treatment and the majority occurs in the first few months. This is because usually eyes undergo an initial shrinkage with the treatment followed by a slower or faster growth rate. We should also remember that refractive error measurement has poor repeatability and large variance and is an inefficient measure of myopia progression. So evidence till now suggests that excellence is the best possible predictor of myopia progression. Also, age of onset of myopia is a good indicator for treatment and should not be based on fast or slow progression. No single method of treatment has shown a clear superiority till now. All seems to be similar. We need to study the rebound effect for all treatments to check for long-term efficacy, which you don't have till now. However, after all this confusion and discrepancy in studies, there is some light and hope at the end of this tunnel of research. There is a 16% increase risk of myopic macular degeneration with every adapter increase in myopia. So as a myopia practitioner, if you can reduce even a 0.5 adapter of myopia, which is equivalent to about 0.1 mm axial elongation, you're helping your patient to get a 10% reduction in risk in visual impairment, which is fair enough. Practitioners need to continue existing myopia control therapies along with behavioral modification in children like reducing screen time over extended periods and watch out for patient compliance with the treatment. We all need to perform research to create further understanding and advance myopia strategies. But very importantly, we need to create inexpensive and cheaper devices to measure excellent accurately, which will give us more accurate and reliable myopia control data. Thank you for your patient listening. Thank you, Sayantan. Uh, I think you are not uh, on Zoom. So if there are any questions, anything, we'll take you on tomorrow. So let us go ahead because we are already uh, late for the sessions. Hello, everybody. Uh, so we already did the panel discussion. Uh, tea, coffee was served there. So let us uh, have the free paper presentation. This I'll take tomorrow. They're coming. 
So one of my presentation, I'll take it tomorrow because I need a little more proper. I think you guys also are tired, but uh, we have an important uh, session that is free paper presentation uh, because we want to encourage the newcomers to have the you know experience and confidence and everything. So they will be judged on timing, the presentation, content, uh, the quality, uh, professionalism, so uh, of course, some of these judges are not here. So I'm going to request Ajit to be a judge. Uh, Yashwant, uh, Preeti, Hethal, and Madhvi. So I invite uh, Shivanand Hadimani to present his talk. So, should I start? Yeah. Uh, very good evening, everyone. I'm Shivanand Hadimani from Bharti Vidyapit School of Optometry, Pune. And today I'm going to uh, present my paper here on quality of life and functional vision assessment with mini scleral lenses in corneal ectasias. So as we all know that the visual acuity and contrast sensitivity in the patients with corneal ectasias, <clears throat> sorry, is significantly less of the high and irregular astigmatism. And in such conditions like mild to moderate cases, we can correct to a certain limit with the soft contact lenses, RGPs, spectac even for that spectacle for that matter. But then if the condition progresses, if the ectasia progresses, we need some more options. One of the larger segment when it comes to the indications of scleral lenses is corneal ectasias. And because of these kind of conditions, the loss of vision impacts the day-to-day -day activity of the patient. Uh, even the simple tasks such as reading newspapers or seeing the street signs or, uh, for example, the number of uh, vehicles becomes a problem. So that uh, come, um, brings us to the aim of the study that is to assess the success rate of mini scleral lenses in the management of corneal ectasias. And our objectives were to evaluate the visual outcomes, to report the improvement in quality of life, and to determine the comfort, wearing time, compliance, and complications with the mini scleral lenses. So this study was carried out in Pune for the duration of five months and 14 patients were involved. Uh, the patients included were who were suitable or uh, already using the scleral lenses. They had bilateral corneal ectasias and the patients who were excluded were who had any active ocular infection or inflammation or who were not willing to participate in the study. 
So coming to the methodology, the study was improved by the Institutional Ethics Committee and the patients were given a well-informed consent form. All the pa uh, 14 patients underwent a thorough optometric examination, the pre-fitting evaluation and everything. The uh, uncorrected logmar acuity was taken, both the high contrast and low contrast. Here we also focused on the low contrast visual acuity of the patients. A self-administered uh, questionnaire was given to the patient before we fit the uh, mini scleral lenses to know the quality of life before they use the scleral lenses. Uh, mini scleral lenses were used of silver line laboratories that are 16 mm in diameter. The wedding modality, care and maintenance, insertion removal, everything was explained to the patient in detail. Then the patient, uh, we dispensed the lens to the patient and the patient was called for a follow-up after three months. And uh, when the patient came after three months, again, both the high and low contrast uh, visual acuity was judged. And the patient, again, they were given a quality of life questionnaire and they were asked, since you have used the lenses for three months and what is your experience? Like they had to fill the self-administered questionnaire and the wearing time and other symptoms were uh, noted down subjectively. So coming to the results, if you, uh, we found out that the mean um, unneeded visual acuity was about 1.18 log mark. And uh, with many scleral lenses, the high contrast visual acuity of those patients uh, in, improved to 0.03 log mark and the low contrast visual acuity improved uh, around 0.47 log mark. Now, these are a couple of questions that were included in the questionnaire. Like, for example, if the patients were asked if they had any difficulty while driving. So before the scleral lenses were dispensed to the patients, majority of them said that they had a little difficulty. But after using the lenses, majority of them said that they had no difficulty at all. Similarly, when the patients were asked about the hobbies or other things that are required, a near work of the patient. So majority of them before uh, using the lenses, they said they had moderate difficulty, but after using the lenses, they said they had no difficulty at all. So uh, coming to the discussion part, uh, in the previously uh, uh, studies done by the Kim S. et al., they, uh, they also found out that the high contrast visual acuity were improved with the mini scleral lenses. Even in our study, we found the same thing. Uh, but unlike the previous studies, we also checked the low contrast visual acuity of the patients, which also improved to about... Uh, sorry. And uh, in this study, the patients were using mini scleral lenses in both the eyes. Uh, we thought that they would give a proper understanding of the improvement in quality of life of the patients rather than the patients who use it only in one eye. In uh, the Ottenberg et al. stated in the study that the important factors of knowing the success rate of mini scleral lenses was the wearing time. So in our study, we found out that the patients were wearing uh, on an average for 9.5 hours a day, which was good. And uh, they were comfortable and very minor symptoms were subjectively reported by the patients, which were non-site threatening. So to conclude, the mini scleral lenses is a comfortable management option when it comes to the corneal ectasias. These are my references. Thank you. Thank you, Shivanan. Uh, now I invite Anjali Ahuja to present her paper.
Good evening, everyone. My name is Anjali Ahuja, and I'm here to share my journey of learning speciality through my study on students' learning curve in fitting scleral lenses in irregular and regular cornea using a diagnostic trial set. बस बस हो गया हो गया हो गया So sorry for that inconveniency. Good evening, everyone. My name is Anjali Ahuja, and I'm here to share my journey of learning speciality lenses through my study on students' learning curve in fitting scleral lenses in irregular and regular cornea using a diagnostic trial set. Some of the initial hurdles faced by the students were understanding scleral lens terminology, application and removal techniques with the help of plungers, quantifying the fluid reservoir depth, and ocular photography. The aim of the study was to assess the learning curve of an optometry student in fitting scleral contact lenses. A detailed literature search suggested that there are no peer-reviewed publications considering students' learning. Only one study has been published about practitioners' learning curve, which was prospective dispensing case series, and they have considered they have observed significant reduction in number of trials and reorders required after initial 60 cases. My study was prospective analytical study, which included scleral trials on ATIs of 47 subjects, which was conducted at contact lens department of Sri CH Nagri Municipal Eye Hospital between May 2019 to March 2020. We've included patients with primary ictasias, secondary ictasias, regular cornea with high refractive errors, and we've excluded patients with active corneal pathology and retinal pathology, resulting in poor vision. Apart from routine contact lens evaluation, every subject underwent corneal topography, scleral lens fitting using diagnostic sets from Comfort 15 and post-fit anterior segment OCT. To judge the learning, student uh, judge her clinical uh, judgment skills after each trial in specially designed self-efficacy questionnaire and after complete supervision of fitting procedure, guide rated student skill on specially designed observation scale questionnaire. To rate the skills, Seven point Likert scale were used, ranging from extremely difficult to extremely easy. This was the self efficacy questionnaire and observation questionnaire, which we used. To determine the fitting complexity, every subject, uh, each of the recruited subjects were divided into regular cornea group and irregular cornea group based on these mentioned parameters. And before started handling the subjects, stu uh, the student learn uh, have, given, have been given the training of four weeks on fitting procedure. Following 
uh, stepwise fitting evaluation approach was considered in each case where uh, the step one was cons was understanding of ocular condition, con counseling the patient and signing the consent form. Next step was to perform the primary scleral lens workup and based on topography readings and uh, comfort 15 guidelines, initial diagnostic trial lens was selected and application of lens was done. Here, the application time was noted. Scleral lens settling time of 60 minutes was considered. Then for post-fit evaluation, final post-assessment fit was done using uh, slit lamp re uh, reading recordings and which was also compared with the uh, OCT uh, readings and removal of the lens was done. Here, the removal time was noted. If on eye fit of first diagnostic trial lens was not satisfactory, second and when required third trial lens was considered until the student found the optimal fit. With that initial diagnostic lens selection, those fitting scores were considered as her first trial scores. Once the optimal fit was achieved, those fitting scores were considered as her last trial scores. And on that optimal fit, guide has rated the scores as guide's scores. Statistical analysis was done using SPSS software where the level of significance was set as P less than 0.05. Moving on to the result, scleral lens trials were uh, done on 80 eyes of total 47 subjects where 27 were male candidates. Uh, maximum patient ranged between the age group of 11 to 30 years and maximum fittings were done in uh, the keratoconic eyes followed by the regular cornea eyes. Average time of application of scleral lens was reduced from 41.1 second in initial 10 fits to 14.5 second in last 10 fits. Similarly, the average time for the removal of scleral lens was reduced from 27.1 second to 4.8 second in last 10 fits. This signifies the ease of handling of complicated corneal conditions. As there were two raters involved, student and guide, inter-rater reliability test was conducted and the uh, result shows excellent agreement between the scores with the average ICC value of 0 0.923. To determine the learning curve, further analysis was done using Wilcoxon sign test to compare students' first scores with the last scores. And uh, result found, uh, we found that the statistical significant difference was observed on each fitting parameters and the, uh, both the readings were different. So this signifies that the learning was achieved with her last trial scores. But to quantify the learning objectively as well for the unbiased results, a, uh, a statistical uh, test called QSUM was considered, uh, where the graph shows trend in the outcome of series of consecutive procedures of scleral lens fitting in right eye was uh, is shown, where during the first uh, y axis shows the cumulative sum of scleral lens trial and x axis shows the number of patients. And we can see that during first five observation, the scores on the learning curve did not progress. Then the graph, graph slopes upward and difficulty was faced until 19th patient and detail of each difficult case is shown in given table. Then the curve becomes flat. This signifies uh, the consistency and uh, learning was achieved. Uh, this is for right eye. And similarly, uh, for the left eye, during first five observation, the, uh, the scores did not progress, then difficulty was achieved till 19th patient, and then the curve became flat. This table shows the result that uh, most of the trials were required for posterior keratotomy right eye, and least amount of trials were required for regular corneal left eye. So moving on to the discussion, the acquisition of procedural competence is a challenge faced by a student in all the areas of healthcare. So during training, a student must acquire proficiency in difficult and challenging tasks. Result from inter agreement suggested that a uh, the uh, learning was achieved under complete supervision considering the health of patient's cornea and restoration of functional vision. And result from Wilcoxon tests uh, suggested that the student in the study achieved the proficiency of fitting of scleral contact lenses. Um, as we all know that monitoring of students' performance can be done by teachers' assessment or reviews, but that can be subjective and can be biasing. Considering that fact, this study included unbiased results uh, by uh, considering QSUM analysis. So uh, the learning curves uh, results from this study are reliable and uh, can be used for further reference. For the conclusion part, a NOVI student became competent in scleral lens fitting in various condition after consecutive eight fittings. The average number of trials required for optimal fit were higher in irregular cornea and clinical judgment skills got better with the number of fit. Limitations were that we could not have multiple student learning curve and we could not compare uh, the different trial, uh, trial lenses for scleral lenses. And uh, moving on to the significance of the study, 
uh, as this is the only study that counts upon the learning of student, learning curve analysis from this study is helpful for planning of teaching and learning of scleral lenses uh, to uh, NOAA students. These are my references. Thank you so much for your patience. It was a nice presentation. Uh, may I invite uh, Jalak Shah to present her paper now. Before I learn scleral lenses tomorrow, I'm sharing my experience of Roske corneal lenses in a severe keratoconus. As we all know, keratoconus uh, uh, is a bilateral asymmetric non-inflammatory ectatic corneal disease, which lead to irre irregular astigmatism and visual impairment. Uh, studies said that it is very difficult to achieve an ideal fit with the corneal lenses. So the purpose of my study is to assess fitting and visual outcome of corneal lenses in eyes with severe keratoconus. Uh, I have considered se severe keratoconus in uh, eyes who had mean keratometry value greater than 62 diopter. Uh, I have included six, eyes, six severe keratoconus uh, eyes of five patients. Uh, all these eyes were given an option of corneal transplantation by ophthalmologist and they were referred to us for contact lens trial. I gave a contact lens trial of Roske design of K2 and NC design of the lenses. Roske lenses have a uh, central and peripheral fit flexibility option. So we can customize the fit as per our requirement. So what is the ideal fit? Uh, in irregular cornea, uh, we have to see the light feather touch on the apex of the cone, uh, a fluorescent band of 0.5 to 0.7 mm width uh, uh, on the periphery. Uh, lens should be a uh, well centered and uh, there is a smooth movement after the each blink. Okay, uh, this, is my, this was my first case, uh, uh, a 15 year old bo boy who had a me, uh, base character visual acuity was three by 60 who had also corneal scarring, we can see on the topography. I gave a trial of Roske NC design. We can see on the video. Uh, I, I felt that the fit was optimum. The movement was very less. Uh, I just don't want to alter the central fit as well as the age lift because age is very nice. So I just gave a standard toric periphery and which has uh, improved uh, movement uh, at, at least optimum. Uh, 
this was a case uh, case number 2 this was a case of 14 year old boy who had a, uh, also who had a severe keratoconus the cone was displaced superiorly we can see here highest point of the sorry uh, highest st steepest point was located superiorly i gave a trial of rose k2 design and uh, central fit was uh, uh, nice which, uh, but the peripheral fit in the peripheral fit there was no edge lift so we have customized we have increased the edge lift by 3 uh, increase edge lift by 3 also i gave a toric periphery and uh, i achieved ideal fit and visual acuity was improved 6 by 18 partial to 69 uh, 69 part uh, in this patient uh, i also uh, do a, i gave a lot of lot of time in doing refraction uh, so uh, with refraction visual acuity was 618 part but other, other i in, in other eye there was a from first keratoconus so uh, it was very difficult to wear a spectacles uh, uh, in this eye Uh, case three, a uh, seventeen-year-old go uh, girl um, uh, who had base corrected visual acuity of six by thirty-six. Uh, I gave a trial of rose K two design. So we can see that there was no edge lift present, and the central fit was little bit steep. Uh, but I just order increase edge lift in this case. The final lens uh, was looking steep. and the dia was uh, i felt that it was little bit smaller so in second lens i have increased the diameter and uh, 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 base base curve was flattened by 0.1 diopter and visual acuity was improved to 6 by 18 because these are the severe cases we cannot expect 6 by 6 visual acuity and it was not further improved with the pinhole also Uh, next case, other eye of the same patient. The uh, base corrected visual acuity, base spectacle corrected visual acuity was six by twenty four partial. Uh, in other eye, I also gave a trial of rose K two lens. Uh, in the periphery, there was no edge lift present, as well as uh, superior edge was uh, very flat. so in the final fit i have increased the edge lift by 3 also i gave a standard toric periphery and i have achieved optimum fit with that visual acuity improved to 612 partial uh the case five one of the my favorite case uh a 20 year old boy who don't want wanted to uh, go for the transplantation and i wanted to fit this lenses uh, his uh, mean keratometry value was 69 diopter i gave a trial of roske nc design of 4.6 which was the last lens of the trial lens for the uh, there was no trial lens available still i wanted to fit the lenses in this cornea and uh, her refraction was non measurable visual acuity was within the, in counting finger and i have ordered uh, steep uh, steep uh, steep base curve of 4.3 i have increased the edge lift by 3 and uh, somehow i have uh, able to achieve the ideal fit in this cornea also and visual acuity was improved to 6 by 36 her other in, uh, in her, her other eye there was mild keratoconus so patient uh, was very happy binocularly he was able to at least he just don't want to go for transplantation so he he was very happy uh last case a uh, 17 year old girl uh whose base corrected visual acuity was 618 uh i gave a trial of rose k2 design lenses lens was moving down there was a improper peripheral fit 
I have in the final lens, I have increased the diameter. Also, uh, I gave a toric periphery. Some I, I like that to toric periphery, maybe. And uh, increase the age lift by three and uh, able to achieve uh, optimum fit. With that, visual acuity was improved 618 to 6 by 9. I felt in this case, diameter was a little bit uh, smaller. Uh, on follow-up, I, I have planned to increase the diameter by 0.2. Uh, all the lenses were dispensed, uh, dispensed and uh, all patients were follow up the, uh, with eight hour of lenses uh, after one and three months. Uh, none of them had noted any significant corneal staining and none of them had complained uh, about intolerance to contact lenses. So the RGP cor corneal contact lenses are most suitable non-operative management of the keratoconus, which provides satisfactory visual acuity, which are cost effective, also uh, easy to insert uh, and removal uh, and newer material which provides better comfort to the patients. However, the effect of long-term wearing of ill-fitted RGP lenses, we cannot ignore that. So while fitting the irregular cornea, we have to choose uh, wisely uh, uh, while dispensing the lenses in the irregular cornea. But when, the, uh, when there is a uh, question of cost, uh, we, uh, in my conclusion, a, a well-fitted corneal lenses can improve visual acuity in severe keratoconus, which are cost-effective, may help patient to postpone their corneal transplantation for the longer period of time. These are my references, and thank you.